Chicago's Awful Theater Horror by the Survivors and Rescuers Copyright 1904 Chapter 1 The Story of the Fire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. No Disaster by Flood, Volcano, Wreck, or Convulsion of Nature has in recent times aroused such horror as swept over the civilized world when on December 30, 1903, a death-dealing blast of flame hurtled through the packed auditorium of the Iroquois Theater in Chicago, causing the loss of nearly 600 lives of men, women, and children, and injuries to unknown scores. Strong words pale and appear meaningless when used in describing the full enormity of this disaster, which has no recent parallel except in the outbreaks of nature's irresistible forces. There have been greater losses of life by volcanoes, earthquakes, and floods, but no fire horror of modern times has equaled this one, which in a brief half-hour turned a beautiful million-dollar theater into an oven piled high with corpses, some burned and mutilated, and others almost unmarked in death coming as it did in the midst of a holiday season when the second greatest city in the United States was reveling in the gaiety of Christmas week, the sudden transformation of a playhouse filled with a pleasure-seeking throng into an inferno filled with shrieking, living, and mutilated dead came as a thunderbolt from a clear sky. It was a typical holiday matinee crowd, composed mostly of women and children, with here and there a few men, the production was the gorgeous scenic extravaganza, Mr. Bluebird, with which the handsome new theatre had been opened not a month before. Don't fail to have the children see Mr. Bluebird, was the advertisement spread broadcast throughout the city, and the children were there in force when the scorching sheet of flame leaped from the stage into the balcony and gallery where a thousand were packed. The building had been heralded abroad as a fireproof structure, with more than enough exits. Ushers and five men in city uniform were in the aisles. All was apparently safety, mirth, and good cheer. Then came the transformation scene. The auditorium and the stage were darkened for the popular song The Pale Moonlight. Eight dashing chorus girls and eight stalwart men in showy costume strolled through the measures of the piece, bathed in a flood of dazzling light. Up in the scenes, a stage electrician was directing the spotlight which threw the pale moonlight effect on the stage. Suddenly, there was a startled cry. Far overhead, where the spot was shooting forth its brilliant ray of concentrated light, a tiny serpentine tongue of flame crept over the inside of the proscenium drape. It was an insignificant thing, yet the horrible possibilities it entailed flashed over all in an instant. A spark from the light had communicated to the rough edge of the heavy cloth drape. Like a flash, it stole across the proscenium and high up into the gridiron above. Accustomed as they were to insignificant fire scares and trying ordeals that are seldom the lot of those who lead a less strenuous life, the people of the stage hurried silently to the task of stamping out the blaze. In the orchestra pit, it could be readily be seen that something was radically wrong, but the trained musicians played on. Members of the octet cast their eyes above and saw the tiny tongue of flame growing into a whirling maelstrom of fire. But it was a sight they had seen before. Surely something would happen to extinguish it. America's newest and most modern fireproof playhouse was not going to disappear before an insignificant fire in the rigging loft. So they continued to sway in sinuous steps to the rhythm of the throbbing orchestra. Their presence stilled the nervousness of the vast audience, which knew that something was wrong, but had no means of realizing what that something was. So the gorgeously attired men and dashing voluptuous young women danced on. The throng feasted its eyes on the moving scene of life and color little knowing that for them it was the last dance, the dance of death. That dance was not the only one in progress. Far above, 
the element of death danced from curtain to curtain the fire fiend red and glowing with exultation snapping and crackling in anticipation of the feast before it grew beyond all bounds glowing members and blazing sparks crumbs from its table began to shower upon the merry dancers and they fell back with blanched faces and trembling limbs the star eddie foy rushed to the front of the stage to reassure spectators who now realized the peril at hand and rose in their seats struggling against the impulse to fly others joined the comedian in his plea for calmness suddenly their voices were drowned in a volley of sounds like the booming of great guns the manila lines by which the carloads of scenery in the loft above was suspended gave way before the fire like so much paper and the great wood battens fell like thunderbolts upon the now deserted stage still the audience stood terror bound lower the fire curtain came a hoarse cry and the fire curtain shot down over the proscenium but stopped before the great opening was closed leaving a yawning space of many feet beneath with the dropping of the curtain a door in the rear had been opened by the performers fleeing for their lives and battling to escape from the devouring element fast hemming them in on every side the draft thus caused transformed the stage in one second from a dark gloomy smoke and the fire curtain shot down over the proscenium but stopped before the great opening was closed leaving a yawning space of many feet beneath with the dropping of the curtain a door in the rear had been opened by the performers fleeing for their lives and battling to escape from the devouring element fast hemming them in on every side the draught thus caused transformed the stage in one second from a dark gloomy smoke concealed scene of chaos into a seething volcano with a great puff the mass of flame swept out over the auditorium a withering blast of death before it the vast throng broke and fled doors windows hallways fire escapes all were jammed in a moment with struggling humanity fighting for life some of the doors were jammed almost instantly so that no human power could make egress possible behind those in front pushed the frenzied mass of humanity chicago's elect the wives and children of its most prosperous businessmen and the flower of local society fighting like demons incarnate purses wraps costly furs were cast aside in that mad rush mothers were torn from their children husbands from their wives no hold however strong could last against that awful indescribable crush strong men who sought to the last to sustain their feminine companions were swept away like straws thrown to the floor and trampled into unconsciousness in the twinkling of an eye women to whom the safety of their children was more than their own lives had their little ones torn from them and buried under the mighty sweep of humanity moving onward by intuition rather than by exercise of thought to the various exits they in turn were swept on before their wails died on their lips some to safety others to an unspeakably horrible death while some exits were jammed by fallen refugees so as to become useless, others refused to open. In the darkness that fell upon the doomed theatre a struggle ensued such as was never pictured in the mind of Dante in his visions of Inferno. With prayers, curses, and meaningless shrieks of terror, all faced their fate like rats in a trap. The darkness was illumined by a fearful light that burst from the sea of flame pouring out from the proscenium, making Doré's representations of Inferno shrink into the commonplace. Like a horizontal volcano, the furnace on the stage belched forth its blast of fire, smoke, and withering, blighting heat. Like a wave, it rolled over every portion of the vast house, dancing. Dancing, yes, pillars of flame danced. To the multitude swept into eternity before the hurricane of flame and the few who were dragged out hideously disfigured and burned almost beyond semblance of human beings it seemed indeed a dance of death withering crushing consuming all in its path forced on as though by the power of some mighty blowpipe 
impelled by the fearful draughts that directed the fiery furnace outward into the auditorium instead of upward into the great flues constructed to meet just such an emergency the sea of fire burned itself out there was little or nothing in the construction of the building itself for it to feed upon and it fell back of its own weight to the stage where it roared and raged like some angry demon and those great flues that supposedly gave the palatial Iroquois increased safety, barred and grated, battened down with heavy timbers. They resisted the terrible force of the blast itself. There they remained intact the next day. Anxiety to throw open the Palace of Pleasure to the public before the builders had time to complete in detail their Herculean task had resulted in converting it into a veritable slaughter pen. Mr. Bluebeard's Chamber of Horrors, lightly depicted in satire to settings of gold and color, wit and music, had evolved within a few minutes into an actuality. Chamber of Horrors indeed, grim silent smoldering, and sending upon high the fearful odor of burning flesh. Policemen and firemen, hardened to terrible sights, crept into the smoldering sepulcher only to turn back, sickened by the sight that met their eyes tears and groans fell from them and they were unnerved as they gazed upon the scene of carnage some gave way and were themselves the subject of deep concern it was a scene to wring tears from the very stones no words can adequately describe it perhaps the best description of that quarter hour of carnage and the sense of horror when the seared scorching sepulchre was entered for the removal of the dead and dying is found in the words of the veteran descriptive writer, Mr. Ben H. Atwell, who was present from the beginning to the end of the Holocaust, and after visiting the deadly spot in the gray dawn of the following day, wrote his impressions as follows. Where at 3.15 yesterday beauty and fashion and the happy amusement seeker thronged the palatial playhouse, to fall a few moments later before a deadly blast of smoke and flame sweeping over all with irresistible force the dawn of the last day of the passing year found confusion chaos and an all-pervading sense of the awful it seemed to radiate the chilling depressing volume from the streaked grime-covered walls and the flame-licked ceilings overhead against this fearful background a few grim policemen and firemen moving silently about the ruins searching for overlooked dead or abandoned property loomed up like fearful ghosts the progress of their noiseless and ghastly quest proved one circumstance survivors are too unsettled to realize with the opening of the stage door to permit the escape of the members of the mr bluebird company and the breaking of the skylight above the flue-like scene loft that tops the stage the latter was converted into a furnace through which a tremendous draught poured like a blowpipe driving billows of flame into the faces of the terrified audience with exits above the parquet floor simply choked up with the crushed bodies of struggling victims who made the first rush for safety the packed hundreds in balcony and gallery faced fire that moved them up in waves with a swirl that sounded death the thin bright sheet of fire rolled on from stage to rear wall it fed on the rich box curtain seized upon the sparse veneer of subdued red and green decorations spread upon wall ceiling and balcony facings it licked the fireproof materials below clean and rolled on with a roar over seat tops and plush rail cushions it sped then it snuffed out having practically nothing to feed upon save the tangled mass of wood scene frames battens and paint soaked canvas on stage there firemen were directing streams of water that poured over the premises in great cascades in volume aggregating many tons a few streams were directed about the body of the house, where vagrant tongues of fire still found material on which to feed. Silence reigned, the silence of death, but none realized the appalling story behind the awful calm. The stampede that followed the first alarm, a struggle in which most contestants were women and children, fighting with the desperation of death, 
terminated with the sudden sweep of the sea of flames across the body of the house. The awful battle ended before the irresistible hand of death, which fell upon contestants and those behind alike. Somehow those on the main floor managed to force their way out. Above, where the presence of narrower exits, stairways that precipitated the masses of humanity upon each other and the natural air current for the billows of flame to follow, spelled death to the occupants of the two balconies. The wave of flame, smoke, and gas smote the multitude. Dropping where they stood, most of the victims were consumed beyond recognition. Some, who were protected from contact with the flames by masses of humanity piled upon them, escaped death, and were dragged out later by rescuers, suffering all manner of injury. The majority, however, who beheld the indescribably terrifying spectacle of the wave of death moving upon them through the air, died then and there without a moment for preparation. Few survived to tell the tale. The blood-curdling cry of mingled prayers and curses, of pleas for help, and meaningless shrieks of despair, died away before the roar of the fire, and the silence fell that greeted the firemen upon their entry. Survivors describe the situation as a parallel of the condition at Martinique, when a wave of gas and fire rolled down the mountainside and destroyed everything in its path. Here, however, one circumstance was reversed, for the wave of death leaped from below and smote its victims, springing from the very air beneath them. In a few minutes it was all over, all but the weeping. In those few minutes, obscure people had evolved into heroes. Staid businessmen drove out patrons to convert their stores into temporary hospitals and morgues. Others converted their trucks and delivery wagons into improvised ambulances. Stocks of drugs, oils, and blankets were showered upon the police to aid in relief work. And a corps of physicians and surgeons sufficient to the needs of an army had organized. Rescues little short of miraculous were accomplished, and life and limb were risked by public servants and citizens with no thought of personal consequences. Public sympathy was thoroughly aroused long before the extent of the horror was known, and before the sickening report spread through the city that the greatest holocaust ever known in the history of theatricals had fallen upon Chicago. While the streets began to crowd for blocks around with weeping and heartbroken persons in mortal terror because of knowledge that loved ones had attended the performance, patrol wagons, ambulances, and open wagons hurried the injured to hospitals. Before long they were called upon to perform the more gruesome task of removing the dead. In wagon loads the latter were carted away. Undertaking establishments both north, south, and west of the river threw open their doors. Piled in windows in the angle of the stairway, where the second balcony refugees were brought face to face, and in a death struggle with the occupants of the first balcony, the dead covered a space fifteen or twenty feet square, and nearly seven feet in depth. All were absolutely safe from the fire itself when they met death, having emerged from the theater proper into the separate building containing the foyer. In this great court there was absolutely nothing to burn, and the doors were only a few feet away. There the ghastly pile lay, a mute monument to the powers of terror. Above and about towered shimmering columns and facades in polished marble, whose cold and unharmed surfaces seemed to bespeak contempt for human folly. In that portion of the Iroquois structure, the only physical evidences of damages were a few windows broken during the excitement. To that pile of dead is attributed the great loss of life within. The bodies choked up the entrance, barring the egress of those behind. Neither age nor youth, sex, quality, or condition were sacred in the awful battle in the doorway. The gray and aged, rich, poor, young, and those obviously invalids in life, lay in a tangled mass, all on an awful footing of equality, in silent annihilation. Within and above, equal terrors were encountered, 
in what at first seemed countless victims. Lights, patience, and hard work brought about some semblance of system, and at last word was given that the last body had been removed from the charnel house. A large police detail surrounded the place all night, and with the break of day, search of the premises was renewed, none being admitted save by presentation of a written order from Chief of Police O'Neill. Fire engines pumped away, removing the lake of water that flooded the basement to the depth of ten feet. As the flood was lowered, it began to be apparent that the basement was free of dead. Searchers gazing down from the heights of the upper balcony surveyed the scene of death below with horror stamped upon their faces. Fire had left its terrifying blight in a colorless, garish monotony that suggests the burnt-out crater of an extinct volcano. In the wreckage, the scattered garments and purses, fragments of charred bodies, and other debris strewn within thousands of bits of brilliantly colored glass lay as they fell shattered in the fight against the flames. A few skulls were seen. Five bushel baskets were filled with women's purses gathered by the police. A huge pile of garments was removed to a nearby saloon where an officer guards them, pending removal to some more appropriate place. The shoes and overshoes picked up among the seats filled two barrels to overflowing. The fire manifested itself in the flies above the stage during the second act. The double octet was singing in the pale moonlight when the tragedy swept mirth and music aside to give way to a more somber and frightful performance. Confusion on the stage, panic in the auditorium, phenomenal spread of the incipient blaze, failure of the asbestos fire curtain to fall in place when lowered followed in rapid progress, with the Holocaust as the climax. But to return to the narrative of what happened immediately after the first alarm, as gathered by the collaborators of this work. There was a wild, futile dash. Futile because few of the terrified participants succeeded in reaching the outer air. Persons in the rear of the theater building knew full well that a Holocaust was in progress, their fire escapes and stage doors thronged with refugees half-clad and hysterical chorus girls flocking into the alley and crackling flames leaping higher and higher from the flimsy stage and bursting from windows told only too plainly what was in progress within. At the front, half a block distant in Randolph Street, ominous silence remained. A mere handful of people burst out. Those who had occupied rear seats and pushed by the ushers who sought to restrain them and quiet their fears, loiterers about the ornate lobby scarcely sniffed a suggestion of impending disaster before the fire apparatus began to arrive with clanging bells. Those ushers who held back the straining anxious spectators who sought escape at the first mild suggestion of danger, for what widespread woe are they responsible? mere boys of tender years and meagre experience. What knew they of the awful possibilities beyond the spell of excitement upon the stage? Only two weeks before there had been an incipient blaze there that had been extinguished without the knowledge of the audience. Like all the rest of the world that now stands in shuddering wonderment, these boys scoffed at the thought of real danger in the massive pile of steel, stone, and terracotta with its brave and shimmering veneer of glistening marble, stained glass of many hues, rich tapestries and drapings, and cold aristocratic tints of red and old gold. And so, with uplifted hands, they turned back those whose sense of caution prompted them to leave at the outset. Surely disaster could not overtake the regal Iroquois in its first flush of pomp, pride, and superiority? It was their sacred duty to see that no unseemly break marred the decorum established for the guidance of audiences at the Iroquois, and that duty was fully discharged. Thus it was that the wild hegira did not begin from the front until the arrival of the fire department. Then pandemonium itself broke loose. All restraining influences from the stage had ceased, 
at the appearance of the all-consuming wave of flame sweeping across the auditorium the boy ushers abandoned their posts and fled for their lives leaving the packed audience to do the same unhampered unhampered not quite darkness descending upon the scene doors locked against the frightened multitude fire escapes cut off by tongues of flame and exits and stairways choked with the bodies of those who died fighting to reach safety hampered many at least the six hundred carried out later mangled and roasted their features and limbs twisted and distorted until little semblance to humanity remained after the first wild dash in which a large portion of those on the main floor escaped the blackness of night settled upon the long marble foyer leading from randolph street to the auditorium it settled in a cloud of black fire-laden smoke death in nebulous forms defying firefighter and rescuer alike to enter the great corridor none entered and more pitiful still none came forth while the situation maintained in front a vastly different scene unfolded in the rear the theatre formed a great l extending north from randolph street to an alley and in the rear west to dearborn street this last projection the toe of the l was occupied by the stage theoretically the finest in america if not in the world thus the auditorium and stage occupied the extreme northern part of the structure paralleling an alley extending on a line with randolph street from state street to dearborn street this alley wall was pierced by many windows and emergency exits and was studded with fire escapes built in the form of iron galleries and stairways hugging close to the wall leading to the alley to these exits and the long grim galleries of fire escapes the herded fire-hunted audience surged those who reached doors that responded to their efforts found themselves pushed along the galleries by the resistless crush behind as was the case in front halfway to safety another stream of humanity was encountered pouring out at right angles from another portion of the house coming together with the impact of opposing armies the two hosts of refugees gave unwilling and terrible answer to the time-worn problem as to the outcome of an irresistible force encountering an immovable body both in front and rear great mounds of dead spelled annihilation as the answer in front over two hundred corpses piled in a twenty-foot angle of a stairway where two balcony exits merged told the terrible tale and rendered both passages useless for egress the dead being piled up in wall-like formation ten feet high in the rear, an alley strewn with mangled men, women, and children writhing in agony on the icy pavement, or relieved of their sufferings by death, lent eloquent corroboration to the solution of the problem. It was in the rear that the true horror of the fire was most fully disclosed. There, no towering mosaic studded walls or kindly mantle of smoke shut out the horrid sight. From its opening scene to its silent, ghastly denouement, the successive details of this greatest of modern tragedies was forced upon the view to be stamped upon the memory of the unwilling beholder with an impressiveness that only death will blot out. After the first great impact hurled the overflow of the fire escape gallery into the alley yawning far below, the crush of humanity swept onward, downward to where safety beckoned, when the advance guard had all but reached the precious goal with only a few feet of iron gallery and one more stairway to traverse the crowning horror of the day unfolded itself right in the path of the advancing horde a steel window shutter flew back impelled by the terrific energy of an immeasurable volume of pent-up superheated air the clang of the steel shutter swinging back and forth on its hinges against the brick wall sounded the death knell of another host of victims for in its wake came a huge tongue of lurid flame leaping on high in the ecstasy of release from its stifling furnace fiercely in the faces of the refugees beat this agency of death before its withering blast the victims fell like prairie grass before an autumn blaze those further back waited for no more but precipitated themselves headlong into the alley 
rather than face the fiery furnace that loomed up, barring their way to hope. It would be well to draw the curtain upon this awful scene of suffering and death in the gloomy alley, were it not for one circumstance that stands forth a glorious example of the heights that may be attained by the modest hero who moves about unsuspected in his daily life until calamity affords opportunity to show the stuff he is made of. High up to the building, occupied by the law, dental, and pharmacy schools of the Northwestern University, directly across the alley from the burning theater, a number of such men were at work. They were horny-handed sons of toil, painters, paper-hangers, and cleaners, repairing minor damage caused by an insignificant fire in the university building a few weeks before. One glance at the seething vortex of death below transformed them into heroes whose deeds would put many a man to shame whose memory is kept alive by stately column or flattering memorial tablet. Trailing heavy planks used by them in the erection of working scaffolds, they rushed to a window in the lecture room of the law school directly opposite the exit and fire escape platform leading from the topmost balcony of the theater. By long, almost superhuman effort and ingenuity, they raised aloft the planks, scarce long enough to span the abyss, and dropped them. The prayers of thousands below and a multitude stifling in the aperture opposite were raised that the planks might fall true. All eyes followed their course as they poised in mid-air, then descended, slow seemed their fall, a veritable period of torture, and awed silence reigned as they dropped. Then there arose a glad cry. With a crash, the great planks landed true, the free ends squarely upon the edge of the platform of the useless fire escape the others resting firmly upon the narrow window ledge where the painters stood defying flame smoke and torrents of burning embers and blazing sparks hurled upon them as from the crater of a volcano death alley had been bridged across the narrow span came a volume of bedraggled humanity as though shot from a gun a mad screaming stream pushed on by those behind simply whirled across the frail support direct from the very jaws of death the blistering gates of hell only for a moment a brief second it seemed the wild procession moved yet in that limited period scores perhaps hundreds poured from the seething inferno practically all that escaped from the lofty balcony that was a moment later transformed into the death chamber of helpless hundreds then the wave of flame previously described swept over the interior of the theater greedily searching every nook and corner as though hungry for the last victim within reach the last refugees to cross the narrow span the dizzy line sharply drawn between life and death in its most terrifying aspect staggered over with their clothing in flames gasping fainting with pain and terror the workmen, students, and policemen who had rushed to their assistance dashed across into the heat and smoke and dragged forth many more who had reached the platform only to fall before the deadly blast. Then the rescuers were beaten back, and the fire fiend was left to claim its own. And claim them it did, searching them out with ruminating tongues of flame, over every inch of paint and decoration, every tapestry, curtain, and seat-top. It licked its way with insinuating eagerness. It pursued its victims beyond the confines of the theater walls, grasping in its deadly embrace those who lay across windows or prostrate on galleries and platforms. Thousands gazed on in helpless horror, watching the flames bestow a fatal caress upon many who had crept far, far from the blaze and almost into a zone of safety. With a gliding, caressing movement that made beholders' blood run cold, it crept upon such victims, hovered a moment, and glided on with sinuous motion, and what appeared a suggestion of intelligence in searching out those who fled before it. A shriek, a spasmodic movement, and the victims lay still, their earthly troubles over forever. A few minutes later, 
possibly not more than half an hour after the discovery of the fire. When the firemen had beaten back the flames to the raging stage, another procession moved across that same plank again. It moved in silence, for it was a procession of death. The great tragedy began and ended in fifteen minutes. Its echoes may roll down as many centuries, compelling the proper safeguarding of all places of amusement, in America at least. If so, the Iroquois victims did not give up their life in vain. End of Chicago's Awful Theater Horror Chapter 1 The Story of the Fire Read by Eberly Thomas Chicago's Awful Theater Fire by the Rescues and Survivors Chapter 1 The Story of the Fire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Constitution of the Empire of Japan, 1889 Semi-Official Translation by M. Ito This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Constitution of the Empire of Japan, 1889 Imperial Oath Sworn in the Sanctuary in the Imperial Palace Tsukebumi We the successor to the prosperous throne of our predecessors, do humbly and solemnly swear to the imperial founder of our house and to our other imperial ancestors, that, in pursuance of a great policy coextensive with the heavens and with the earth, we shall maintain and secure from decline the ancient form of government. In consideration of the progressive tendency of the course of human affairs, and in parallel with the advance of civilization, we deem it expedient, in order to give clearness and distinctness to the instructions bequeathed by the imperial founder of our house and by our other imperial ancestors, to establish fundamental laws formulated into express provisions of law, so that, on the one hand, our imperial posterity may possess an express guide for the course they are to follow, and that, on the other, our subjects shall thereby be enabled to enjoy a wider range of action in giving us their support, and that the observance of our laws shall continue to the remotest ages of time. We will thereby to give greater firmness to the stability of our country and to promote the welfare of all the people within the boundaries of our dominions, and we now establish the imperial house law and the constitution. These laws come to only an expression of grand precepts for the conduct of the government, bequeathed by the imperial founder of our house and by our other imperial ancestors that we have been so fortunate in our reign, in keeping with the tendency of the times, as to accomplish this work, we owe to the glorious spirits of the imperial founder of our house and of our other imperial ancestors. We now reverently make our prayer to them and to our illustrious father, and implore the help of their sacred spirits, and make to them solemn oath, never at this time, nor in the future, to fail to be an example to our subjects in the observance of the laws hereby established. May the heavenly spirits witness this our solemn oath. Imperial Rescript on the Promulgation of the Constitution Whereas we make it the joy and glory of our heart to behold the prosperity of our country and the welfare of our subjects, we do hereby, in virtue of the supreme power we inherit from our imperial ancestors, 
promulgate the present immutable fundamental law for the sake of our present subjects and their descendants the imperial founder of our house and our other imperial ancestors by the help and support of the forefathers of our subjects laid the foundation of our empire upon a basis which is to last forever that this brilliant achievement embellishes the annals of our country is due to the glorious virtues of our sacred imperial ancestors and to the loyalty and bravery of our subjects their love of their country and their public spirit considering that our subjects are the descendants of the loyal and good subjects of our imperial ancestors we doubt not but that our subjects will be guided by our views and will sympathize with all our endeavors and that harmoniously cooperating together they will share with us our hope of making manifest the glory of our country both at home and abroad and of securing forever the stability of the work bequeathed to us by our imperial ancestors preamble or edict joyu having by virtue of the glories of our ancestors ascended the throne of a lineal succession unbroken for ages eternal desiring to promote the welfare of and to give development to the moral and intellectual faculties of our beloved subjects the very same that have been favored with the benevolent care and affectionate vigilance of our ancestors and hoping to maintain the prosperity of the state in concert with our people and with their support we hereby promulgate in pursuance of our imperial rescript of the twelfth day of the tenth month of the fourteenth year of meiji a fundamental law of the state to exhibit the principles by which we are guided in our conduct and to point out to what our descendants and our subjects and their descendants are forever to conform the right of sovereignty of the state we have inherited from our ancestors and we shall bequeath them to our descendants neither we nor they shall in the future fail to wield them in accordance with the provisions of the constitution hereby granted we now declare to respect and protect the security of the rights and of the property of our people and to secure to them the complete enjoyment of the same within the extent of the provisions of the present constitution and of the law the imperial diet shall first be convoked for the twenty-third year of meiji and the time of its opening shall be the date when the present constitution comes into force when in the future it may become necessary to amend any of the provisions of the present constitution we or our successors shall assume the initiative right and submit a project for the same to the imperial diet the imperial diet shall pass its vote upon it according to the conditions imposed by the present constitution and in no other wise shall our descendants or our subjects be permitted to attempt any alteration thereof our ministers of state on our behalf shall be held responsible for the carrying out of the present constitution and our present and future subjects shall forever assume the duty of allegiance to the present constitution chapter one the emperor article one the empire of japan shall be reigned over and governed by line of emperors unbroken for ages eternal article two the imperial throne shall be succeeded to by imperial male descendants according to the provisions of the imperial house law article three the emperor is sacred and inviolable article four the emperor is the head of the empire combining in himself the rights of sovereignty and exercises them according to the provisions of the present constitution article five the emperor exercises the legislative power with the consent of the imperial diet article six 
the emperor gives sanction to laws and orders them to be promulgated and executed. Article 7. The emperor convokes the imperial diet, opens, closes, and prorogues it, and dissolves the House of Representatives. Article 8. The emperor, in consequence of an urgent necessity to maintain public safety or to avert public calamities, issues, when the imperial diet is not sitting, imperial ordinances in the place of law. Such imperial ordinances are to be laid before the imperial diet at its next session, and when the diet does not approve the said ordinances, the government shall declare them to be invalid for the future. Article 9. The emperor issues or causes to be issued the ordinances necessary for the carrying out of the laws, or for the maintenance of the public peace and order, and for the promotion of the welfare of the subjects. But no ordinance shall in any way alter any of the existing laws. Article 10. The emperor determines the organization of the different branches of the administration and salaries of all civil and military officers, and appoints and dismisses the same. Exceptions especially provided for in the special constitution or in other laws shall be in accordance with the respective provisions, bearing thereon. Article 11. The Emperor has the supreme command of the army and navy. Article 12. The Emperor determines the organization and peace standing of the army and navy. Article 13. The Emperor declares war, makes peace, and concludes treaties. Article 14. The Emperor declares a state of siege. The conditions and effects of a state of siege shall be determined by law. Article 15. The Emperor confers titles of nobility, rank, orders, and other marks of honor. Article 16. The Emperor orders amnesty, pardon, commutation of punishments, and rehabilitation. Article 17. A regency shall be instituted in conformity with the provisions of the Imperial House Law. The regent shall exercise the powers appertaining to the Emperor in his name. Chapter 2. Rights and Duties of Subjects Article 18. The conditions necessary for being a Japanese subject shall be determined by law. Article 19. Japanese subjects may, according to qualifications determined in laws or ordinances, be appointed to civil or military or any other public offices equally. Article 20. Japanese subjects are amenable to service in the army or navy according to the provisions of law. Article 21. Japanese subjects are amenable to the duty of paying taxes according to the provisions of law. Article 22. Japanese subjects shall have the liberty of abode and of changing the same within the limits of the law. Article 23. No Japanese subject shall be arrested, detained, tried, or punished unless according to law. Article 24. No Japanese subject shall be deprived of his right of being tried by the judges determined by law. Article 25. Except in the cases provided for in the law, the house of no Japanese subject shall be entered or searched without his consent. Article 26. Except in the cases mentioned in the law, the secrecy of the letters of every Japanese subject shall remain inviolate. Article 27. The right of property of every Japanese subject shall remain inviolate. Measures necessary to be taken for the public benefit shall be any provided for by law. Article 28. 
Japanese subjects shall, within limits not prejudicial to peace and order, and not antagonistic to their duties as subjects, enjoy freedom of religious belief. Article 29. Japanese subjects shall, within the limits of law, enjoy the liberty of speech, writing, publication, public meetings and associations. Article 30. Japanese subjects may present petitions by observing the proper forms of respect and by complying with the rules specially provided for the same. Article 31. The provisions contained in the present chapter shall not affect the exercises of the powers appertaining to the Emperor in times of war or in cases of a national emergency. Article 32. Each and every one of the provisions contained in the preceding articles of the present chapter that are not in conflict with the laws or the rules and discipline of the army and navy shall apply to the officers and men of the army and of the navy. Chapter 3. The Imperial Diet Article 33. The Imperial Diet shall consist of two houses, a house of peers, and the House of Representatives. Article 34. The House of Peers shall, in accordance with the ordinance concerning the House of Peers, be composed of the members of the Imperial Family, of the Orders of Nobility, and of those who have been nominated thereto by the Emperor. Article 35. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members elected by the people, according to the provisions of the law of election. Article 36. No one can at one and the same time be a member of both houses. Article 37. Every law requires the consent of the imperial diet. Article 38. Both houses shall vote upon projects of law submitted to it by the government and may respectively initiate projects of law. Article 39. A bill which has been rejected by either the one or the other of the two houses shall not be brought in again during the same session. Article 40. Both houses can make representations to the government, as to laws or upon any other subject. When, however, such representations are not accepted, they cannot be made a second time during the same session. Article 41. The Imperial Diet shall be convoked every year. Article 42. A session of the Imperial Diet shall last during three months. In case of necessity, the duration of a session may be prolonged by the Imperial Order. Article 43. When urgent necessity arises, an extraordinary session may be convoked in addition to the ordinary one. The duration of an extraordinary session shall be determined by imperial order. Article 44. The opening, closing, prolongation of session and prorogation of the imperial diet shall be effected simultaneously for both houses. In case the House of Representatives has been ordered to dissolve, the House of Peers shall at the same time be prorogued. Article 45. When the House of Representatives has been ordered to dissolve, members shall be caused by imperial order to be newly elected, and the new House shall be convoked within five months from the day of dissolution. Article 46. No debate can be opened, and no vote can be taken in either House of the Imperial Diet, unless not less than one-third of the whole number of members thereof is present. Article 47. Votes shall be taken in both Houses by absolute majority. In the case of a tie vote, the President shall have the casting vote. Article 48. The deliberations of both Houses shall be held in public. The deliberations may, however, upon demand of the government or by resolution of the House, be held in secret sitting. Article 49. 
both houses of the imperial diet may respectively present addresses to the emperor. Article 50. Both houses may receive petitions presented by subjects. Article 51. Both houses may enact, besides what is provided for in the present constitution and in the law of the houses, rules necessary for the management of their internal affairs. Article 52. No member of either house shall be held responsible outside the respective houses, for any opinion uttered or for any vote given in the house. When, however, a member himself has given publicity to his opinions by public speech, by documents in print or in writing, or by any other similar means, he shall, in the matter, be amenable to the general law. Article 53. The members of both houses shall, during the session, be free from arrest, unless with the consent of the house except in cases of flagrant delicts or of offences connected with a state of internal commotion or with a foreign trouble. Article 54. The ministers of state and the delegates of the government may, at any time, take seats and speak in either house. Chapter 4. The ministers of state and the privy council. Article 55. The respective ministers of state shall give their advice to the emperor and be responsible for it. All laws, imperial ordinances and imperial rescripts of whatever kind that relate to the affairs of the state require the counter-signature of a minister of state. Article 56. The Privy Councillors shall, in accordance with the provisions for the organization of the Privy Council, deliberate upon important matters of state when they have been consulted by the Emperor. Chapter 5. The Judicature Article 57. The Judicature shall be exercised by the courts of law according to law in the name of the Emperor. The organization of the courts of law shall be determined by law. Article 58. The judges shall be appointed from among those who possess proper qualifications according to law. No judge shall be deprived of his position unless by way of criminal sentence or disciplinary punishment. Rules for disciplinary punishment shall be determined by law. Article 59. Trials and judgments of a court shall be conducted publicly. When, however, there exists any fear that such publicity may be prejudicial to peace and order, or to the maintenance of public morality, the public trial may be suspended by provisions of law or by the decision of the court of law. Article 60. All matters that fall within the competency of a special court shall be specially provided for by law. Article 61. No suit at law which relates to rights alleged to have been infringed by the illegal measures of the administrative authorities and which shall come within the competency of the court of administrative litigation specially established by law shall be taken cognizance of by court of law. Chapter 6. Finance. Article 62. The imposition of a new tax or the modification of the rates of an existing one shall be determined by law. However, all such administrative fees or other revenue having the nature of compensation shall not fall within the category of the above clause. The raising of national loans and the contracting of other liabilities to the charge of the national treasury, except those that are provided in the budget, shall require the consent of the imperial diet. Article 63. The taxes levied at present shall, in so far as they are not remodeled by a new law, be collected according to the old system. Article 64. 
the expenditure and revenue of the state require the consent of the imperial diet by means of an annual budget any and all expenditures overpassing the appropriations set forth in the titles and paragraphs of the budget or that are not provided for in the budget shall subsequently require the approbation of the imperial diet article sixty five the budget shall be first laid before the house of representatives article sixty six the expenditures of the imperial house shall be defrayed every year out of the national treasury according to the present fixed amount for the same and shall not require the consent thereto of the imperial diet except in case an increase thereof is found necessary article sixty seven those already fixed expenditures based by the constitution upon the powers appertaining to the emperor and such expenditures as may have arisen by the effect of law or that appertain to the legal obligations of the government shall be neither rejected nor reduced by the imperial diet without the concurrence of the government article sixty eight in order to meet special requirements the government may ask the consent of the imperial diet to a certain amount as a continuing expenditure fund for a previously fixed number of years article sixty nine in order to supply deficiencies which are unavoidable in the budget and to meet requirements unprovided for in the same a reserve fund shall be provided in the budget article seventy when the imperial diet cannot be convoked owing to the external or internal condition of the country in case of urgent need for the maintenance of public safety the government may take all necessary financial measures by means of an imperial ordinance in the case mentioned in the preceding clause the matter shall be submitted to the imperial diet at its next session and its approbation shall be obtained thereto article seventy one when the imperial diet has not voted on the budget or when the budget has not been brought into actual existence the government shall carry out the budget of the preceding year article seventy two the final account of the expenditures and revenues of the state shall be verified and confirmed by the board of audit and it shall be submitted by the government to the imperial diet together with the report of verification of the said board the organization and competency of the board of audit shall of determined by law separately chapter seven supplementary rules article seventy three when it has become necessary in future to amend the provisions of the present constitution a project to the effect shall be submitted to the imperial diet by imperial order in the above case neither house can open the debate unless not less than two-thirds of the whole number of members are present and no amendment can be passed unless a majority of not less than two-thirds of the members present is obtained article seventy four no modification of the imperial house law shall be required to be submitted to the deliberation of the imperial diet no provision of the present constitution can be modified by the imperial house law article seventy five no modification can be introduced into the constitution or into the imperial house law during the time of a regency article seventy six existing legal enactments such as laws regulations ordinances or by whatever names they may be called shall so far as they do not conflict with the present constitution continue in force all existing contracts or orders that entail obligations upon the government and that are connected with expenditure shall come within the scope of article sixty seven the above is the semi-official translation which appeared in h ito commentaries on the constitution of the empire of japan translated m ito
1889. End of The Constitution of the Empire of Japan, 1889. Semi-official translation by M. Ito. Read by Avai in May 2012. A Devonshire Inn by E. V. Lucas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Devonshire Inn. To enter a strange town on foot and unencumbered, leaving one's bag at the station or sending it on in advance, is a prudent course for it liberates the traveller to select his inn at his ease. A man carrying luggage is not free. The bag, in a way, pledges him, at any rate proclaims the fact that he is a traveller and will probably need a bed, and makes it the more difficult for him to extricate himself from the hostel that within doors has failed to come up to the promise of the exterior, as too often is the hostel's habit. All unburdened, then, I entered Kingsbridge at lunchtime at the top of its steep main street, and as I walked down it I cast my glances this side and that to see which inn seemed most promising. The woman who, at Yelmpton, had given me some bread and cheese, had named the Anchor as the best. A man who had beaten me at billiards at Devonport had mentioned another, and, left to myself, I found myself more taken by the façade of a third. I did, however, nothing rash. I looked carefully at all, and then I entered the one with the agreeable façade and asked for lunch. Never have I done a wiser thing. It is odd how trifling are the determining factors in some of the most momentous decisions that face us in life. Here was I, alone and tired, and in a strange part of the country, with the necessity before me of finding a home from home for three or four days and yet even without entering any of the other inns i agree to stay in this one and why well a little because the landlord a big strong leisurely man with a white beard and a massive head who himself did the waiting was pleasant and attentive and a little because his daughter who had charge of the bar was attentive and pleasant but the real reason was pickled onions such was the excellence of these divine roots that I let everything else go. Nights might be bad, but lunches and dinners would be good. For were there not these onions, pickled according to a recipe of the host's mother, now with God, in her day famous for the best ways of preserving and curing, and, indeed, of doing everything that a good housewife should? The enthusiasm displayed by this patriarchal boniface for his mother was perfectly charming, its novelty being part of its charm. Very big landlords with white beards and footfalls that shake the house do not, as a rule, talk about their mothers at all. Should they, through strange martial vicissitudes, come, as this one had done, to wait at table, they wait and go. But this one hovered, and talked reverently of his mother's household genius, giving me the while such delicious proofs of it that I could not have torn myself away. To those exquisite esculents I shall be eternally grateful, for they brought me into knowledge of one of the most interesting of inns. It is a survival. Indeed, to my great satisfaction, the word posting occurred in my bill, for a journey by wagonette to a distant village was thus ennobled. The stables are immense, and contained one horse. The coach house is immense, and contains seventeen carriages of various kinds, from omnibus to dog-cart, but chiefly broughams, all in a state of mouldiness. Coming by degrees to be recognised as a member of the little family, which, by ceaseless activity, ran this unwieldy place, father, daughter, a superb cook, a maid-servant, and an ostler, I was free to wander as I would, and exploring the various floors and passages, I came upon a billiard-table whose cushions belonged to the Stone Age, and an assembly room in the musicians' gallery. In the kitchen I watched at her mysteries the admirable lady who cooked and carried on the noble traditions of the landlord's mother as set forth in a manuscript book in her own hand. In the bar parlour I watched the landlord, according to the new regulations, 
water down his spirits and heard instalments of his long life spent wholly in this house and that in ministering to the wants of his fellow creatures tired or hungry or thirsty but chiefly thirsty then later in the evening the little cosy room would fill and i required to take my place as one of the best listeners that its habitués had ever talked to listening is an old accomplishment of mine and here amid the friendliest of strangers i gave it full play and you would be surprised to know how much i know of kingsbridge life probably their surprise would be even greater and still i have not really begun to describe this most alluring inn in the cellar for example there was some forty-seven port end of a devonshire inn by e v lucas Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death by Patrick Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. St. John's Church, Richmond, Virginia, March 23, 1775. Mr. President, no man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. But different men see the same subject in different lights, and therefore I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if, entertaining as I do, opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery, and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth, and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time, through fear of giving offence, I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country, and of an act of disloyalty towards the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth, and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. 
they are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the british ministry have been so long forging and what have we to oppose to them shall we try argument sir we have been trying that for the last ten years have we anything new to offer upon the subject nothing we have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable but it has been all in vain shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication what terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted let us not i beseech you sir deceive ourselves longer sir we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on we have petitioned we have remonstrated we have supplicated we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament our petitions have been slighted our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult our supplications have been disregarded and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne in vain after these things may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation there is no longer any room for hope if we wish to be free if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained we must fight i repeat it sir we must fight an appeal to arms and to the god of hosts is all that is left us they tell us sir that we are weak unable to cope with so formidable an adversary but when shall we be stronger will it be the next week or the next year will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a british guard shall be stationed in every house shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot sir we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the god of nature hath placed in our power three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us besides sir we shall not fight our battles alone there is a just god who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us the battle sir is not to the strong alone it is to the vigilant the active the brave besides sir we have no election if we were base enough to desire it it is now too late to retire from the contest there is no retreat but in submission and slavery our chains are forged their clanking may be heard on the plains of boston the war is inevitable and let it come i repeat it sir let it come it is in vain sir to extenuate the matter gentlemen may cry peace peace but there is no peace the war is actually begun the next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms our brethren are already in the field why stand we here idle what is it that gentlemen wish what would they have is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery forbid it almighty god i know not what course others may take but as for me give me liberty or give me death end of give me liberty or give me death by patrick henry recording by bob gonzalez july fourth two thousand and twelve
A Holiday in Bed by J. M. Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. People have tried a holiday in bed before now, and found it a failure, but that was because they were ignorant of the rules. They went to bed with the open intention of staying there, say, three days, and found to their surprise that each morning they wanted to get up. This was a novel experience to them. They flung about restlessly and probably shortened their holiday. The proper thing is to take your holiday in bed with a vague intention of getting up in another quarter of an hour. The real pleasure of lying in bed after you awake is largely due to the feeling that you ought to get up. To take another quarter of an hour then becomes a luxury. You are, in short, in the position of the man who dined on larks. Had he seen the hundreds that were ready for him, all set out on one monster dish, they would have alarmed him. But getting them two at a time, he went on eating till all the larks were gone. His feeling of uncertainty as to whether these might not be his last two larks is your feeling that, perhaps, you will have to get up in a quarter of an hour. Deceive yourself in this way, and your holiday in bed will pass only too quickly. Sympathy is what all the world is craving for, and sympathy is what the ordinary holiday-maker never gets. How can we be expected to sympathize with you when we know you are off to Perthshire to fish? No, we say we wish we were you, and forget that your holiday is sure to be a hollow mockery that your child will jam her finger in the railway carriage and scream to the end of the journey, that you will lose your luggage, that the guard will notice your dog beneath the seat and insist on it being paid for, that you will be caught in a scotch mist on the top of a mountain and be put on gruel for a fortnight, that your wife will fret herself into a fever about the way the servant, who has been left at home, is treating her cousins, the milkman, and the policeman, and that you will be had up for trespassing. Yes, when you tell us that you are off to-morrow, we have never the sympathy to say, Poor fellow, I hope you'll pull through somehow. If it is an exhibition you go to gaze at, we never picture you dragging your weary legs from one department to another, and wondering why your back aches. Should it be the seaside, we talk heartlessly to you about the briny, though we must know if we would stop to think that if there were one holiday more miserable than all the others, it is that spent at the seaside, when you wander along the weary beach and fling pebbles at the sea, and wonder how long it will be till dinner-time. Were we to come down to see you, we should probably find you not on the beach, but moving slowly through the village, looking in at one milliner's window, or laboriously reading what the one grocer's labels say on the subject of pale ale, compressed beef, or vinegar. There was never an object that called aloud for sympathy more than you do, but you get not a jot of it. You should take the first train home and go to bed for three days. To enjoy your holiday in bed to the full, you should let it be vaguely understood that there is something amiss with you. Don't go into details, for they are not necessary. And besides, you want to be dreamy, more or less, and the dreamy state is not consistent with a definite ailment. The moment one takes to bed, he gets sympathy. He may be suffering from a tearing headache, or a tooth that makes him cry out, but if he goes about his business, or even flops in a chair, true sympathy is denied him. Let him take to bed with one of those illnesses of which he can say with accuracy that he is not quite certain what is the matter with him, and his wife, for instance, will want to bathe his brow. She must not be made too anxious. That would not only be cruel to her, but it would wake you from the dreamy state. She must simply see that you are not yourself. Women have an idea that unless men are not themselves, they will not take to bed, and as a consequence your wife is tenderly thoughtful of you. 
Every little while she will ask you if you are feeling any better now, and you can reply, with the old regard for truth, that you are much about it. You may even, for your own pleasure, talk of getting up now, when she will earnestly urge you to stay in bed until you feel easier. You consent, indeed, you are ready to do anything to please her. The ideal holiday in bed does not require the presence of a ministering angel in the room all day. You frequently prefer to be alone, and point out to her that you cannot have her trifling with her health for your sake, and so she must go out for a walk. She is reluctant, but finally goes, protesting that you are the most unselfish of men, only too good for her. This leaves a pleasant aroma behind it, for even when lying in bed we like to feel that we are uncommonly fine fellows. After she is gone you get up cautiously, and, walking stealthily to the wardrobe, produce from the pocket of your greatcoat a good novel. A holiday in bed must be arranged for beforehand. With a gleam in your eye you slip back to bed, double your pillow to make it higher, and begin to read. You have only got to the fourth page when you make a horrible discovery, namely, that the book is not cut. An experienced holiday-maker would have had it cut the night before, but this is your first real holiday, or perhaps you have been thoughtless. In any case, you have now matter to think of. You are torn in two different ways. There is your coat on the floor with a knife in it, but you cannot reach the coat without getting up again. Ought you to get the knife, or to give up reading? Perhaps it takes a quarter of an hour to decide this question, and you decide it by discovering a third course. Being a sort of invalid, you have certain privileges which would be denied you if you were merely sitting in a chair in the agonies of neuralgia. One of the glorious privileges of a holiday in bed is that you are entitled to cut books with your fingers. So you cut the novel in this way and read on. Those who have never tried it may fancy that there is a lack of incident in a holiday in bed. There could not be a more monstrous mistake. You are in the middle of a chapter when suddenly you hear a step upon the stair. Your loving ears tell you that the ministering angel has returned and is hastening to you. Now what happens? The book disappears beneath the pillow, and when she enters the room softly, you are lying there with your eyes shut. This is not merely incident, it is drama. What happens next depends on circumstances. She may say in a low voice, Are you feeling any easier now, John? No answer. Oh, I believe he is sleeping. Then she steals from the room, and you begin to read again. During a holiday in bed one never thinks, of course, of analyzing his actions. If you had done so in this instance, you would have seen that you pretended sleep because you had got to an exciting passage. You love your wife, but, wife or no wife, you must see how the passage ends. Possibly the little scene plays differently, as thus. John, are you feeling any easier now? No answer. Are you asleep? No answer. What a pity! I didn't want to waken him, and yet the fowl will be spoilt. Is that you back, Marion? Yes, dear, I thought you were asleep. No, only thinking. You think too much, dear. I have cooked a chicken for you. I have no appetite. I'm so sorry, but I can give it to the children. Oh, as it's cooked, you may as well bring it up. In that case the reason of your change of action is obvious, but why do you not let your wife know that you have been reading? This is another matter that you never reason about. Perhaps it is because of your craving for sympathy, and your fear that if you were seen enjoying a novel the sympathy would go. Or perhaps it is that a holiday in bed is never perfect without a secret. Monotony must be guarded against, and so long as you keep the book to yourself, your holiday in bed is a healthy excitement. A stolen book, as we may call it, is like a stolen fruit, sweeter than what you can devour openly. The boy enjoys his stolen apple, because at any moment 
he may have to slip it down the leg of his trousers and pretend that he has merely climbed the tree to enjoy the scenery. You enjoy your book doubly because you feel that it is a forbidden pleasure. Or do you conceal the book from your wife lest she should think that you are over-exerting yourself? She must not be made anxious on your account. Ah, that is it. People who pretend, for it must be pretense, that they enjoy their holiday in the country, explain that the hills or the sea gave them such an appetite. I could never myself feel the delight of being able to manage an extra herring for breakfast. But it should be pointed out that neither mountains nor oceans give you such an appetite as a holiday in bed. What makes people eat more anywhere is that they have nothing else to do, and in bed you have lots of time for meals. As for the quality of the food supplied, there is no comparison. In the highlands it is ham and eggs all day till you sicken. At the seaside it is fish till the bones stick in your mouth, but in bed, oh, there you get something worth eating. You don't take three big meals a day, but twelve little ones, and each time it is something different from the last. There are delicacies for breakfast, for your four luncheons, and your five dinners. You explain to your wife that you have lost your appetite, and she believes you, but at the same time she has the sense to hurry on your dinner. At the clatter of dishes, for which you have been lying listening, you raise your poor head and say faintly, Really, Marion, I can't touch food. But this is nothing, she says, only the wing of a partridge. You take a side glance at it and see that there is also the other wing and the body and two legs. Your alarm thus dispelled, you say, I really can't. But, dear, it's so beautifully cooked. Yes, but I have no appetite. But try to take it, John, for my sake. Then, for her sake, you say she can leave it on the chair, and perhaps you will just taste it. As soon as she is gone, you devour that partridge, and when she comes back she has the sense to say, Why, you have scarcely eaten anything. What can you take for supper? You say you can take nothing, but if she likes she can cook a large soul, only you won't be able to touch it. Poor dear, she says, your appetite has completely gone, and then she rushes to the kitchen to cook the soul with her own hands. In half an hour she steals into your room with it, and then you, who have been wondering why she is so long, start up protesting. I hope, Marion, this is nothing for me. Only the least bit of a soul, dear. But I told you I could eat nothing. Well, this is nothing. It's so small. You look again and see with relief that it is a large soul. I would much rather that you took it away. But, dear, I tell you I have no appetite. Of course, I know that. But how can you hope to preserve your strength? If you eat so little, you have had nothing all day. You glance at her face to see if she is in earnest, but you can remember three breakfasts, four luncheons, two dinners, and sandwiches between, but evidently she is not jesting. Then you yield. Oh, well, to keep my health up I may just put a fork into it. Do, dear, it will do you good, though you have no caring for it. Take a holiday in bed, if only to discover what an angel your wife is. There is only one thing to guard against. Never call it a holiday. Continue not to feel sure what is wrong with you, and to talk vaguely of getting up presently. Your wife will suggest calling in the doctor, but pooh-pooh him. Be firm on that point. The chances are that he won't understand your case. End of A Holiday in Bed by J. M. Barry, read by Phil Chenevere. The Humor of Homer by Samuel Butler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
the first of the two great poems commonly ascribed to homer is called the iliad a title which we may be sure was not given it by the author it professes to treat of a quarrel between agamemnon and achilles that broke out while the greeks were besieging the city of troy and it does indeed deal largely with the consequences of this quarrel whether however the ostensible subject did not conceal another that was nearer the poet's heart i mean the last days death and burial of hector is a point that i cannot determine nor yet can i determine how much of the iliad as we now have it is by homer and how much by a later writer or writers this is a very vexed question but i myself believe the iliad to be entirely by a single poet the second poem commonly ascribed to the same author is called the odyssey it deals with the adventures of ulysses during his ten years of wandering after troy had fallen these two works have of late years been believed to be by different authors the iliad is now generally held to be the older work by some one or two hundred years the leading ideas of the iliad are love war and plunder though this last is less insisted on than the other two the keynote is struck with a woman's charms and a quarrel among men for their possession it is a woman who is at the bottom of the trojan war itself woman throughout the iliad is a being to be loved teased laughed at and if necessary carried off we are told in one place of a fine bronze cauldron for heating water which was worth twenty oxen whereas a few lines lower down a good serviceable maid of all work is valued at four oxen i think there is a spice of malicious humor in this valuation and am confirmed in this opinion by noting that though woman in the iliad is on one occasion depicted as a wife so faithful and affectionate that nothing more perfect can be found either in real life or fiction yet as a general rule she is drawn as teasing scolding thwarting contradicting and hoodwinking the sex that has the effrontery to deem itself her lord and master whether or no this view may have arisen from any domestic difficulties between homer and his wife is a point which again i find it impossible to determine we cannot refrain from contemplating such possibilities if we are to be at home with homer there must be no sitting on the edge of one's chair dazzled by the splendor of his reputation he was after all only a literary man and those who occupy themselves with letters must approach him as a very honored member of their own fraternity but still as one who must have felt thought and acted much as themselves he struck oil while we for the most part succeed in boring only still we are his literary brethren and if we would read his lines intelligently we must also read between them that one so shrewd and yet a dreamer of such dreams as have been vouchsafed to few indeed besides himself that one so genially sceptical and so given to looking into the heart of a matter should have been in such perfect harmony with his surroundings as to think himself in the best of all possible worlds this is not believable the world is always more or less out of joint to the poet generally more so and unfortunately he always thinks it more or less his business to set it right generally more so we are all of us more or less poets generally indeed less so still we feel and think and to think at all is to be out of harmony with much that we think about we may be sure then that homer had his full share of troubles and also the traces of these abound up and down his work if we could only identify them for everything that every one does is in some measure a portrait of himself but here comes the difficulty not to read between the lines not to try and detect the hidden features of the writer this is to be a dull unsympathetic incurious reader and on the other hand to try and read between them is to be in danger of running after every will-o'-the-wisp that conceit may raise for our delusion i believe it will help you better to understand the broad humor of the iliad which we shall presently reach if you will allow me to say a little more about the general characteristics of the poem over and above the love and war that are his main themes there is another which the author never loses sight of 
i mean distrust and dislike of the ideas of his time as regards the gods and omens no poet ever made gods in his own image more defiantly than the author of the iliad in the likeness of man created he them and the only excuse for him is that he obviously desired his readers not to take them seriously this at least is the impression he leaves upon his reader and when so great a man as homer leaves an impression it must be presumed that he does so intentionally it may be almost said that he has made the gods take the worst not the better side of man's nature upon them and to be in all respects as we ourselves yet without virtue it should be noted however that the gods on the trojan side are treated far more leniently than those who help the greeks the chief gods on the grecian side are juno minerva and neptune juno as you will shortly see is a scolding wife who in spite of all jove's bluster wears the breeches or tries exceedingly hard to do so minerva is an angry termagant mean mischief-making and vindictive she begins by pulling achilles hair and later on she knocks the helmet from off the head of mars she hates venus and tells the grecian hero diomede that he had better not wound any of the other gods but that he is to hit venus if he can which he presently does because he sees that she is feeble and not like minerva or bellona neptune is a bitter hater apollo mars venus diana and jove so far as his wife will let him are on the trojan side these as i have said meet with better though still somewhat contemptuous treatment at the poet's hand jove however is being mocked and laughed at from first to last and if one moral can be drawn from the iliad more clearly than another it is that he is only to be trusted to a very limited extent homer's position in fact as regards divine interference is the very opposite of david's david writes put not your trust in princes nor in any child of man there is no sure help but from the lord with homer it is put not your trust in jove neither in any omen from heaven there is but one good omen to fight for one's country fortune favors the brave heaven helps those who help themselves the god who comes off best is vulcan the lame hobbling old blacksmith who is the laughing-stock of all the others and whose exquisitely graceful skilful workmanship forms such an effective contrast to the uncouth exterior of the workman him as a man of genius and an artist and furthermore as a dis somewhat despised artist homer treats if with playfulness still with respect in spite of the fact that circumstances have thrown him more on the side of the greeks than of the trojans with whom i understand homer's sympathies lie the poet either dislikes music or is at best insensible to it great poets very commonly are so achilles indeed does on one occasion sing to his own accompaniment on the lyre but we are not told that it was any pleasure to hear him and patroclos who was in the tent at the time was not enjoying it he was only waiting for achilles to leave off but though fond of music homer has a very keen sense of the beauties of nature and is constantly referring both in and out of season to all manner of homely incidents that are as familiar to us as to himself sparks in the train of a shooting star a cloud of dust upon a high road foresters going out to cut wood in a forest the shrill cry of the cicale children making walls of sand on the seashore or teasing wasps when they have found a wasp's nest a poor but very honest woman who gains a pittance for her children by selling wool and weighs it very carefully a child clinging to its mother's dress and crying to be taken up and carried none of these things escape him neither in the iliad nor the odyssey do we ever receive so much as a hint as to the time of year at which any of these events described are happening but on one occasion the author of the iliad really has told us that it was a very fine day and this not from a business point of view but out of pure regard to the weather for its own sake with one more observation i will conclude my preliminary remarks about the iliad i cannot find its author within the four corners of the work itself i believe the writer of the odyssey to appear in the poem as a prominent and very fascinating character whom we shall presently meet but there is no one in the iliad on whom i can put my finger with even a passing idea that he may be the author 
still if under some severe penalty i were compelled to find him i should say it was just possible that he might consider his own lot to have been more or less like that which he forecasts for astyanax the infant son of hector at any rate his intimate acquaintance with the topography of troy which is now well ascertained and still more his obvious attempt to excuse the non-existence of a great wall which according to his story ought to be there and which he knew had never existed so that no trace could remain while there were abundant traces of all the other features he describes these facts convince me that he was in all probability a native of the troad or country round troy his plausibly concealed trojan sympathies and more particularly the aggravated exaggeration with which the flight of hector is described suggest to me coming as they do from an astute and humorous writer that he may have been a trojan at any rate by the mother's side made captive enslaved compelled to sing the glories of his captors and determined so to overdo them that if his masters cannot see through the irony others sooner or later shall this however is highly speculative and there are other views that are perhaps more true but which i cannot now consider i will now ask you to form your own opinions as to whether homer is or is not a shrewd and humorous writer achilles whose quarrel with agamemnon is the ostensible subject of the poem is son to a marine goddess named thetis who had rendered jove an important service at a time when he was in great difficulties achilles therefore begs his mother thetis to go up to jove and ask him to let the trojans discomfit the greeks for a time so that agamemnon may find he cannot get on without achilles help and may thus be brought to reason thetis tells her son that for the moment there is nothing to be done inasmuch as the gods are all of them away from home they are gone to pay a visit to oceanus in central africa and will not be back for another ten or twelve days she will see what can be done however as soon as ever they return this in due course she does going up to olympus and laying hold of jove by the knee and by the chin i may say in passing that it is still a common italian form of salutation to catch people by the chin twice during the last summer i have been so seized in token of affectionate greeting once by a lady and once by a gentleman thetis tells her tale to jove and concludes by saying that he is to say straight out yes or no whether he will do what she asks of course he can please himself but she should like to know how she stands it will be a plaguy business answered jove for me to offend juno and put up with all the bitter tongue she will give me as it is she's always nagging at me and saying i help the trojans still go away now at once before she finds out that you have been here and leave the rest to me see i nod my head to you and this is the most solemn form of covenant into which i can enter i never go back upon it nor shilly shally with anybody when once i have nodded my head which by the way amounts to an admission that he does shilly shally sometimes then he frowns and nods shaking the hair on his immortal head till olympus rocks again thetis goes off under the sea and jove returns to his own palace all the other gods stand up when they see him coming for they do not dare to remain sitting while he passes but juno knows he has been hatching mischief against the greeks with thetis so she attacks him in the following words you traitorous scoundrel she exclaims which of the gods have you been taking into your council now you are always trying to settle matters behind my back and never tell me if you can help it a single word about your designs juno replied the father of gods and men you must not expect to be told everything that i am thinking about you are my wife it is true but you might not be able always to understand my meaning in so far as it is proper for you to know of my intentions you are the first person to whom i communicate them either among the gods or among mankind there are certain points which i reserve entirely for myself and the less you pry into these or meddle with them the better for you dread son of saturn answered juno what in the world are you talking about i meddle and pry no one i am sure can have his own way in everything more absolutely than you have still i have a strong misgiving that the old merman's daughter thetis has been talking you over i saw her hugging your knees this very self-same morning and i suspect you have been promising her to kill any number of people down at the grecian ships in order to gratify achilles wife replied jove i can do nothing but you suspect me you will not do yourself any good for the more you go on like that 
the more I dislike you, and it may fare badly with you. If I mean to have it so, I mean to have it so. You had better therefore sit still, and hold your tongue as I tell you, for if I once begin to lay my hands about you, there is not a god in heaven who will be of the smallest use to you. When Juno heard this, she thought it better to submit, so she sat down without a word. But all the gods throughout Jove's mansion were very much perturbed. Presently the cunning workman Vulcan tried to pacify his mother Juno, and said, It will never do for you two to go on quarrelling, and setting heaven in an uproar about a pack of mortals. The thing will not bear talking about. If such counsels are to prevail, a god will not be able to get his dinner in peace. Let me then advise my mother, and I am sure it is her own opinion, to make her peace with my dear father, lest he should scold her further, and spoil our banquet. For if he does wish to turn us all out, there can be no question about his being perfectly able to do so. Say something civil to him, therefore, and then perhaps he will not hurt us. As he spoke, he took a large cup of nectar and put it into his mother's hands, saying, Bear it, my dear mother, and make the best of it. I love you dearly, and should be very sorry to see you get a thrashing. I should not be able to help you, for my father Jove is not a safe person to differ from. You know, once before, when I was trying to help you, he caught me by the foot and chucked me from the heavenly threshold. I was all day long falling from morn to eve, but at sunset I came to the ground on the island of Lemnos, and there was very little life left in me till the Sintians came and tended me. On this Juno smiled, and with a laugh took the cup from her son's hand. Then Vulcan went about among all the other gods, drawing nectar for them from his goblet, and they laughed immoderately as they saw him bustling about the heavenly mansion. Then presently the gods go home to bed, each one to his own house, that Vulcan had cunningly built for him or her. Finally, Jove himself went to the bed which he generally occupied, and Juno his wife went with him. There is another quarrel between Jove and Juno at the beginning of the fourth book. The gods are sitting on the golden floor of Jove's palace and drinking one another's health in the nectar with which Hebe from time to time supplies them. Jove begins to tease Juno and to provoke her with some sarcastic remarks that are pointed at her, though not addressed to her directly. Menelaus, he exclaimed, has two good friends among the goddesses, Juno and Minerva, but they only sit still and look on, while Venus, on the other hand, takes much better care of Paris and defends him when there is danger. She has only just this moment been rescuing him when he made sure he was at death's door, for the victory really did lie with Menelaus. We must think what we are to do about all this. Shall we renew strife between the combatants, or shall we make them friends again? I think the best plan would be for the city of Priam to remain unpillaged, but for Menelaus to have his wife Helen sent back to him. Minerva and Juno groaned in spirit when they heard this. They were sitting side by side and thinking what mischief they could do to the Trojans. Minerva, for her part, said not one word, but sat scowling at her father, for she was in a furious passion with him. But Juno could not contain herself, so she said, What, pray, son of Saturn, is this all about? Is my trouble then to go for nothing, and all the pains that I have taken to say nothing of my horses, and the way we have sweated and toiled to get the people together against Priam and his children? You can do as you please, but you must not expect all of us to agree with you. And Jove answered, wife what harm have priam and priam's children done you that you rage so furiously against them and want to sack their city will nothing do for you but that you must eat priam with his sons and all the trojans into the bargain have it your own way then for i will not quarrel with you only remember what i tell you if at any time i want to sack a city that belongs to any friend of yours it will be no use your trying to hinder me you will have to let me do it for i only yield to you now with the greatest reluctance if there was one city under the sun which i respected more than another it was troy with its king and people my altars there have never been without the savor of fat or of burnt sacrifice, and all my dues were paid. My own favorite cities, answered Juno, are Argos, Sparta, and Mycenae. Sack them whenever you may be displeased with them. I shall not make the smallest protest against your doing so. 
it would be no use if i did for you are much stronger than i am only i will not submit to seeing my own work wasted i am a goddess of the same race as yourself i am saturn's eldest daughter and am not only nearly related to you in blood but i am wife to yourself and you are king over the gods let it be a case then of give and take between us and the other gods will follow our lead tell minerva therefore to go down at once and set the greeks and trojans by the ears again let her so manage it that the trojans shall break their oaths and be the aggressors this is the very thing to suit minerva so she goes at once and persuades the trojans to break their oath in a later book we are told that jove has positively forbidden the gods to interfere further in the struggle juno therefore determines to hoodwink him first she bolted herself inside her own room on the top of mount ida and had a thorough good wash then she scented herself brushed her golden hair put on her very best dress and all her jewels when she had done this she went to venus and besought her for the loan of her charms you must not be angry with me venus she began for being on the grecian side while you yourself are on the trojan but you know every one falls in love with you at once and i want you to lend me some of your attractions i have to pay a visit at the world's end to oceanus and mother tethys they took me in and were very good to me when jove turned saturn out of heaven and shut him up under the sea they have been quarrelling this long time past and will not speak to one another so i must go and see them for if i can only make them friends again i am sure they will be grateful to me for ever afterwards venus thought this reasonable so she took off her girdle and lent it to juno an act by the way which argues more good nature than prudence on her part then juno goes down to thrace and in search of sleep the brother of death she finds him and shakes hands with him then she tells him that she is going up to olympus to make love to jove and that while she is occupying his attention sleep is to send him off into a deep slumber sleep says he dares not do it he would lull any of the other gods but juno must remember that she had got him into a great scrape once before in this way and jove hurled the gods about all over the palace and would have made an end of him once for all if he had not fled under the protection of night whom jove did not venture to offend juno bribes him however with a promise that if he will consent she will marry him to the youngest of the graces pasithea on this he yields the pair then go up to the top of mount ida and sleep gets into a high pine tree just in front of jove as soon as jove sees juno armed as she for the moment was with all the attractions of venus he falls desperately in love with her and says she is the only goddess he ever really loved true there had been the wife of ixion and danae and europa and semele and alcmena and latona not to mention herself in days gone by but he never loved any of these as he now loved her in spite of his having been married to her for so many years what then does she want juno tells him the same rigmarole about oceanus and mother tethys that she had told venus and when she is done jove tries to embrace her what exclaims juno kiss me in such a public place as the top of mount ida impossible i could never show my face in olympus again but i have a private room of my own and what nonsense my love exclaims the sire of gods and men as he catches her in his arms on this sleep sends him into a deep slumber and juno then sends sleep to bid neptune to go off to help the greeks at once when jove awakes and finds the trick that has been played upon him he is very angry and blusters a good deal as usual but somehow or another it turns out that he has got to stand it and make the best of it in an earlier book he has said that he is not surprised at anything juno may do for she has always crossed him and always will but he cannot put up with such disobedience from his own daughter minerva somehow or another however here too as usual it turns out that he has got to stand it and then minerva exclaims in yet another place i suppose he will be calling me his grey-eyed darling again presently towards the end of the poem the gods have a set to among themselves minerva sends mars sprawling venus comes to his assistance but minerva knocks her down and leaves her neptune challenges apollo but P apollo says it is not proper for a god to fight his own uncle and declines the contest his sister diana taunts him with cowardice so juno grips her by the wrist and boxes her ears till she writhes again latona the mother of apollo and diana then challenges mercury but mercury says that he is not going to fight with any of jove's wives so if she chooses to say she has beaten him she is welcome to do so 
then latona picks up poor diana's bow and arrows that have fallen from her during her encounter with juno and diana meanwhile flies up to the knees of her father jove sobbing and sighing till her ambrosial robe trembles all around her jove drew her toward him and smiling pleasantly exclaimed my dear child which of the heavenly beings has been wicked enough to behave in this way to you as though you had been doing something naughty your wife juno answered diana has been ill-treating me all our quarrels always begin with her the above extracts must suffice as examples of the kind of divine comedy in which homer brings the gods and goddesses upon the scene among mortals the humor what there is of it is confined mainly to the grim taunts which the heroes fling at one another when they are fighting and more especially to crowing over a fallen foe the most subtle passage is the one in which briseis the captive woman about whom achilles and agamemnon have quarrelled is restored by agamemnon to achilles briseis on her return to the tent of achilles finds that while she has been with agamemnon patroclus has been killed by hector and his dead body is now lying in state she flings herself upon the corpse and exclaims how one misfortune does keep falling upon me after another i saw the man to whom my father and mother had married me killed before my eyes and my three own dear brothers perished along with him but you patroclus even when achilles was sacking our city and killing my husband told me that i was not to cry for you said that achilles himself should marry me and take me back with him to phythia where we should have a wedding feast among the myrmidons you were always kind to me and i should never cease to grieve for you this may of course be seriously intended but homer was an acute writer and if we had met with such a passage in thackeray we should have taken him to mean that so long as a woman can get a new husband she does not much care about losing the old one a sentiment which i hope no one will imagine that i for one endorse or approve of and which i can only explain as a piece of sarcasm aimed possibly at mrs homer and now let us turn to the odyssey a work which i myself think of as the iliad's better half or wife here we have a poem of more varied interest instinct with not less genius and on the whole i should say if less robust nevertheless of still greater fascination one moreover the irony of which is pointed neither at gods nor woman but with one single and perhaps intercalated exception at man gods and women may sometimes do wrong things but except as regards the intrigue between mars and venus just referred to they are never laughed at the scepticism of the iliad is that of hume or gibbon that of the odyssey if any is like the occasional mild irreverence of the vicar's daughter when jove says he will do a thing there is no uncertainty about his doing it juno hardly appears at all and when she does she never quarrels with her husband minerva has more to do than any of the other gods or goddesses but she has nothing in common with the minerva whom we have already seen in the iliad in the odyssey she is the fairy godmother who seems to have no object in life but to protect ulysses and telemachus and keep them straight at any touch and turn of difficulty if she has any other function it is to be the patroness of the arts and of all intellectual development the minerva of the odyssey may indeed sit on a rafter like a swallow and hold up her aegis to strike panic into the suitors while ulysses kills them but she is a perfect lady and would no more knock mars and venus down one after the other than she would stand on her head she is in fact a distinct person in all respects from the minerva of the iliad of the remaining gods neptune as the persecutor of the hero comes worst off but even he is treated as though he were a very important person in the odyssey the gods no longer live in houses and sleep in four-post bedsteads but the conception of their abode like that of their existence altogether is far more spiritual nobody knows exactly where they live but they say it is in olympus where there is neither rain nor hail nor snow and the wind never beats roughly but it abides in everlasting sunshine and in great peacefulness of light wherein the blessed gods are illumined for ever and ever it is hardly possible to conceive anything more different from the olympus of the iliad another very material point of difference between the iliad and the odyssey lies in the fact that the homer of the iliad always knows what he's talking about while the supposed homer of the odyssey often makes mistakes that betray an almost incredible ignorance of detail 
thus the giant polyphemus drives in his ewes home from their pasture and milks them the lambs of course have not been running with them they have been left in the yards so they have had nothing to eat when he has milked the ewes the giant lets each of them have her lamb to get i suppose what strippings it can and beyond this what milk the ewe may yield during the night in the morning however polyphemus milks the ewes again hence it is plain either that he expected his lambs to thrive on one pull per diem at a milked ewe and to be kind enough not to suck their mothers though left with them all night through or else the writer of the odyssey had very hazy notions about the relations between lambs and ewes and of the ordinary methods of procedure on an upland dairy farm in nautical matters this same experience is betrayed the writer knows all about the corn and wine that must be put on board the storeroom in which these are kept and the getting of them are described inimitably but there the knowledge ends other things put on board are the things that are generally taken on board ships so on a voyage we are told that the sailors do whatever is wanted doing but we have no details there is a shipwreck which does duty more than once without the alteration of a word i have seen such a shipwreck at drury lane any one moreover who reads any authentic account of actual adventures will perceive at once that those of the odyssey are the creation of one who has had no history ulysses has to make a raft he makes it about as broad as they generally make a good big ship but we do not seem to have been at the pains to measure a good big ship i will add no more however on this head the leading characteristics of the iliad as we saw were love war and plunder the leading idea of the odyssey is the infatuation of man and the keynote is struck in the opening paragraph where we are told how the sailors of ulysses must needs in spite of every warning kill and eat the cattle of the sun-god and perished accordingly a few lines lower down the same note is struck with even greater emphasis the gods have met in council and jove happens at the moment to be thinking of aegisthus who had met his death at the hand of agamemnon's son orestes in spite of the solemn warning that jove had sent him through the mouth of mercury it does not seem necessary for jove to turn his attention to clytemnestra the partner of aegisthus's guilt of this lady we are presently told that she was naturally of an excellent disposition and would never have gone wrong but for the loss of the protector in whose charge agamemnon had left her when she was left alone without an adviser well if a base designing man took to flattering and misleading her what else could be expected the infatuation of man with its corollary the superior excellence of woman is the leading theme next to this come art religion and i am almost ashamed to add money there is no love business in the odyssey except the return of a bald elderly married man to his elderly wife and grown-up son after an absence of twenty years and furious at having been robbed of so much money in the meantime but this can hardly be called love business it is at the utmost domesticity there is a charming young princess nausicaa but though she affects a passing tenderness for the elderly hero of her creation as soon as minerva had curled his bald old hair for him and titivated him up all over she makes it abundantly plain that she will not look at a single one of her actual flesh and blood admirers there is a leading young gentleman telemachus who is nothing if he is not canny well principled and discreet he has an amiable and most sensible young male friend who says that he does not like crying at meal-times he will cry in the forenoon on an empty stomach as much as any one pleases but he cannot attend properly to his dinner and cry at the same time well there is no lady provided either for this nice young man or for telemachus they are left high and dry as bachelors two goddesses indeed circe and calypso do one after the other take possession of ulysses but the way in which he accepts a situation which after all was none of his seeking and which it is plain he does not care two straws about is i believe dictated solely by a desire to exhibit the easy infidelity of ulysses himself in contrast with the unswerving constancy and fidelity of his wife penelope throughout the odyssey the men do not really care for women nor the women for men they have to pretend to do so now and again but it is a got-up thing and the general attitude of the sexes toward one another is very much that of helen who says that her husband menelaus is really not deficient in person or understanding 
or again of Penelope herself, who, on being asked by Ulysses on his return what she thought of him, said that she did not think very much of him, nor very little of him. In fact, she did not think much of him one way or the other. True, later on she relents and becomes more effusive. In fact, when she and Ulysses sat up talking in bed and Ulysses told her the story of his adventures, she never went to sleep once. Ulysses never had to nudge her with his elbow and say, Come on, wake up, Penelope, you're not listening. But in spite of the devotion exhibited here, the love business in the Odyssey is artificial and described by one who had never felt it, whereas in the Iliad it is spontaneous and obviously genuine, as by one who knows all about it perfectly well. The love business, in fact, of the Odyssey is turned on as we turn on the gas when we cannot get on without it, but not otherwise. A fascinating, brilliant girl who naturally adopts for her patroness the blue-stocking Minerva a man-hatress, as clever girls so often are, and determined to pay the author of the Iliad out for his treatment of her sex by insisting on its superior moral, not to say intellectual, capacity, and on the self-sufficient imbecility of man unless he has a woman always at his elbow to keep him tolerably straight and in his proper place. This, and not the fusty, musty old bust we see in libraries, is the kind of person who I believe wrote the Odyssey. Of course, in reality, the work must be written by a man because they say so at Oxford and Cambridge, and they know everything down at Oxford and Cambridge. But I venture to say that if the Odyssey were to appear anonymously for the first time now and to be sent round to the papers for review, there is not even a professional critic who would not see that it is a woman's writing and not a man's. But letting this pass, I can hardly doubt, for reasons which I gave in yesterday's Athenaeum, and for others that I cannot now insist upon, that the poem was written by a native of Trapani, on the coast of Sicily, near Marsala. Fancy what the position of a young, ardent, brilliant woman must have been in a small Sicilian seaport, say some eight or nine hundred years before the birth of Christ. It makes one shudder to think of it night after night she hears the dreary blind old bard demodocus drawl out his interminable recitals taken from our present iliad or from some other of the many poems now lost that deal with the adventures of the greeks before troy or on their homeward journey man and his doings always the same old story and woman always to be treated either as a toy or as a beast of burden or at any rate as an incubus why not sing of woman also as she is when she is unattached and free from the trammels and persecutions of this tiresome tyrant this insufferably self-conceited bore and booby man i wish my dear exclaims her mother arete after one of these little outbreaks that you would do it yourself i am sure you could do it beautifully if you would only give your mind to it very well mother she replies and I will bring in all about you and father, and how I go out for a washing day with the maids, and she kept her word, as I will presently show you. I should tell you that Ulysses, having got away from the goddess Calypso, with whom he had been living for seven or eight years on a lonely and very distant island in mid-ocean, is shipwrecked on the coast of Phaeacia, the chief town of which is Sheria. After swimming some forty-eight hours in the water, he effects a landing at the mouth of a stream, and not having a rag of clothes on his back, covers himself up under a heap of dried leaves and goes to sleep. I will now translate from the Odyssey itself. So here Ulysses slept, worn out with labor and sorrow, but Minerva went off to the chief town of the Phaeacians, a people who used to live in Hyperia near the wicked Cyclopes. Now the Cyclopes were stronger than they and plundered them, so Nausithus settled them in Shiria, far from those who would loot them. He ran a wall round the city, built houses and temples, and allotted the lands among his people. But he was gathered to his fathers, and the good king Alcinous was now reigning. To his palace then Minerva hastened, that she might help Ulysses to get home. She went straight to the painted bedroom of Nausicaa, who was the daughter to king alcinous and lovely as a goddess near her there slept two maids in waiting both very pretty one on either side of the doorway which was closed with a beautifully made door she took the form of the famous captain dumas's daughter who was a bosom friend of nausicaa and just her own age then coming into the room like a breath of wind she stood near the head of the bed and said nausicaa what could your mother have been about to have such a lazy daughter here are your clothes all lying in disorder 
yet you are going to be married almost directly and should not only be well dressed yourself but should see that those about you look clean and tidy also this is the way to make people speak well of you it will please your father and mother so suppose we make to-morrow a washing day and begin the first thing in the morning i will come and help you for all the best young men among your own people are courting you and you are not going to remain a maid much longer ask your father then to have a horse and cart ready for us at daybreak to take the linen and baskets and you can ride too which will be much pleasanter for you than walking for the washing ground is a long way out of town when she had thus spoken minerva went back to olympus by and by morning came and as soon as nausicaa awoke she began to think about her dream she went to the other end of the house to tell her father and mother about it and found them sitting in their own room her mother was sitting by the fireside spinning with her maids in waiting all around her and she just happened to catch her father just as he was going out to attend a meeting of the town council which the facian alderman had convened so she stopped him and said papa dear could you manage to let me have a good big wagon i want to take all our dirty clothes to the river and wash them you are the chief man here so you ought to have a clean shirt on when you attend meetings of the council moreover you have five sons at home two of them married and the other three are good-looking young bachelors you know they always like to have clean linen when they go out to a dance and i have been thinking about all this you will observe that though nausicaa dreams that she is going to be married shortly and that all the best young men of Syria are in love with her she does not dream that she has fallen in love with any of them in particular and that thus every preparation is made for her getting married except the selection of the bridegroom you will also note that nausicaa has to keep her father up to putting a clean shirt on when he ought to have one whereas her young brothers appear to keep herself up to having a clean shirt ready for them when they want one these little touches are so lifelike and so feminine that they suggest drawing from life by a female member of alcinous's own family who knew his character from behind the scenes i would also say before proceeding further that in some parts of france and germany it is still the custom to have but one or at most two great washing days in the year each household is provided with an enormous quantity of linen which when dirty is just soaked and rinsed and then put aside till the great washing day of the year this is why nausicaa wants a wagon and has to go so far afield if it was only a few collars and a pocket handkerchief or two she could no doubt have found water enough near at hand the big spring or autumn wash however is evidently intended returning now to the odyssey when he had heard what nausicaa wanted alcinous said you shall have the mules my love and whatever else you have a mind for so be off with you then he told the servants and they got the wagon out and harnessed the mules while the princess brought the clothes down from the linen room and placed them on the wagon her mother got ready a nice bag of provisions with all sorts of good things and a goat skin full of wine the princess now got into the wagon and her mother gave her a golden cruise of oil that she and her maids might anoint themselves then nausicaa took the whip and reins and gave the mules a touch which sent them off at a good pace they pulled without nagging and carried not only nausicaa and her wash of clothes but the women also who were with her when they got to the river they went to the washing pools through which even in summer there ran enough pure water to wash any quantity of linen no matter how dirty here they unharnessed the mules and turned them out to feed in the sweet juicy grass that grew by the riverside they got the clothes out of the wagon brought them to the water and vied with one another in treading upon them and banging them about to get the dirt out of them when they had got them quite clean they laid them out by the seaside where the waves had raised a high beach of shingle and set about washing and anointing themselves with olive oil then they got their dinner by the side of the river and waited for the sun to finish drying the clothes by and by after dinner they took off their head-dresses and began to play ball and nausicaa sang to them i think you will agree with me that there is no haziness no milking of ewes that have had a lamb with them all night here the writer is at home and on her own ground when they had done folding the clothes and were putting the mules to the wagon before starting home minerva thought it was time ulysses should wake up and see the handsome girl who was to take him to the city of the phaeacians so the princess threw a ball at one of the maids which missed the maid and fell into the water on this they all shouted and the noise they made woke up ulysses who sat up on his bed of leaves and wondered where in the world he could have got to then he crept from under the bush beneath which he had slept broke off a thick bough so as to cover his nakedness and advanced toward nausicaa and her maids these last all ran away but nausicaa stood her ground for minerva had put courage into her heart 
so she kept quite still and ulysses could not make up his mind whether it would be better to go up to her throw himself at her feet and embrace her knees as a suppliant in which case of course he would have to drop the bow or whether it would be better for him to make an apology to her at a reasonable distance and ask her to be good enough to give him some clothes and show him the way to town on the whole he thought it would be better to keep at arm's length in case the princess should take offence at his coming too near her let me say in passing that this is one of many passages which have led me to conclude that the odyssey is written by a woman a girl such as nausicaa describes herself young unmarried and unattached and hence after all knowing little of what men feel on these matters having by a cruel freak of inspiration got her hero into such an awkward predicament might conceivably imagine that he would argue as she represents him but no man except such a woman's tailor as could never have written such a masterpiece as the odyssey would ever get his hero into such an undignified scrape at all much less represent him as arguing as ulysses does i suppose minerva was so busy making nausicaa brave that she had no time to put a little sense into ulysses head and remind him that he was nothing if not full of sagacity and resource to return ulysses now begins with the most judicious apology that his unaided imagination can suggest i beg your ladyship's pardon he exclaims but are you goddess or are you a mortal woman if you are a goddess and live in heaven there can be no doubt but you are jove's daughter diana for your face and figure are exactly like hers and so on in a long speech which i need not quote further from stranger replied nausicaa as soon as the speech was ended you seem to be a very sensible and well-disposed person there's no counting for luck jove gives good or ill to every man just as he chooses so you must take your lot and make the best of it she then tells him she will give him clothes and everything else that a foreigner in distress can reasonably expect she calls back her maids scolds them for running away and tells them to take ulysses and wash him in the river after giving him something to eat and drink so the maids give him the little gold cruise of oil and tell him to go and wash himself and as they seem to have completely recovered from their alarm ulysses is compelled to say young ladies please stand a little to one side so that i may wash the brine from my shoulders and anoint myself with oil for it is long enough since my skin has had a drop of oil upon it i cannot wash as long as you keep standing there i have no clothes on and it makes me very uncomfortable so they stood aside and went and told nausicaa meanwhile i am translating closely minerva made him look taller and stronger than before she gave him some more hair on top of his head and made it flow down in curls most beautifully in fact she glorified him about the head and shoulders as a cunning workman who has studied under vulcan or minerva enriches a piece of plate by gilding it again i argue that i am reading a description of as it were a prehistoric mr knightley by a not less prehistoric jane austen with this difference that i believe nausicaa is quietly laughing at her hero and sees through him whereas jane austen takes mr knightley seriously hush my pretty maids exclaimed nausicaa as soon as she saw ulysses coming back with his hair curled hush for i want to say something i believe the gods in heaven have sent this man here there is something very remarkable about him when i first saw him i thought him quite plain and commonplace and now i consider him one of the handsomest men i ever saw in my life i should like my future husband who it is plain then is not yet decided upon to be just such another as he is if he would only stay here and not want to go away however give him something to eat and drink nausicaa now says that they must be starting homeward so she tells ulysses that she will drive on herself but that he is to follow after her with the maids she does not want to be seen coming into the town with him and then follows another passage which clearly shows that for all the talk she has made about getting married she has no present intention of changing her name i am afraid she says of the gossip and scandal which may be set on foot about me behind my back for there are some very ill-natured people in the town and some low fellow if he met us might say huh, who is this fine-looking stranger who is going about with nausicaa where did she pick him up i suppose she is going to marry him or perhaps he is some shipwrecked sailor from foreign parts or has some god come down from heaven in answer to her prayers and she is going to live with him it would be a good thing if she would take herself off and find a husband somewhere else for she will not look at one of the many excellent young phaeacians who are in love with her and i would not complain for i would think myself ill of any girl whom i saw going about with men unknown to her father and mother and without having been married to him in the face of all the world 
this passage could never have been written by the local bard who was in great measure dependent on nausicaa's family he would never speak thus of his patron's daughter either the passage is nausicaa's apology for herself written by herself or it is pure invention and this last considering the close adherence to the actual topography of trapani on the sicilian coast and a great deal else that i cannot lay before you here appears to me improbable nausicaa then gives ulysses directions by which he can find her father's house when you have got past the courtyard she says go straight through the main hall till you come to my mother's room you will find her sitting by the fire and spinning her purple wool by firelight she will make a lovely picture as she leans back against a column with her maids ranged beside her facing her stands my father's seat in which he sits and topes like an immortal god never mind him but go up to my mother and lay your hands upon her knees if you would be forwarded on your homeward voyage from which i conclude that arete ruled asinous and nausicaa ruled arete ulysses follows his instructions aided by minerva who makes him invisible as he passes through the town and through the crowds of phaeacian guests who are feasting in the king's palace when he has reached the queen the cloak of thick darkness falls off and he is revealed to all present kneeling at the feet of queen arete to whom he makes his appeal it has already been made apparent in a passage extolling her virtue at some length but which i have not been able to quote that queen arete is in the eyes of the writer a much more important person than her husband alcinous every one of course is very much surprised at seeing ulysses but after a little discussion from which it appears that the writer considers alcinous to be a person who requires a good deal of keeping straight in other matters besides clean linen it is settled that ulysses shall be fated on the following day and then escorted home ulysses now has supper and remains with alcinous and arete after the other guests are gone away for the night so the three sit by the fire while the servants take away the things and arete is the first to speak she has been uneasy for some time about ulysses clothes which she recognized as her own make and at last she says stranger there's a question or two that i should like to put to you myself who in the world are you and who gave you these clothes did you not say you had come here from beyond the seas ulysses explains matters but still withholds his name nevertheless alcinous who seems to have shared in the general opinion that it was high time his daughter got married and that provided she married somebody it did not much matter who the bridegroom might be exclaimed by father jove minerva and apollo now that i see what kind of a person you are and how exactly our opinions coincide upon every subject i should so like it if you would stay with us always marry nausicaa and become my son-in-law ulysses turns the conversation immediately and meanwhile queen arete told her maids to put a bed in the corridor and make it with red blankets and it was to have at least one counterpane they were also to put a woolen nightgown for ulysses the maids took a torch and made the bed as fast as they could when they had done so they came up to ulysses and said this way sir if you please your room is quite ready and ulysses was very glad to hear them say so on the following day alcinous holds a meeting of the phaeacians and proposes that ulysses should have a ship got ready to take them home at once this being settled he invites all the leading people and the fifty-two sailors who are to man ulysses ship to come up to his own house and he will give them a banquet for which he kills a dozen sheep eight pigs and two oxen immediately after gorging themselves at the banquet they have a series of athletic competitions and from this i gather the poem to have been written by one who saw nothing very odd in letting people compete in sports requiring very violent exercise immediately after a heavy meal such a course may have been usual in those days but certainly is not generally adopted in our own at the games alcinous makes himself as ridiculous as he always does and ulysses behaves much as the hero of the preceding afternoon might be expected to do but on his praising the phaeacians towards the close of the proceedings alcinous says he is a person of such singular judgment that they really must all of them make him a very handsome present twelve of you he exclaims are magistrates and there is myself that makes thirteen suppose we give him each of us a clean cloak a tunic and a talent of gold which in those days was worth about two hundred and fifty pounds this is unanimously agreed to and in the evening toward sundown the presents begin to make their appearance at the palace of king alcinous and the king's sons perhaps prudently as you will presently see place them in the keeping of their mother arete when the presents have all arrived alcinous says to arete wife go and fetch the best chest we have and put a clean cloak and a tunic in it in the meantime ulysses will take a bath arete orders the maids to heat a bath brings the chest packs up the raiment and gold which the phaeacians have brought and adds a cloak and good tunic as king alcinous's own contribution 
Yes, but where, and that is what we are never told, is the 250 pounds, which he ought to have contributed as well as the cloak and tunic? And where is the beautiful gold goblet, which he also promised? See to the fastening yourself, says Queen Arete to Ulysses, for fear anyone should rob you while you are asleep in the ship. Ulysses, we may be sure, was well aware that Alcinous's 250 pounds was not in the box, nor yet the goblet, but he took the hint at once and made the chest fast without the delay of a moment, with a bond which the cunning goddess Circe had given him. He does not seem to have thought his chance of getting the 250 pounds and the goblet, and of having to ha unpack the box again, was so great as his chance of having his box tampered with before he got away, if he neglected to double lock it at once and put the key in his pocket. He has always a keen eye to money. Indeed, the whole odyssey turns on what is substantially a money quarrel. So, this time, without the prompting of Minerva, he does one of the very few sensible things which he does, on his own account, throughout the whole poem. Supper is now served, and when it is over, Ulysses, pressed by Alcinous, announces his name and begins the story of his adventures. It is with profound regret that I find myself unable to quote any of the fascinating episodes with which his narrative abounds, but I have said I was going to lecture on the humor of Homer, that is to say, of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and must not be diverted from my subject. I cannot, however, resist the account which Ulysses gives of his meeting with his mother in Hades, the place of departed spirits, which he has visited by the advice of Circe. His mother comes up to him and asks him how he managed to get into Hades, being still alive. I will translate freely, but quite closely, from Ulysses' own words as spoken to the Phaeacians. And I said, Mother, I had to come here to consult the ghost of the old Theban prophet Tiresias. I have never yet been near Greece, nor set foot on my native land and have had nothing but one long run of ill luck from the day i set out with agamemnon to fight at troy but tell me how you came here yourself did you have a long and painful illness or did heaven vouchsafe you a gentle easy passage to eternity tell me also about my father and about my son is my property still in their hands or has someone else got hold of it who thinks that i shall not return to claim it how again is my wife conducting herself does she live with her son and make a home for him or has she married again my mother answered your wife is still mistress of your house but she is in very great straits and spends the greater part of her time in tears no one has actually taken possession of your property and telemachus still holds it he has to accept a great many invitations and gives much the sort of entertainments in return that may be expected from one in his position your father remains in the old place and never goes near the town he is very badly off and has neither bed nor bedding nor a stick of furniture of any kind in winter he sleeps on the floor in front of the fire with the men and his clothes are in a shocking state but in summer when the warm weather comes on again he sleeps out in the vineyard on a bed of vine leaves he takes on very much about your not having returned and suffers more and more as he grows older as for me i died of nothing whatever in the world but grief about yourself there was not a thing the matter with me but my prolonged anxiety on your account was too much for me and in the end it just wore me out in the course of time ulysses comes to a pause in his narrative and queen arete makes a little speech what do you think she said to the phaeacians of such a guest as this did you ever see any one at once so good-looking and so clever it is true indeed that his visit is paid more particularly to myself but you all participate in the honour conferred upon us by a visitor of such distinction do not be in a hurry to send him off, nor stingy in the presents you make to one in so great need, for you are all of you very well off. You will note that the queen does not say, we are all of us very well off. Then the hero Eucenius, who was the oldest man among them, added a few words of his own. My friends, he said, there cannot be two opinions about the graciousness and sagacity of the remarks that have just fallen from her majesty nevertheless it is with his majesty king alcinous that the decision must ultimately rest the thing shall be done exclaimed alcinous if i am still king over the phaeacians as for our guests i know he is anxious to resume his journey still we must persuade him if we can to stay with us until to-morrow by which time i shall be able to get together the balance of the sum which i mean to press on his acceptance so here we have it straight up that the monarch knew he had only contributed the coat and the waistcoat and did not know exactly how he was to lay his hands on the two hundred and fifty pounds 
what with piracy for we have been told of at least one case in which alcinous had looted a town and stolen his housemaid eurymedusa what with insufficient changes of linen toping like an immortal god swaggering at large and open-handed hospitality it is plain and by no means surprising that alcinous is out at elbows nor can there be a better example of the difference between the broad comedy of the iliad and the delicate but very biting satire of the odyssey than the way in which the fact that alcinous is in money difficulties is allowed to steal upon us as contrasted with the obvious humour of the quarrels between jove and juno at any rate we can hardly wonder at ulysses having felt that to a monarch of such mixed character the unfastened box might prove a temptation greater than he could resist to return however to the story if it please your majesty said he in answer to king alcinous i should be delighted to stay here for another twelve months and to accept from your hands the vast treasures and the escort which you are so generous as to promise me i should obviously gain by doing so for i should return fuller handed to my people and should thus be both more respected and more loved by my acquaintance still to receive such presents the king perceived his embarrassment and at once relieved him no one he exclaimed who looks at you can for one moment take you for a charlatan or a swindler i know there are many of these unscrupulous persons going about just now with such plausible stories that it is very hard to disbelieve them there is however a finish about your style which convinces me of your good disposition and so on for more than i have space to quote after which ulysses again proceeds with his adventures when he had finished them alcinous insists that the leading phaeacians should each one of them give ulysses a still further present of a large kitchen copper and a three-legged stand to set it on but he continues as the expense of all these presents is really too heavy for the purse of any private individual i shall charge the whole of them on the rates literally we will repay ourselves by getting it in from among the people for this is too heavy a present for the purse of a private individual and what this can mean except charging it on the rates i do not know of course every one else sends up his tripod and his cauldron but we hear nothing about any either tripod or cauldron from king alcinous he is very fussy next morning stowing them under the ship's benches but his time and trouble seem to be the extent of his contribution it is hardly necessary to say that ulysses had to go away without the two hundred and fifty pounds and that we never hear of the promised goblet being presented still he had done pretty well i have not quoted anything like all the absurd remarks made by alcinous nor shown you nearly as completely as i could do if i had more time how obviously the writer is quietly laughing at him in her sleeve she understands his little ways as she understands those of menelaus who tells telemachus and pisistratus that if they like he will take them on a personally conducted tour round the peloponnese and that they can make a good thing out of it for every one will give them something fancy helen or queen arete making such a proposal as this they are never laughed at but then they are women whereas alcinous and menelaus are men and this makes all the difference and now in conclusion let me point out the irony of literature in connection with this astonishing work here is a poem in which the hero and heroine have already been married many years before it begins it is marked by a total absence of love business in such sense as we understand it its interest centers mainly on the fact of a bald elderly gentleman whose little remaining hair is red being eaten out of house and home during his absence by a number of young men who are courting the supposed widow a widow who if she be fair and fat can hardly also be less than forty can any subject seem more hopeless moreover this subject so initially faulty is treated with a carelessness in respect of consistency ignorance of commonly known details and disregard of ordinary canons that can hardly be surpassed and yet i cannot think that in the whole range of literature there is a work which can be decisively placed above it i am afraid you will hardly accept this i do not see how you can be expected to do so for in the first place there is no even tolerable prose translation and in the second the odyssey like the iliad has been a school-book for over two thousand five hundred years and what more cruel revenge than this can dullness take on genius the iliad and the odyssey have been used as text-books for education during at least two thousand five hundred years and yet it is only during the last forty or fifty that people have begun to see that they are by different authors there was indeed so i learned from colonel muir's valuable work a band of scholars some few hundreds of years before the birth of christ who refused to see the iliad and odyssey as by the same author 
but they were snubbed and snuffed out, and for more than 2,000 years were considered to have been finally refuted. Can there be any more scathing satire upon the value of literary criticism? It would seem as though Minerva had shed the same thick darkness over both the poems as she shed over Ulysses, so that they might go in and out among the dons of Oxford and Cambridge from generation to generation, and none should see them. If I am right, as I believe I am, in holding the Odyssey to have been written by a young woman, was ever Sleeping Beauty more effectually concealed behind a more impenetrable hedge of dullness? And she will have to sleep a good many years yet before anyone wakes her effectually. But what else can one expect from people, not one of whom has been at the very slight exertion of noting a few of the writer's main topographical indications, and then looking for them in an admiralty chart or two? Can any step be more obvious and easy? Indeed, it is so simple that I am ashamed of myself for not having taken it forty years ago. Students of the Odyssey, for the most part, are so engrossed with the force of the zugma and of the enclitic particle y that they take so much more interest in the digamma and in the aeolic dialect than they do in the living spirit that sits behind all these things and alone gives them their importance. That, naturally enough, not caring about the personality, it remains and always must remain invisible to them. If I have helped to make it any less invisible to yourselves, let me ask you to pardon the somewhat querulous tone of my concluding remarks. End of The Humor of Homer by Samuel Butler Reading by Catherine Ishi, the last Yahi Indian, by Thomas Talbot Waterman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I often feel that it is hard to tell the story of Ishi in such a way as to convince people of its reality. He has been described as the last survivor of a tribe that remained in the Stone Age until the 20th century. I should like to tell enough of the history of his little group to explain how it was possible for them to remain primitive. In spite of the fact that in 1910 he was still living in the Age of Stone, he was himself a rare character with a mind of unusual caliber. First of all, I should like to tell you something about his tribe. It is the old story of an Indian people being crowded by the whites. In this case, however, the Indians most concerned were already a small group surrounded by enemies when the whites came into the country. They call themselves simply Yahi, people, as Indian tribes mostly do, and this has come to be used as their tribal name. The Yahi were not numerically as strong as the surrounding peoples, and had for some generations been driven to follow a prowling life. They frequented a very wild area along Mill and Deer Creeks, east of the Sacramento River in northern California. Their fastnesses lay in the hills just to the east of the great level stretches of the Sacramento Valley. The country here is an old lava formation, and is accordingly a region of cliffs and wild gorges, with numerous dusky glens and duskier caves, the canyon floors and slopes of the hills overgrown with a perfect tangle of shrub. In this wild region, the Yahi roved about safe from intrusion and lived securely in their own empire, except for the fact that at infrequent intervals snow and heavy weather brought them to the verge of starvation. Under such circumstances, they were forced to pay flying visits to the sunny lands of their richer neighbors in the valley. The memory of old scores still unsettled on each side always made these trips an occasion for violence. Long before the coming of the whites, the Yahi had learned one principle very thoroughly. It was, in plain language, this. When outnumbered, scoot for Deer Creek. Consequently, when the white invasion began, the Yahi escaped the fate of the other Indian tribes. The Valley Indians became hangers-on of civilization, and lost, in some cases, even the memory of their old life. The Yahi followed their time-honored rule and took refuge in the foothill fastnesses. As the Indian tribes of the valley were replaced by white settlers, the Yahi transferred to the white 
valley people the bitter hostility they had already learned to feel, so they remained a wild tribe. The history of this wild tribe has in it a good deal of the pathetic. The whites were not satisfied to let them alone. It grew to be the custom to blame every miscarriage of plans to the presence of these wild Indians. If sheep strayed or were eaten by pumas, the settlers preferred in most cases to believe that the Indians had made way with them. If provisions were taken from outlying camps, Indians could always be conjured up to take the blame. Even if freshets drowned the onion patches or if potato bugs got away with the spuds, it was felt in some dim way that Indians were probably at the bottom of it. In more tragic cases, where murders were committed in out-of-the-way places, nothing could convince the settlers of the Indians' innocence. By 1860, there came to be a sort of war between the whites and the Indians, in which most of the aggression was on the part of the whites. The rest is a story I almost hate to tell. The man into whose hands fell the adjusting of relations between the whites and the Yahi Indians showed at times a ferocity that is almost incredible. In a general way, and sentiment aside, the old Indian way of life had in every case to be done away with. When Columbus landed on San Salvador, there was only one Indian to each 24 square miles of North America, speaking in general averages. The outlook for humanity as a whole demanded that this Indian population be displaced and crowded together. It was inevitable that intensive farming should replace the haphazard husbandry and roving hunting habits of the Indians. The pity was that this displacing was never done systematically, nor was it ever done by the recognized agents of government. Recognized government took a hand in every case only after the displacing had already been made an accomplished fact by traders and trappers along the frontier. The frontiersman is not quite so romantic and Homeric a figure as the novelists would make us believe. The truth is that he was always irresponsible, usually indifferent, frequently ignorant, and in some cases thoroughly brutalized. I might cite three or four instances in connection with the Ahi. A party of whites in April 1871 pursued a band of Indians with dogs. They located them in a cave across a narrow gulch and shot a number of them, finally entering the cave itself. Here they found a lot of dried meat and some small children. The hero of the occasion, being a humane man, a person of fine sensibilities and delicacy of feeling, could not bear to kill these babies at any rate, not with a heavy fifty-six caliber Spencer rifle he was carrying. It tore them up too bad. So he shot them with his thirty-eight caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. The names of several men who were in this party are in my notes. The bodies later disappeared. Another informant, referring to an occasion some years later, told me of finding a cave with marks of occupation, ashes, and human teeth. From his description of the locality, I gathered that he was describing the same cave. Apparently the survivors had returned and cremated the dead according to their tribal custom. In the fall of 1865, a party of whites looking for scalps, the whites did the scalping then in California, not the Indians, spied a party of Yahi encamped. There were men, women, children, babies, and dogs, a whole tribe, or what was left of one. Just before daybreak, the whites separated into two parties and closed in on the Indians from two sides. The stage was set for one act in the drama of the Ahi tribe. When the firing began, the startled Indians, avoiding one party, ran into the other. An informant of mine who visited the scene of the skirmish some time later counted 43 skeletons. Only a few Indians escaped. On good authority, I can report the case of an old prospector, pioneer, miner, trapper of this region, who had on his bed, even in recent years, a blanket lined with Indian scalps. These he had taken years before. He had never been a government scout, soldier, or officer of the law. The Indians he had killed, he had killed purely on his own account. No reckoning was at any time demanded of him. It is important to note these facts, for they explain what would otherwise be almost incredible. 
By 1870, or soon after, the Yahi tribe had been reduced to a few individuals. They disappeared from sight, and for forty years we have practically no account of them. I say practically, for as a matter of fact they were seen on at least half a dozen occasions during this time. I might cite one or two. A good man, and true, who is now well known to me, was deer hunting as a lad about twenty-five years ago on the Big Antelope Creek. The following curious incident happened. In working about a buckeye thicket, he heard noises. He sent his dog in to rout out whatever was in there. The dog came out frightened, so he went in himself. The plain fact was that he had run on to a party of the wild Indians, though all he could see at first were objects moving through the brush trying to get away from him. They finally began to shoot at him with bows. Three arrows were fired at him. One went through his hat brim, grazing his face, and broke off on a boulder in front of him. He has the arrow yet and showed it to me. In trying to get away, they dropped, among other things, a complete arrow-making outfit. This outfit is now in our museum. On other occasions, they were more clearly seen, so that it is not true that they totally disappeared. It is a very curious fact that when individuals at rare intervals reported such incidents as the one I have mentioned, it created no interest, for they were simply put down as liars. So the presence of wild Indians persisted through a long period as a sort of local tradition or myth. The incidents where they were seen were not even reported in the papers. It seems almost impossible that in a thickly settled region like California this group could go on living their own primitive life, yet they did so. It is perfectly certain that they had nothing to do with the whites directly. They carried on an independent existence. They profited, however, by picking up certain property around abandoned camps, as they naturally would. Thus they got bits of metal, which they used for tools, and some cloth. They also preferred to make arrow points out of bottle glass rather than out of the native obsidian rock. They hunted with a bow and arrow for two reasons. In the first place, they did not understand firearms, and seemingly never had any in their possession. In the second place, the bow was silent. In the river they speared fish in the primitive way, smoking it over a fire and storing it away for winter. I have seen the framework of the brush hut they used for this purpose. In the summer they slipped out of their retreat and went to the eastward as far as Mount Lassen, and on its upper slopes they hunted in peace until the snow drove them down. We know this peak now as California's only active volcano, but in those days it was silent and still. Most of their time they spent in Deer Creek Canyon, within a few miles of the valley, in the midst of its thickest jungles of scrub oak and brush. Here they fished and hunted, gathered acorns and seeds, and managed an independent existence. That they were not discovered is due to their experience with the whites, and to the fact that there were only a few of them. This, in connection with the character of their country, enabled them to keep out of sight for more than a generation. Fifteen miles in an airline from their foothill stronghold, trains on the Southern Pacific Railroad passed daily back and forth. Yet in their rugged canyon, where the scrub oak and poison oak are so thick that the explorer can only make two miles a day through it, I speak from experience, they passed long years safe from detection. The story of how the small remnant of a tribe were finally discovered and became scattered I have told in another place. Popular Science Monthly for March 1915. I merely want to insist here that the last survivor who fell into my hands in 1910 was still a Stone Age Indian as unaccustomed to the ways of civilization as could well be imagined. I should like to tell something of my acquaintance with Ishii, especially those incidents which illustrate the character of the man and shed light on his peculiar viewpoint. I may begin by speaking of railroad trains. Our friendship started at Oroville, California, where loneliness and hunger had driven Ishii to come into a slaughterhouse near town. In bringing him down to the university, where his home was to be for the rest of his life, it was necessary to take the train. Behold Ishii and myself, an attendant Indian, and some hundreds of interested pale faces waiting on the platform for the train to come in. As number five appeared in the distance, and came whistling and smoking down the humming rails in a cloud of dust, Ishii wanted to get behind something. 
We were standing some distance from the track, as it was, for I felt that he might be afraid of the engine. My charge, however, wanted to hide behind something. He had often seen trains. Later he told us in his own language that he had in his wanderings seen trains go by in the distance, but he did not know they ran on tracks. When he saw them, he always lay down in the grass or behind a bush until they were out of sight. He visualized a train as some devil-driven, inhuman prodigy. Security lay not in keeping off of the right of way, but in keeping out of its sight. Here is another fact that illustrates his personal attitude. To a primitive man, what ought to prove most astonishing in a modern city? I would have said at once the height of the buildings. For Ishii, the overwhelming thing about San Francisco was the number of people. That he never got over. Until he came into civilization, the largest number of people he had ever seen together at any one time was five. At first, a crowd gathered around him alarmed him and made him uneasy. He never entirely got over his feeling of awe, even when he learned that everybody meant well. The big buildings he was interested in. He found them edifying, but he distinctly was not greatly impressed. The reason, as far as I could understand it, was this. He mentally compared a towering twelve-story building not with his hut in Deer Creek, which was only four feet high, but with the cliffs and crags of his native mountains. He had something in some way analogous stored up in his experience. And to see five thousand people at once was something undreamed of, and it upset him. Which is to be considered more interesting and surprising, per se? An ordinary trolley car or an automobile? For Ishii, the trolley car, every time. I stupidly expected him to grow excited over his first automobile, as I did over mine in the year 1898. For Ishii, of course, both were plain miracles. Both the auto and the streetcar were agitated and driven about by some supernatural power, one as much as the other. The streetcar, however, was the bigger of the two. It had a gong which rang loudly at times, and moreover was provided with an attachment which went shoo and blew the dust away when the air brakes were released. Ishii would watch trolley cars by the hour. Aeroplanes, by the way, he took quite philosophically. We took him down to Golden Gate Park to see Harry Fowler start to fly across the continent. When the plane was trundled out and the engines started, the Indian was surprised and amused at the uproar they created. The machine was finally launched, and after a long circuit, soared back above our heads. As it came overhead, we particularly called his notice to it. He was mildly interested. Saltu? he said interrogatively, nodding toward the plane a thousand feet skyward. White man up there? When we said yes, he laughed a bit, apparently at the white man's funny ways, and let it pass. Either he was ready to expect anything by that time, or else his amazement was too deep for any outward expression. Like most nature people, he was inclined to preserve his dignity in the face of the unfamiliar, or the overwhelming, giving very little sign. Under equivalent stimulation, of course, the pale face dances about and squeals. Ishii was, however, jarred completely out of his equanimity, amazed past speech or movement by a window shade. On the morning of his second day at the museum, I found him trying to raise the shade to let the sunlight in. It gave me a queer feeling to realize that never in his experience, either in the canyon home or in the Oroville jail, the first thirty hours of civilization he spent as an honored guest at Butte County's penal establishment, had he encountered the common roller shade. He tried to push it to one side, and it would not go. He tried pushing it up, and it would not stay. I showed him how to give it a little jerk and let it run up. The subsequent five minutes he utilized for reflection. When I came back at the end of that time, he was still trying to figure out where the shade had gone. Concerning foods, he had certain prejudices which he was never able to overcome. For example, he politely asked to be excused from gravies and sauces. He did not take at all kindly to the notion of boiling food. Fried, baked, roasted, broiled, or raw, he could understand. He did not like those processes which lead to semi-liquids. No milk, if you please, for Ishii, and no eggs unless they were hard-boiled. All such things, he said, lead to colds in the head. 
The real basis of his dislike seemed to be their aesthetic effect. I have often wondered since just how far our eating habits may be considered messy. He wanted his food dry and clean appearing. For drink he liked only transparent beverages that could not have anything concealed about them. Tea was his idea of the proper drink. I should like to say that in all his personal habits he was extraordinarily neat. At his first dinner he behaved as many another man has done under similar circumstances. He waited patiently until someone let him know by setting the example whether a given dish was to be consumed with the aid of a spoon, a knife, some kind of a fork, or with the plain fingers. Then he calmly did likewise. His actions were always in perfect good taste. Even during his first days in civilization, he could be taken comfortably into any company. He had a certain fastidiousness which extended to all his belongings. His effects were kept carefully in order. Not only his apparel, but his arrow-making appliances, his bow, and his other implements were always in perfect array. During the time he lived at my home, a certain member of my family constantly urged me to model my own behavior in such respects after the Indian's shining example. Ishi, moreover, was remarkably clever with his hands. In his own way he was a fine workman. He made bows of perfect finish. He could chip arrow points to perfection out of any of the materials which gave a conchoidal fracture. Obsidian, flint, agate, or bottle glass. Some of its handsomest specimens were made out of bromo seltzer bottles. No more beautiful arrow points exist than the ones he made. His finished arrow, point, shaft, and feathering is a model of exquisite workmanship. On the whole, he took very kindly to civilization. He seemed apprehensive at times that we would send him back ultimately to his wilderness. Once, when we were planning with much enthusiasm to take him on a camping trip, to revisit with him his foothill home, he filed a number of objections. One was that in the hills there were no chairs. A second was that there were no houses or beds. A third was that there was very little to eat. He had been cold and gone empty so often in the hills that he had few illusions left. In camp, however, he proved to be a fine companion. He could swim and wash dishes and skylark with anybody and outwalk everybody. He convinced me that there is such a thing as a gentlemanliness which lies outside of all training and is an expression purely of an inward spirit. It has nothing to do with artificially acquired tricks of behavior. Ishii was slow to acquire the tricks of social contact. He never learned to shake hands. But he had an innate regard for the other fellow's existence and an inborn considerateness that surpassed in fineness most of the civilized breeding with which I am familiar. His life came to a close as the result of an over-susceptibility to tuberculosis, to which he was some time or other exposed, and to which he never developed the slightest immunity. He contributed to science the best account he could give of the life of his people as it was before the whites came in. To know him was a rare personal privilege, not merely an ethnological privilege. I feel myself that in many ways he was perhaps the most remarkable personality of his century. End of Ishi, The Last Yahi Indian by Thomas Talbot Waterman Read by Winston Tharp A Lane in the Cotswolds by Sir Francis Darwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Lane in the Cotswolds. Early in May, I walked up from the valley to the extreme rim of the Cotswolds, just above our house. The lower country is all pasture, where we can wander at will, and delight in the many beautiful trees, the fresh green elms, the vernal yellow of the oak, which lingers in varying degrees behind some of its companions, but does not deserve Tolstoy's epithet, Mursad, and the grey anatomy of the timid ash, whose black buds are still getting up their courage. 
we do not owe the trees in the meadows to landowners with a taste for natural beauty but to the cattle that must have shade the buttercups are beginning their golden show and there is not much else to decorate the fields except daisies and the cheerful dandelions these last are still growing obliquely and not yet staring boldly up at the sky as in later life there is also an occasional patch of bugle sturdy little blue sentinels and a few purple orchids in the upper meadows where the wind is cold the daisies bend their stalk and lay their heads on the ground as they do at night and their little noses look red like poor marion's in shakespeare's winter song in the daisy it is the pink-tipped petals huddling together that make this chilly symbol a contrast to the happy star that sunshine shows near the top of the hill is a bare pasture covered with cowslips all pointing their pretty heads one way at first it seemed that they were simply yielding to the fresh wind but on picking them it was made clear that they bent their stalks wilfully not on compulsion on the whole it seemed that they were nodding towards the brighter light but i could not perceive that the quarter to which they turned had any advantage in luminosity close to the top of the hill is a little wood of nut trees and i looked down into it over the hedge with a shock of pleasure at the checker work of white and blue a conspiracy of wild garlic and bluebells in this land i have not seen the blue haze covering acres of cleared woodland such as we have in kent but this colour dance of the two plants is beautiful in its own way now we have reached the rim of the valley and look over into a new country with many red patches of ploughed land and sheep in the treeless fields instead of cattle here the skylark sings who is something of a stranger to us dwellers in the valley the same is true of the yellow hammer whose hot and dusty voice is less familiar there to one inland bred the seagulls feeding in the ploughed lands are a delight they seem an echo from the salt sea or a variation in a musical sense on the far away silver strip which is the severn shining down to the bristol channel we now come to a little wandering road called for reasons unknown to me seven leases lane and after a time end our wanderings at a point whence we can look down on misty gloucester and its cathedral and this is a historic spot if the rumour is to be trusted that from here king charles watched the siege the lane is pleasant with its plashed hedges beset with traveller's joy clematis and bryony clematis likes to climb up trees but it seems quite happy ramping over the hedges it is now in its freshest youth and the careless way in which the young stems toss themselves hither and thither gives an impression of endless living things dancing with complete abandon on the hedge as on an airy floor the traveller's joy climbs by seizing hold of the branches of plants more solid than itself it grips them with its leaf stalks which serve as tendrils and support the weakling stem aloft in the clear air but as yet they have hardly begun to fix themselves though some i saw which had caught each other giving themselves a gay aspect by seeming to dance hand in hand the white bryony is there also and its tendrils have fastened on to the hazel beech and dogwood which make up the mass of the hedge their tendrils are but delicate ropes and when they have seized a twig they would break away in the first fresh breeze but this is prevented by the fact that the tendrils contract into spiral springs and by the give and take of its elastic coils the cable becomes almost unbreakable and the ship rides out the stiffest gale two other types of climbing plants are common in our lane which have neither the grasping leaf stalks of clematis nor the delicate tendrils of white bryony black bryony is a twining plant and can travel spirally up the hazel stems just as a hop ascends its pole but here in our lane there is but little to climb up and its livid pink stems often twisted with one or more brother strands lie along the hedge or sway in the air like discontented snakes just now they hardly show any leaves but later in the spring they will have finely polished ones and later still bunches of red berries which do not seem to be popular with birds and hang on their branches till winter comes 
Another type of climber which shows itself early is the goose grass. This is a humble personage, probably looked down on by the superior climbers above described, as able neither to swarm spirally nor to ascend by the aid of tendrils or other gripping apparatus. The goose grass depends on the possession of delicate little hooks covering stem and leaves. These can be perceived by stroking the plant from the base upwards, but not in the other direction. The hooks being directed downwards do not hinder the upward push of the growing plant, but they prevent it from slipping downwards. If one disentangles a goose grass from its position, it will fall weakly over and lie along the ground. In its simple way, it gains the object aspired to by all climbers, namely, the possession of a satisfactory position in the world without going to the expense of building a stem stiff enough to stand alone. To children, goose grass is valuable as the ideal material for the making of sham bird's nests, since the hooked prickles hold the stems in position and make the art of nest building a singularly easy one. The great revolution that breaks out in the spring when the storehouses of the plant pour nutriment into the numberless awakening buds is a miracle annually repeated in the endless procession of life. We know something of the mechanism by which mobilization is effected. We know, for instance, that the starch grains guarded by the dormant plant during the idle days of winter are liquefied, or rather, that the starch is converted into sugar, and being soluble in water, can flow from the magazines of the plant to where growth implying the creation of millions of newly born cells, demands material. We are gradually learning to understand something of that seething cauldron of life which we can dimly watch in living things. The ferment diastase is one of the tools with which plants perform their miracles of chemical activity. This diastase and its brother ferments have qualities resembling those of living creatures. They may, like seeds, be dried and kept in a bottle until they are awakened by giving them water. Perhaps this is talking in a circle, and that ferments only resemble living things because organisms contain so many of these mysterious bodies. I like to fancy that there is something more than this, and that a ferment is an automaton which the plant compels to lay before it, a Frankenstein monster having semi-living qualities, being no more than a parody of life. But I am getting beyond the questions that are in tune with the spring day. End of Elaine in the Cotswolds by Sir Francis Darwin. Life and Adventures of Calamity Jane by Calamity Jane herself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My maiden name was Marthy Canary. I was born in Princeton, Missouri, May 1st, 1852. Father and mother were natives of Ohio. I had two brothers and three sisters, I being the oldest of the children. As a child, I always had a fondness for adventure and outdoor exercise, and a special fondness for horses, which I began to ride at an early age, and continued to do so until I became an expert rider being able to ride the most vicious and stubborn of horses. In fact, the greater portion of my life in early times was spent in this manner. In 1865, we emigrated from our homes in Missouri by the overland route to Virginia City, Montana, taking five months to make the journey. While on the way, the greater portion of my time was spent in hunting, along with the men and hunters of the party. In fact, I was at all times with the men, when there was excitement and adventures to be had. By the time we reached Virginia City, I was considered a remarkable good shot and a fearless rider for a girl of my age. I remember many occurrences on the journey from Missouri to Montana. Many times in crossing the mountains the conditions of the trail were so bad that we frequently had to lower the wagons over ledges by hand with ropes for they were so rough and rugged that horses were no use. We also had many exciting times fording streams, for many of the streams in our way were noted for quicksands and boggy places, where, unless we were very careful, we would have lost horses and all. 
then we had many dangers to encounter in the way of stream swelling on a kind of heavy rains on occasions of that kind the men would usually select the best places to cross the streams myself on more than one occasion had mounted my pony and swam across the stream several times merely to amuse myself and have had many narrow escapes from having both myself and pony washed away to certain death but as the pioneers of those days had plenty of courage we overcame all obstacles and reached virginia city in safety mother died at blackfoot montana 1866 where we buried her i left montana in spring of 1866 for utah arrived at salt lake city during the summer remained in utah until 1867 where my father died then went to fort bridger wyoming territory where we arrived may 1st 1868 then went to piedmont wyoming with up railway joined general custer as a scout at fort russell wyoming in 1870 and started for arizona for the indian campaign up to this time i had always worn the costume of my sex when i joined custer i donned the uniform of a soldier it was a bit awkward at first but i soon got to be perfectly at home in men's clothes was in arizona up to the winter of eighteen seventy one and during that time i had a great many adventures with the indians for as a scout i had great many dangerous missions to perform and while i was in many close places always succeeded in getting away safely for by this time i was considered the most reckless and daring rider and one of the best shots in the western country after that campaign i returned to fort sanders wyoming remained there until spring of eighteen seventy two when we were ordered out to the muscle shell or nursey percy indian outbreak in that war generals custer miles terry and crook were all engaged this campaign lasted until fall of eighteen seventy three it was during this campaign that i was christened calamity jane it was on goose creek wyoming where the town of sheridan is now located captain egan was in command of the post we were ordered out to quell an uprising of the indians and were out for several days had numerous skirmishes during which six of the soldiers were killed and several severely wounded when on returning to the post we were ambushed about a mile and a half from our destination when fired upon captain egan was shot i was riding in advance and on hearing the firing turned in my saddle and saw the captain reeling in his saddle as though about to fall i turned my horse and galloped back with all haste to his side and got there in time to catch him as he was falling i lifted him onto my horse in front of me and succeeded in getting him safely to the fort captain egan on recovering laughingly said i name you calamity jane the heroine of the plains i have borne that name up to the present time we were afterwards ordered to fort custer where custer city now stands where we arrived in the spring of eighteen seventy four remained around fort custer all summer and were ordered to fort russell in fall of eighteen seventy four where we remained until spring of eighteen seventy five was then ordered to the black hills to protect miners as that country was controlled by the Sioux Indians, and the government had to send the soldiers to protect the lives of the miners and settlers in that section. Remained there until fall of 1875, and wintered at Fort Laramie. In spring of 1876 we were ordered north with General Crook to join Generals Miles, Terry, and Custer at Bighorn River. During this march I swam the Platte River at Fort Fetterman, as I was the bearer of important dispatches. I had a ninety-mile ride to make. Being wet and cold, I contracted a severe illness, and was sent back in General Crook's ambulance to Fort Fetterman, where I lay in the hospital for fourteen days. When able to ride, I started for Fort Laramie, where I met William Hickok, better known as Wild Bill, and we started for Deadwood, where we arrived about June. During the month of June I acted as a Pony Express rider carrying the U.S. mail between Deadwood and Custer, a distance of fifty miles, over one of the roughest trails in the Black Hills country. As many of the riders before me had been held up and robbed of their packages, mail, and money that they carried. For that was the only means of getting mail and money between these points. It was considered the most dangerous route in the hills, but as my reputation as a rider and quick shot was well known, 
I was molested very little, for the toll-gatherers looked on me as being a good fellow, and they knew that I never missed my mark. I made the round trip every two days, which was considered pretty good riding in that country. Remained around Edward all that summer, visiting all the camps within an area of one hundred miles. My friend, Wild Bill, remained in Deadwood during the summer, with the exception of occasional visits to the camps. On the 2nd of August, while sitting at a gambling table in the Bell Union Saloon in Deadwood, he was shot in the back of the head by the notorious Jack McCall, a desperado. I was in Deadwood at the time, and on hearing of the killing, made my way at once to the scene of the shooting, and found that my friend had been killed by McCall. I at once started to look for the assassin, and found him at Shirty's butcher shop, and grabbed a meat cleaver and made him throw up his hands. Through the excitement on hearing of Bill's death, having left my weapons on the post of my bed. He was then taken to a log creek and locked up, well secured as everyone thought. But he got away and was afterwards caught at Fagan's ranch on Horse Creek on the old Cheyenne Road, and was then taken to Yankton, Dakota, where he was tried, sentenced, and hung. I remained around Deadwood, locating claims, going from camp to camp until the spring of 1877, where one morning I saddled my horse and rode towards Crook Creek. I had gone about twenty miles from Deadwood, at the mouth of Whitehood Creek, when I met the overland mail running from Cheyenne to Deadwood. The horses on a run about two hundred yards from the station. Upon looking closely I saw they were pursued by Indians. The horses ran to the barn as was their custom. As the horses stopped, I rode alongside of the coach and found the driver, John Slaughter, lying face downwards in the boot of the stage, he having been shot by the Indians. When the stage got to the station, the Indians hid in the bushes. I immediately removed all baggage from the coach except the mail. I then took the driver's seat and with all haste drove to Deadwood, carrying the six passengers and the dead driver. I left Deadwood in the fall of 1877 and went to Bear Butte Creek with the 7th Cavalry. During the fall and winter, we built Fort Meade in the town of Sturgis. In 1878, I left the command and went to Rapid City, and put in the year prospecting. In 1879, I went to Fort Pierre, and drove trains for Rapid City to Fort Pierre for Frank White, then drove teams for Fort Pierce to Sturgis for Fred Evans. This steaming was done with oxen, as they were better fitted for the work than horses, owing to the rough nature of the country. In 1881 I went to Wyoming, and returned in 1882 to Mile City, and took up a ranch on the Yellowstone, raising stock and cattle, also kept a wayside inn, where the wary traveler could be accommodated with food, drink, or trouble if he looked for it. Left the ranch in 1883, went to California, going through the states and territories, reached Ogden the latter part of 1883, and San Francisco in 1884. Left San Francisco in the summer of 1884 for Texas, stopping at Fort Yuma, Arizona, the hottest spot in the United States. Stopping at all points of interest until I reached El Paso in the fall. While in El Paso I met Mr. Clinton Burke, a native of Texas, who I married in August 1885. As I thought I had traveled through life long enough alone, and thought it was about time to take a partner for the rest of my days. We remained in Texas, leading a quiet home life until 1889. On October 28, 1887, I became the mother of a girl baby, the very image of its father, at least that is what he said, but who has the temper of its mother. When we left Texas, we went to Boulder, Colorado, where we kept a hotel until 1893, after which we traveled through Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, then back to Montana, then to Dakota, arriving in Deadwood, October ninth, 1895, after an absence of 17 years. My arrival in Deadwood after an absence of so many years created quite an excitement among my many friends of the past, to such an extent that a vast number of the citizens who had come to Deadwood during my absence, who had heard so much of Calamity Jane and her many adventures in former years, were anxious to see me. Among the many whom I met were several gentlemen from eastern cities, who advised me to allow myself to be placed before the public, in such a manner as to give the people of the eastern cities an opportunity 
of seeing the woman scout who was made so famous through her daring career in the west and black hill countries an agent of cole and middleton the celebrated museum man came to deadwood through the solicitation of the gentleman whom i met there and arrangements were made to place me before the public in this manner my first engagement began at the palace museum minneapolis january twentieth eighteen ninety six under cole and middleton's management hoping that this little history of my life may interest all readers i remain as in the older days yours mrs m burke better known as calamity jane end of life and adventures of calamity jane by calamity jane read by amy graymore www.amysmindtoyourmind.com The Needle, a chapter in The Development of Embroidery in America by Candace Wheeler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Schneider. Introductory, The Story of the Needle. The story of embroidery includes in its history all the work of the needle since Eve sewed fig leaves together in the Garden of Eden. We are the inheritors of the knowledge and skill of all the daughters of Eve in all that concerns its use since the beginning of time. When this small implement came open-eyed into the world, it brought with it possibilities of well-being and comfort for races and ages to come. It has been an instrument of beneficence as long ago as Dorcas sewed garments and gave them to the poor, and has been a creator of beauty since Sisera gave his mother a prey of needlework alike on both sides. This little descriptive phrase, alike on both sides, will at once suggest to all needlewomen a perfection of method almost without parallel. Of course it can be done, but the skill of it must have been rare, even in those far-off days of leisure, when duties and pleasures did not crowd out painstaking tasks, and every art was carried as far as human assiduity and invention could carry it. A history of the needlework of the world would be a history of the domestic accomplishment of the world that inner story of the existence of man which bears the relation of him of sunlight to the plant we can deduce from these needle records much of the physical circumstances of woman's long pilgrimage down the ages of her mental processes of her growth in thought we can judge from the character of her art whether she was at peace with herself and the world and from its status we become aware of its relative importance to the conditions of her life there are a few written records of its practice and growth for an art which does not affect the commercial gain of a land or country is not apt to have a written or statistical history but fortunately in this case the curious and valuable specimens which are left to us tell their own story they reveal the cultivation and amelioration of domestic life. Their contribution to the refinements are their very existence. A history of any domestic practice which has grown into a habit marks the degree of general civilization, but the practice of needlework does more. To a careful student, each small difference in the art tells its own story in its own language. The hammered gold of Eastern embroidery tells not only of the riches of available material, but of the habit of personal preparation instead of the mechanical. The little Bible description of captured needlework alike on both sides speaks unmistakably of the method of their stitchery, a cross stitch of colored threads, which is even now the only method to stitch alike on both sides it is an endless and fascinating story of the leisure of women in all ages and circumstances written in her own handwriting of painstaking needlework and an estimate of an art to which gold silver and precious stones the treasures of the world were devoted more than this its intimate association with the growth and well-being of family life 
makes visible the point where savagery is left behind and the decrees of civilization begin i knew a dear bible-nourished lonely little maid who had constructed for herself a drama of eve in eden playing it for the solitary audience of self in a corner of the garden she had brought all manner of fruits and had tied them to the fence palings under the apple boughs this little eve gathered grape leaves and sewed them carefully on to an apron the needle holes pierced with a thorn and held together by fibres dripped from long stemmed plantain leaves here she and her audience of self hid under the apple boughs and waited for the call of the lord the long ministry of the needle to the wants of mankind proves it to have been among the first of man's inventions when eve sewed fig leaves she probably improvised some implement for the process and every daughter of eve from eden to the present time has been indebted to that little implement for expression of herself in love and duty and art for this we must thank the man who the bible relates was the father of all such as worked in metals and made needles and gave them to his household he is the first handyman mentioned in history blessed be his memory if the day should ever come not let us hope in our time or that of our children when the manufacturer shall find it no longer pays to make needles what value will attach to individual specimens if they were only to be found in occasional bric-a-brac shops or in the collections of some far-seeing hoarder of rarities it would be difficult to overrate the interest which might attach to them how from the prodigal disregard of ages and the mysteries of the past would emerge one after another recovered specimens to be examined and judged and classified and arranged perhaps collections of them will be found in future museums under different headings such as needles of consolation under which might come those which mary stuart and her maids wrought their dismal hours into pathetic bits of embroidery during the long days of captivity or the daughter of the sorrowful marie antoinette mended the dilapidations of the pitiful and ragged dauphin or needles of devotion wielded by canonized and uncanonized saints in and out of nunneries or needles of history like those with which matilda stitched the prowess of william the conqueror into breadths of woven flax possibly there may arise needle experts who upon microscopic examination and scientific test will refer all specimens to possible date and peculiar function and by so doing let in floods of light upon ancient customs and habits it is idle to speculate upon a condition which does not yet exist for happily needles for actual hand sewing are yet in sufficient demand to allow us to indulge in their purchase quite ungrudgingly i was once shown a needle it was in constantinople which the dark-skinned owner declared had been treasured for three hundred years in his family and he affirmed it so positively and circumstantially that i accepted the statement as truth in fact what did it matter it was an interesting lie or an interesting truth whichever one might consider it and the needle looked quite capable of sustaining another century or so of family use its eye was a polished triangular hole made to carry strips of beaten metal exactly such as we read of in the bible as beaten and cut into strips for embroidery upon linen such embroidery in fact as has often been burned in order to sift the pure gold from its ashes not only the history but the poetry and song of all periods are starred with real and ideal embroideries noble and beautiful ladies whose chief occupation seemed to have been the medicining of wounds received in their honor or defense or the broidering of scarves and sleeves with which to bind the helmets of their knights as they went forth to tourney or to battle in these old chronicles the knights fought or made music with harp or voice and the women ministered or made embroidery and so pictured lives which were lived in the days of knights and ladies drifted on 
the sword and the needle express the duties the spirit and the essence of their several lives the men were militant the women domestic and wherever in castle or house or nunnery the lives of women were made safe by the use of the sword the needle was devoting itself to comforts of clothing for the poor and the dependent or luxuries of adornment for the rich and powerful so the needle lived on through all the civilizations of the old world in the various forms which they developed until it was finally inherited by pilgrims to a new world and was brought with them to the wilderness of america end of the needle observation one of the point of a sharp small needle from micrographia or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses by robert hook published in sixteen sixty five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org as in geometry the most natural way of beginning is from a mathematical point so is the same method in observations and natural history the most genuine simple and instructive we must first endeavor to make letters and draw single strokes true before we venture to write whole sentences or to draw large pictures and in physical enquiries we must endeavor to follow nature in the more plain and easy way she treads in the most simple and uncompounded bodies to trace her steps and be acquainted with her manner of walking there before we venture ourselves into the multitude of meanders she has in bodies of a more complicated nature lest being unable to distinguish and judge of our way we quickly lose both nature our guide and ourselves too and are left to wander in the labyrinth of groundless opinions wanting both judgment that light and experience that clue which should direct our proceedings we will begin these our inquiries therefore with the observations of bodies of the most simple nature first and so gradually proceed to those of a more compounded one in prosecution of which method we shall begin with a physical point of which kind the point of a needle is commonly reckoned for one and is indeed for the most part made so sharp that the naked eye cannot distinguish any parts of it it very easily pierces and makes its way through all kinds of bodies softer than itself but if viewed with a very good microscope we may find that the top of a needle though as to the sense very sharp appears a broad blunt and very irregular end not resembling a cone as is imagined but only a piece of a tapering body with a great part of the top removed or deficient the points of pins are yet more blunt and the points of the most curious mathematical instruments do very seldom arrive at so great a sharpness how much therefore can be built upon demonstrations made only by the productions of the ruler and compasses he will be better able to consider that shall view those points and lines with a microscope now though this point be commonly accounted the sharpest whence when we would express the sharpness of a point the most superlatively we say as sharp as a needle yet the microscope can afford us hundreds of instances of points many thousand times sharper such as those of the hairs and bristles and claws of multitudes of insects the thorns or crooks or hairs of leaves and other small vegetables nay the ends of the styri or small parallelipeds of amianthus and alumen plumosum of many of which though the points are so sharp as not to be visible though viewed with a microscope which magnifies the object in bulk above a million of times yet i doubt not 
but were we able practically to make microscopes according to the theory of them we might find hills and dales and pores and a sufficient breadth or expansion to give all those parts elbow room even in the blunt top of the very point of any of these so very sharp bodies for certainly the quantity or extension of any body may be divisible in infinitum though perhaps not the matter but to proceed the image we have here exhibited in the first figure was the top of a small and very sharp needle whose point nevertheless appeared through the microscope above a quarter of an inch broad not round nor flat but irregular and uneven so that it seemed to have been big enough to have afforded a hundred armed mites room enough to be ranged by each other without endangering the breaking one another's necks by being thrust off on either side the surface of which though appearing to the naked eye very smooth could not nevertheless hide a multitude of holes and scratches and ruggednesses from being discovered by the microscope to invest it several of which inequalities as a b and c seemed holes made by some small specks of rust and d some adventitious body that stuck very close to it were causal all the rest that roughened the surface were only so many marks of the rudeness and bungling of art so unaccurate is it in all its productions even in those which seem most neat that if examined with an organ more acute than that by which they were made the more we see of their shape the less appearance will there be of their beauty whereas in the works of nature the deepest discoveries show us the greatest excellencies an evident argument that he that was the author of all these things was no other than omnipotent being able to include as great a variety of parts and contrivances in the yet smallest discernible point as in those vaster bodies which comparatively are called also points such as the earth sun or planets nor need it seem strange that the earth itself may be by analogy called a physical point for as its body though now so near us as to fill our eyes and fancies with a sense of the vastness of it may by a little distance and some convenient diminishing glasses be made vanish into a scarce visible speck or point as i have often tried on the moon and when not too bright on the sun itself so could a mechanical contrivance successfully answer our theory we might see the least spot as big as the earth itself and discover as descartes also conjectures as great a variety of bodies in the moon or planets as in the earth End of observation one of the point of a sharp small needle from micrographia or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses by robert hook published in sixteen sixty five read by sue anderson walks among the new york poor the rag and bone pickers by Charles Loring Brace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This class, who number by the thousands, are nearly all Germans. Their headquarters in are a part of the city almost utterly unknown to the great world, near the East River in the eleventh and seventeenth wards. Here they congregate in immense numbers, living in large lodging houses, sometimes three hundred in a house, and paying each a small rent, 
which as I shall afterwards show, yields an enormous percentage on the capital invested. My first visit, in company with an officer of police, a friend who takes a deep interest in these movements for the poor, was to a colony in Sheriff Street. There were twelve small houses in a row, within a back court, entered by galleries running up on the outside, cheap brick and wood houses. All the piazzas, banisters, railings, every possible rope line were hung with rags drying. Captain S. tells me that at five o'clock in the morning, long before light, this whole district is as lively as at noon. Every one of these Germans, men, women, and children, are out with their pokers and hooks and little drays, rummaging every corner and pile and heap of refuse through all the streets. We went up on one of these stairs on the outside and entered a low, dirty room. A brisk, active-looking woman was cooking at the little stove. She did not speak English, and I asked her in German about her business and children, etc. She was a rag-picker. Her husband worked somewhere as a day-laborer, but he had broken his leg and was in the hospital. She had to support the old grandfather there and the children, though they helped her, got sie dank. Sometimes she thought she never should get through. She could make two shillings a day and with the children some days three shillings. The grandfather was at the window, reading his Bible. She had one room and a close bedroom behind, rent four dollars a month. In another house, the mother lay sick in the little back bedroom, and the father and children were in the front room, looking all very poor and wretched. The man answered cheerfully, but said he had not expected to find America so hard a place to live in. He and his children made three dollars a week by rag-picking, but they could hardly get along on that, and it was very hard work now in the snow. The room smelled horridly. The captain says probably from the bones which they pick to sell and keep under the bed often. In the summer, he says, these houses are intolerable from their stench, and during the cholera seasons, very naturally, the pestilence has raged in these localities as fatally as anywhere in the city. The rent higher again was four dollars a month for two small rooms. In the next house was a ragpicker's family. They seemed to do rather better, averaging, I think, fifty cents a day. An active boy outside who spoke very good English said he could make four to five dollars a week picking bones. The families in the basements generally averaged two to four shillings a day at this business and paid three dollars and fifty cents per month for rent. We summed up the rents in these twelve little houses, and allowing the attic to rent for as much as the basement, they would amount to three hundred sixty dollars the month or $4,320 per annum. The whole block could be built and in far better style for $8,000, making, and the estimate is probably low, a rent of more than 50% in the value of the houses, or, estimating the lot at $3,000, a rent of more than 33 and a third percent for the whole. From this place we went to another well-known colony in Third Street, a narrow court, large houses on either side, and within a long house facing the entrance with galleries and green lattice work on the outside. These are filled with the same class. In the long house there are 48 families. One of those in front has the same number, and the other on the side of the alley 16 families. Rags are flaunting on every side, and little girls are sorting or washing them. Heaps of bones, carefully sorted, lie in different parts of the court. A little girl is playing in front, face and form as mature as a woman's, though she says she is only thirteen. Her eye is very bright and sparkling, and she has a full ruddy cheek a German but speaking English with a pretty accent. 
She takes us up to her mother, who lives in the fourth story. Bones is hard business now, she says. There is so much snow, and people use poultry so much. She can make two shillings a day generally. Men come after them in carts and pay thirty cents a bushel for them. Rags she can some days do well in, has picked up a load a day often. She carries them to a shop nearby and gets two cents a pound for them. Her mother was washing. She had two small rooms, pays four dollars a month for rent. In another room, we found a little girl who is a street crossing sweeper. She says she goes to school every day except occasionally a rainy Saturday when she sweeps walks. She can earn at that sometimes thirty seven and a half cents a day. She is German again. I don't like it, she says, but then mother wants me, and sometimes I helps her in finding bones, but we don't get very much, only thirty cents a day. She is only thirteen years old, yet she has the passionate eye and matured form of a woman. There are quite a number of these little mudlarks here, as they call them, many of them bright-looking girls who help out a poor mother's hard livelihood with their little wages. One of the most striking things about all these children is their maturity. They never seem to be young, God help them ripened and diseased in vice before they are scarce old enough to know good from evil. Captain S. states that the most notorious prostitute of the ward is only fourteen, and he knows another twelve years old. These German rag-and-bone pickers, though they live in such filth, are frequently much better off than might be supposed. They all look to going west eventually, the German immigrant has a hankering for land. Nearly all of these lay up money. A colony last year of about 300 persons occupied a basement near East River, lived promiscuously together with their great bone heap in the midst of the floor, from which they could scrape or boil enough for an occasional meal. They seemed in the utmost destitution and were living in a squalor to which a poor American could seldom, by any circumstances, be driven. In the spring, when travel was cheap again, they all, with their little earnings which they had brought from Germany, started for the West to settle down on farms. A friend, familiar with their quarter, tells me he happened to be out very early one morning, when he saw one of these bone pickers with his cart and dog stop, root out something from a pile of refuse with a hook, and begin to gnaw it ravenously. He passed nearer and saw it was the outside, toughest rind of bacon. To all this petty and dirty work done by children and foreigners in our city, none has the right to utter a word of objection. It is immeasurably better than begging, the little muddy, dripping girl with her rough hair and torn dress, who is sweeping the walk and flying about with her broom in the storm like an ugly little sprite, may be just keeping herself and an old mother from the almshouse by these hard-earned pennies. Possibly she has not any very clear ideas of purity and virtue, but possibly society never gave her much chance to gain them. However that may be, she and the little match seller and the rag picker and the boner and the apple peddler are an honest work, and even if it be not very clean or very extensive, it is at least work and worth generally all it is paid. Discourage professed beggars or drive from your cold doorsteps the little shivering, pilfering outcasts as much as you choose, fine, ladies and gentlemen. But for the crosswalk sweeper, the match boy, the little girl with her basket of candies. Remember, they are in fair business and ought to be as well treated as any other hard-working people. In our last visit to these rag pickers in the 11th Ward, we again came upon important facts in relation to rents. To these I desire especially to call the attention of our businessmen. The stack of houses owned by a distinguished and wealthy gentleman of the city, 
was composed of one long house on a court in the rear and two on the sides of a narrow alley. The first house had twelve tenements, each tenement four stories of rooms. They were entered by stairs on the outside so that no space was lost. The front was perhaps a hundred fifty feet and the depth twenty-five feet, everything in the cheapest and coarsest style. The sum of the rents paid through the house was $192 the month, or 2204 per annum. A gentleman in the ward calculates it could easily have been built for $6,000. Supposing the value of the lot, 2000 we have a rent of 27%. One of the houses on the street, a narrow house with about 20 feet front and having 16 rooms rented for an average of $750 per annum, without doubt bringing a percentage to the agent or owner of at least 25%. In regard to some of the houses, there was a difficulty in estimating their cost, but in many cases I could not doubt they yielded from 30 to 50% to the landlords. All this, be it remembered, without giving any conveniences for health or comfort to the poor tenants. But take this instance in the five points. A notorious rum seller has rented eight houses in the district for $1,000 per annum, or at the rate of $125 for each. These he lets out to the prostitutes and Negroes. They are filthy, broken-down, miserable, beyond any houses in the city. In one house in Cow Bay, which I examined, he averaged a rent of $30 a month, and supposing him to do as well through the year, he gets a profit of nearly 300%, or supposing him to lose half, he still brings in about 150%. Another in the same alley yielded him about $25 a month, or $300 per annum. We call upon Christian merchants in New York to look at these things. If such immense profits can be made of these great colony houses for the poor, why cannot some benevolent man step forward and build healthful, convenient, cheerful homes and still derive a profit, which shall make his investment no poor one? Would it not be a humane and Christian mode of employing capital, a mode by which the bone picker, the scavenger, the poorest of New York could have a pleasant and, above all, a healthful home. And yet, the landlord or owner should still reap a rational profit from his money. The thing has not been tried yet by American enterprise. We look for the broad-minded merchant, him who believes all wealth is only a trust from his master. Who will attempt this for the poor? End of Walks Among the New York Poor, The Rag and Bone Pickers by Charles Loring Brace Quis Desiderio by Samuel Butler from The Humor of Homer and Other Essays This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Like Mr. Wilkie Collins, I, too, have been asked to lay some of my literary experiences before the readers of the Universal Review. It occurred to me that the review must be indeed universal before it could open its pages to one so obscure as myself, but, nothing daunted by the distinguished company among which I was for the first time asked to move, I resolved to do as I was told, and went to the British Museum to see what books I had written. Having refreshed my memory by a glance at the catalogue, I was about to try and diminish the large and ever-increasing circle of my non-readers when I became aware of a calamity that brought me to a standstill, and indeed bids fair, so far as I can see at present, to put an end to my literary existence altogether. I should explain that I cannot write unless I have a sloping desk and the reading-room of the British Museum, where alone I can compose freely, is unprovided with sloping desks. Like every other organism, if I cannot get exactly what I want, I make shift with the next thing to it. True, there are no desks in the reading-room, 
but as i once heard a visitor from the country say it contains a large number of very interesting works i know it was not right and i hope the museum authorities will not be severe upon me if any of them reads this confession but i wanted a desk and set myself to consider which of the many very interesting works which a grateful nation places at the disposal of its would-be authors was best suited for my purpose for mere reading i suppose one book is pretty much as good as another but the choice of a desk book is a more serious matter it must be neither too thick nor too thin it must be large enough to make a substantial support it must be strongly bound so as not to yield or give it must not be too troublesome to carry backwards and forwards and it must live on shelf c d or e so that there need be no stooping or reaching too high these are the conditions which a really good book must fulfill simple however as they are it is surprising how few volumes comply with them satisfactorily moreover being perhaps too sensitively conscientious i allowed another consideration to influence me and was sincerely anxious not to take a book which would be in constant use for reference by readers more especially as if i did this i might find myself disturbed by the officials for weeks i had made experiments upon sundry poetical and philosophical works whose names i have forgotten but could not succeed in finding my ideal desk until at length more by luck than cunning i happened to light upon frost's lives of eminent christians which i had no sooner tried than i discovered it to be the very perfection and ne plus ultra of everything that a book should be it lived in case number 2008, and I accordingly took at once to sitting in row B, where for the last dozen years or so I have sat ever since. The first thing I have done whenever I went to the museum has been to take down Frost's Lives of Eminent Christians and carry it to my seat. It is not the custom of modern writers to refer to the works to which they are most deeply indebted, and I have never, that I remember, mentioned it by name before but it is to this book alone that i have looked for support during many years of literary labor and it is round this to me invaluable volume that all my own have page by page grown up there is none in the museum to which i have been under anything like such constant obligation none which i can so ill spare and none which i would choose so readily if i were allowed to select one single volume and keep it for my own on finding myself asked for a contribution to the universal review i went as i have explained to the museum and presently repaired to bookcase number two thousand eight to get my favorite volume alas it was in the room no longer it was not in use for its place was filled up already besides no one ever used it but myself whether the ghost of the late mr frost had been so eminently unchristian as to interfere or whether the authorities have removed the book in ignorance of the steady demand which there has been for it on the part of at least one reader are points i cannot determine all i know is that the book is gone and i feel as wordsworth is generally supposed to have felt when he became aware that lucy was in her grave and exclaimed so emphatically that this would make a considerable difference to him or words to that effect now i think of it frost's lives of eminent christians was very like lucy the one resided at dovedale in derbyshire the other in great russell street bloomsbury i admit that i do not see the resemblance here at this moment but if i try to develop my perception i shall doubtless ere long find a marvellously striking one in other respects however than mere local habitat the likeness is obvious lucy was not particularly attractive either inside or out no more was frost's lives of eminent christians there were few to praise her and of those few still fewer could bring themselves to like her indeed wordsworth himself seems to have been the only person who thought much about her one way or the other in like manner i believe i was the only reader who thought much one way or the other about frost's lives of eminent christians but this in itself was one of the attractions of the book and as for the grief we respectively felt and feel i believe my own to be as deep as wordsworth's if not more so i said above as wordsworth is generally supposed to have felt 
for anyone imbued with the spirit of modern science will read Wordsworth's poem with different eyes from those of a mere literary critic. He will note that Wordsworth is most careful not to explain the nature of the difference which the death of Lucy will occasion to him. He tells us that there will be a difference, but there the matter ends. The superficial reader takes it that he was very sorry she was dead. It is, of course, possible that he may have actually been so, but he has not said this. On the contrary, he has hinted plainly that she was ugly and generally disliked. She was only like a violet when she was half hidden from the view, and only fair as a star when there were so few stars out that it was practically impossible to make an invidious comparison. If there were as many as even two stars, the likeness was felt to be at an end. If Wordsworth had imprudently promised to marry this young person during a time when he had been unusually long in keeping to good resolutions, and had afterwards seen someone whom he liked better, then Lucy's death would undoubtedly have made a considerable difference to him. And this is all that he has ever said that it would do. What right have we to put glosses upon the masterly reticence of a poet, and credit him with feelings possibly the very reverse of those he actually entertained? Sometimes, indeed, I have been inclined to think that a mystery is being hinted at more dark than any critic has suspected. I do not happen to possess a copy of the poem, but the writer, if I am not mistaken, says that few could know when Lucy ceased to be. Ceased to be is a suspiciously euphemistic expression, and the words few could know are not applicable to the ordinary peaceful death of a domestic servant such as Lucy appears to have been. No matter how obscure the deceased, any number of people commonly can know the day and hour of his or her demise, whereas in this case we are expressly told it would be impossible for them to do so. Wordsworth was nothing if not accurate, and would not have said that few could know, but that few actually did know, unless he was aware of circumstances that precluded all but those implicated in the crime of her death from knowing the precise moment of its occurrence. If Lucy was the kind of person not obscurely portrayed in the poem, if Wordsworth had murdered her, either by cutting her throat or smothering her, in concert perhaps with his friends Southey and Coleridge, and if he had thus found himself released from an engagement which had become irksome to him, or possibly from the threat of an action for breach of promise, then there is not a syllable in the poem with which he crowns his crime that is not alive with meaning. On any other supposition, to the general reader it is unintelligible. We cannot be too guarded in the interpretations we put upon the words of great poets. Take the young lady who never loved the dear gazelle, and I don't believe she did. We are apt to think that Moore intended us to see in this creation of his fancy a sweet, amiable, but most unfortunate young woman, whereas all he has told us about her points to an exactly opposite conclusion. In reality, he wished us to see a young lady who had been a habitual complainer from her earliest childhood, whose plants had always died as soon as she bought them, while those belonging to her neighbors had flourished. The inference is obvious, nor can we reasonably doubt that Moore intended us to draw it. If her plants were the very first to fade away, she was evidently the very first to neglect or otherwise maltreat them. She did not give them enough water, or left the door of her fern case open when she was cooking her dinner at the gas stove, or kept them too near the paraffin oil, or other like folly. And as for her temper, see what the gazelles did. As long as they did not know her well, they could just manage to exist. But when they got to understand her real character, one after another felt that death was the only course open to it, and accordingly died rather than live with such a mistress. True, the young lady herself said the gazelles loved her, but disagreeable people are apt to think themselves amiable, and in view of the course invariably taken by the gazelles themselves, anyone accustomed to weigh evidence will hold that she was probably mistaken. I must, however, return to Frost's Lives of Eminent Christians. I will leave none of the ambiguity about my words in which Moore and Wordsworth seem to have delighted. I am very sorry the book is gone, and know not where to turn for its successor. Till I have found a substitute, I can write no more, and I do not know how to find even a tolerable one. 
I should try a volume of Minier's complete course of petrology, but I do not like books in more than one volume, for the volumes vary in thickness, and one never can remember which one took. The four volumes, however, of Bede, in Giles' Anglican Fathers, are not open to this objection, and I have reserved them for favorable consideration. Mather's Magnalia might do, but the binding does not please me. Curitan's Corpus Ignatianum might also do if it were not too thin. I do not like taking Norton's genuineness of the Gospels, as it is just possible someone may be wanting to know whether the Gospels are genuine or not, and be unable to find out because I have got Mr. Norton's book. Baxter's Church History of England, Lingard's Anglo-Saxon Church, and Cardwell's Documentary Annals, though none of them as good as Frost, are works of considerable merit. But on the whole, I think Arvine's Cyclopedia of Moral and Religious Anecdote is perhaps the one book in the room which comes within measurable distance of Frost. I should probably try this book first, but it has a fatal objection in its too seductive title. I am not curious, as Miss Lottie Venne says in one of her parts, but I like to know, and I might be tempted to pervert the book from its natural uses and open it so as to find out what kind of a thing a moral and religious anecdote is. I know, of course, that there are a great many anecdotes in the Bible, but no one thinks of calling them either moral or religious, though some of them certainly seem as if they might fairly find a place in Mr. Arvine's work. There are some things, however, which it is better not to know, and take it all round, I do not think I should be wise in putting myself in the way of temptation and adopting Arvine as the successor to my beloved and lamented Frost. Some successor I must find, or I must give up writing altogether, and this I should be sorry to do. I have only as yet written about a third, or from that counting works written but not published, to a half of the books which I have set myself to write, it would not be so much matter if old age was not staring me in the face. Dr. Parr said it was a beastly shame for an old man not to have laid down a good cellar of port in his youth. I, like the greater number, I suppose, of those who write books at all, write in order that I may have something to read in my old age when I can write no longer. I know what I shall like better than anyone can tell me, and write accordingly. If my career is nipped in the bud, as seems only too likely, I really do not know where else I can turn for present agreeable occupation, nor yet how to make suitable provision for my later years. Other writers can, of course, make excellent provision for their own old ages, but they cannot do so for mine any more than I should succeed if I were to try to cater for theirs. It is one of those cases in which no man can make agreement for his brother. I have no heart for continuing this article, and if I had, I have nothing of interest to say. No one's literary career can have been smoother or more uncheckered than mine. I have published all my books at my own expense and paid for them in due course. What can be conceivably more unromantic? For some years I had a little literary grievance against the authorities of the British Museum because they would insist on saying in their catalogue that I had published three sermons on infidelity in the year 1820. I thought I had not and got them out to see. They were rather funny, but they were not mine. Now, however, this grievance has been removed. I had another little quarrel with them because they would describe me as of St. John's College, Cambridge, an establishment for which I have the most profound veneration, but with which I have not had the honor to be connected for some quarter of a century. At last they said they would change this description if I would only tell them what I was, for though they had done their best to find out, they had themselves failed. I replied with modest pride that I was a Bachelor of Arts. I keep all my other letters inside my name, not outside. They mused and said it was unfortunate that I was not a master of arts. Could I not get myself made a master? I said I understood that a mastership was an article the university could not do under about five pounds, and that I was not disposed to go sixpence higher than three ten. They again said it was a pity, for it would be very inconvenient to them if I did not keep to something between a bishop and a poet. 
I might be anything I liked in reason, provided I showed proper respect for the alphabet, but they had got me between Samuel Butler Bishop and Samuel Butler Poet. It would be very troublesome to shift me, and Bachelor came before Bishop. This was reasonable, so I replied that under those circumstances, if they pleased, I thought I would like to be a philosophical writer. They embraced the solution, and no matter what I write now, I must remain a philosophical writer as long as I live, for the alphabet will hardly be altered in my time, and I must be something between Bis and Poe. If I could get a volume of my excellent namesake's Hudibras out of the list of my works, I should be robbed of my last shred of literary grievance. So I say nothing about this, but keep it secret, lest some worse thing should happen to me. Besides, I have a great respect for my namesake, and always say that if Erwan had been a racehorse, it would have been got by Hudibras out of analogy. Someone said this to me many years ago, and I felt so much flattered that I have been repeating the remark as my own ever since. But how small are those grievances as compared with those endured without a murmur by hundreds of writers far more deserving than myself? When I see the scores and hundreds of workers in the reading room who have done so much more than I have, but whose work is absolutely fruitless to themselves, and when I think of the prompt recognition obtained by my own work, I ask myself what I have done to be thus rewarded. On the other hand, the feeling that I have succeeded far beyond my deserts hitherto makes it all the harder for me to acquiesce without complaint in the extinction of a career which I honestly believe to be a promising one. And once more I repeat that, unless the museum authorities give me back my frost, or put a locked clasp on Arvine, my career must be extinguished. Give me back frost, and if life and health are spared, I will write another dozen of volumes yet before I hang up my fiddle, if so serious a confusion of metaphors may be pardoned. I know from long experience how kind and considerate both the late and present superintendents of the reading room were and are, but I doubt how far either of them would be disposed to help me on this occasion. Continue, however, to rob me of my frost, and, whatever else I may do, I will write no more books. Note by Dr. Garnett, British Museum. The frost has broken up. Mr. Butler is restored to literature. Mr. Moody may make himself easy. England will still boast a humorist, and the late Mr. Darwin, to whose posthumous machinations the removal of the book was owing, will continue to be confounded. R. Garnett. End of Quis Desiderio by Samuel Butler from The Humor of Homer and Other Essays. Reading by Catherine. Slang from Historic China and Other Sketches by Herbert A. Giles This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Although native scholars in China have not deemed it worth while to compile such a work as the Slang Dictionary, it is no less a fact that slang occupies quite as important a position in Chinese as in any language of the West. Thieves of the Argo, as with us, intelligible only to each other, and phrases constantly occur even in refined conversation, the origin of which can be traced infallibly to the kennel. Why so much paint is the equivalent of what a swell you are, and is especially expressive in China, where beneath a flowered blue silk robe there often peeps out a pair of salmon-coloured inexpressibles of the same costly material. They have put down their barrows, means that certain men have struck work, and is peculiarly comprehensible in a country where so much transport is effected in this laborious way. Barrows are common all over the empire, both for the conveyance of goods and passengers, and where long distances have to be traversed, donkeys are frequently harnessed in front. The traditional sail is also occasionally used. We ourselves have seen barrows running before the wind between Tientsin and Taku, of course with a man pushing behind. The children have official business, 
is understood to mean they are laid up with the smallpox, the metaphor implying that their turn has come, just as a turn of official duty comes round to every Manchu in Peking, and in the same inevitable way. Vaccination is gradually dispelling this erroneous notion, but the phrase we have given is not likely to disappear. A magistrate who has skinned the place clean has extorted every possible cash from the district committed to his charge. A father and mother of the people, as his grasping honour is called. That horse has a mane, says the Chinese housebreaker, speaking of a wall well studded at the top with pieces of broken glass or sharp iron spikes. You'll have to sprinkle so much water, urges the friend who advises you to keep clear of law, likening official greed to dust, which requires a liberal outlay of water in the shape of banknotes to make it lie. A flowery bill is understood from one end of China to the other, as that particular kind in which our native servants delight to indulge, namely an account charging twice as much for everything as was really paid, and containing twice as much in quantity as was actually supplied. A flowery suit is a case in which women play a prominent part. You scorched me yesterday, is a quiet way of remarking that an appointment was broken, and implying that the rays of the sun were unpleasantly hot. Don't pick out the sugar, is a very necessary injunction to a servant, sent to market to buy food, etc. The metaphor being taken from a kind of sweet dumpling consumed in great quantities by rich and poor alike. Another phrase is, don't ride the donkey, which may be explained by the proverbial dislike of Chinamen for walking exercise, and the temptation to hire a donkey and squeeze the fare out of the money given them for other purposes. That house is not clean inside, signifies that devils and bogies, so dreaded by the Chinese, have taken up their residence therein, in fact, that the house is haunted. He's all rice water, i.e. gives one plenty of the water in which rice has been boiled, but none of the rice itself, is said of a man who promises much and does nothing. One load between the two is very commonly said of two men who have married two sisters. In China, a coolie's load consists of two baskets or bundles slung with ropes to the end of a flat bamboo pole about five feet in length and thus carried across the shoulder. Hence the expression. Apropos of marriage, the guitar string is broken, is an elegant periphrasis by which it is understood that a man's wife is dead, the verb to die being rarely used in conversation and never of a relative or friend. He will not put a new string to his guitar is of course a continuation of the same idea more coarsely expressed as putting on a new coat. His father has been gathered to the West, a phrase evidently of Buddhistic import. Is no more, has gone for a stroll, has bid adieu to the world, may all be employed to supply the place of the tabooed verb, which is chiefly used of animals and plants. After a few days' illness, he kicked, is a vulgar way of putting it, and analogous to the English slang idiom. The emperor becomes a guest on high, riding up to heaven on the dragon's back, with flowers of rhetoric ad nauseam. Buddhist priests revolve into emptiness, i.e. are annihilated. The soul of the Taoist priest wings its flight away. Only a candle end left is said of an affair which nears completion. Red and white matters are marriages and deaths, 
so called from the colour of the clothes worn on these important occasions. A blushing person fires up, or literally ups fire, according to the Chinese idiom. To be fond of blowing resembles our modern term gassing. A lose money goods is a daughter as compared with a son who can go out in the world and earn money, whereas a daughter must be provided with a dowry before anyone will marry her. A more genuine metaphor is a thousand ounces of silver. It expresses the real affection Chinese parents have for their daughters as well as their sons. To let the dog out is the same as our letting the cat out. To run against a nail is allied to kicking against the pricks. A man of superficial knowledge is called half a bottle of vinegar, the why vinegar, in preference to anything else we have not been able to discover. He has always got his gun in his hand, is a reproach launched at the head of some confirmed opium debauchee, one of those few reckless smokers to whom opium is indeed a curse. They have burnt paper together, makes it clear to a Chinese mind that the persons spoken of have gone through the marriage service, part of which ceremony consists in burning silver paper, made up to resemble lumps of the pure metal. We have split is one of those happy idioms which lose nothing in translation, being word for word the same in both languages, and with exactly the same meaning. A crooked stick is a man whose eccentricities keep people from associating freely with him. He won't lie conveniently in a bundle with the other sticks. We will bring this short sketch to a close with one more example. Valuable because it is old, because the date at which it came into existence can be fixed with unerring certainty, and because it is commonly used in all parts of China though hardly one educated man in ten would be able to tell the reason why. A jealous woman is said to drink vinegar, and the origin of the term is as follows. Fang Xuan Ling was the favourite minister of the Emperor Tai Tsung of the Tang dynasty. He lived A.D. 578 to 648. One day his master gave him a maid of honour from the palace as second wife. But the first or real wife made the place too hot for the poor girl to live in. Fang complained to the emperor, who gave him a bowl of poison, telling him to offer his troublesome wife the choice between death and peaceable behaviour for the future. The lady instantly chose the former and drank up the bowl of vinegar which the emperor had substituted to try her constancy. Subsequently, on his majesty's recommendation, Fang sent the young lady back to resume her duties as tirewoman to the empress. But the phrase lived and has survived to this day. End of Slang from Historic China and Other Sketches by Herbert A. Giles Read by Noel Badrian Some Animal Friends in Africa by Bayard Taylor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Years ago I spent a winter in Africa. I had intended to go up the Nile only as far as Nubia, visiting the great temples and tombs of Thebes on the way. But when I had done all this, and passed beyond the cataracts at the southern boundary of Egypt, I found the journey so agreeable, so full of interest, and attended with so much less danger than I had supposed, that I determined to go on for a month or two longer, and penetrate as far as possible into the interior. Everything was favourable to my plan. When I reached Khartoum, the Austrian consul invited me to his house, and there I spent three or four weeks, 
in that strange town, making acquaintance with the Egyptian officers, the chiefs of the desert tribes, and the former kings of the different countries of Ethiopia. When I left my boat on arriving, and walked through the narrow streets of Khartoum, between mud walls, very few of which were even whitewashed, I thought it a miserable place, and began to look out for some garden where I might pitch my tent, rather than live in one of those dirty-looking habitations. The wall around the consul's house was of mud like the others, but when I entered I found clean, handsome rooms, which furnished delightful shade and coolness during the heat of the day. The roof was of palm logs covered with mud, which the sun baked into a hard mass, so that the house was in reality as good as a brick dwelling. It was a great deal more comfortable than it appeared from the outside. There were other features of the place, however, which it would be difficult to find anywhere except in Central Africa. After I had taken possession of my room and eaten breakfast with my host, I went out to look at the garden. On each side of the steps leading down from the door sat two apes, who barked and snapped at me. The next thing I saw was a leopard tied to the trunk of an orange tree. I did not dare to go within reach of his rope, although I afterwards became well acquainted with him. A little further there was a pen of gazelles, and an antelope with immense horns. Then two fierce bristling hyenas, and at last, under a shed beside the stable, a full-grown lioness sleeping in the shade. I was greatly surprised when the consul went up to her, lifted up her head, opened her jaws so as to show the shining white tusks, and finally sat down upon her back. She accepted these familiarities so good-naturedly that I made bold to pat her head also. In a day or two we were great friends. She would spring about with delight whenever she saw me, and would purr like a cat whenever I sat upon her back. I spent an hour or two every day among the animals, and found them all easy to tame except the hyenas, which would gladly have bitten me if I had allowed them a chance. The leopard one day bit me slightly on the hand, but I punished him by pouring several buckets of water over him, and he was always very amiable after that. The beautiful little gazelles would cluster around me, thrusting up their noses into my hand, and saying, wow, wow, as plainly as I write it. But none of these animals attracted me as much as the big lioness. She was always good-humoured, though occasionally so lazy that she would not even open her eyes when I sat down on her shoulder. She would sometimes catch my foot in her paws as a kitten catches a ball, and try to make a plaything of it, yet always without thrusting out her claws. Once she opened her mouth and gently took one of my legs in her jaws for a moment, and the very next instant she put out her tongue and licked my hand. There seemed to be almost as much of the dog as of the cat in her nature. We all know, however, that there are differences of character among animals as there are among men, and my favourite probably belonged to a virtuous and respectable family of lions. The day after my arrival, I went with the consul to visit the Pasha, who lived in a large mud palace on the bank of the Blue Nile. He received us very pleasantly, and invited us to take seats in the shady courtyard. Here there was a huge panther tied to one of the pillars, while a little lion, about eight months old, ran about perfectly loose. The Pasha called the latter, which came springing and frisking towards him. Now, said he, we will have some fun. Then he made the lion lie down behind one of the pillars, and called to one of the black boys to go across the courtyard on some errand. The lion lay quite still until the boy came opposite to the pillar, when he sprang out after him. The boy ran, terribly frightened, but the lion reached him in five or six leaps, sprang upon his back and threw him to the ground and then went back to the pillar as if quite satisfied with his exploit. Although the boy was not hurt in the least, it seemed to me like a cruel piece of fun. 
The Pasha, nevertheless, laughed very heartily, and told us that he had himself trained the lion to frighten the boys. Presently the little lion went away, and when we came to look for him, we found him lying on one of the tables in the kitchen of the palace, apparently very much interested in watching the cook. The latter told us that the animal sometimes took small pieces of meat, but seemed to know that it was not permitted, for he would run away afterwards in great haste. What I saw of lions during my residence in Khartoum satisfied me that they are not very difficult to tame, only, as they belong to the cat family, no dependence can be placed on their continued good behaviour. Although I was glad to leave that wild town with its burning climate, and retrace the long way back to Egypt, across the desert and down the Nile, I felt very sorry at being obliged to take leave forever of all my pets. The little gazelles said wow wow in answer to my goodbye. The hyenas howled and tried to bite, just as ever. But the dear old lioness, I know, would have been sorry if she could have understood that I was going. She frisked around me, licked my hand, and I took her great tawny head in my arms and gave her a kiss. Since then I have never had a lion for a pet, and may never have one again. I must confess I am sorry for it, for I still retain my love for lions, four-footed ones I mean, to this day. End of Some Animal Friends in Africa by Bayard Taylor Read by Noel Badrian Thrilling Story by Titanic Surviving Wireless Man by Harold Bride This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thrilling Story by Titanic Surviving Wireless Man Bride tells how he and Phillips worked and how he finished a stoker who tried to steal Phillips' life belt. Ship sank to tune of autumn. By Harold Bride, surviving wireless operator of the Titanic. This statement was dictated by Mr. Bride to a reporter for the New York Times who visited him with Mr. Marconi in the wireless cabin of the Carpathia a few minutes after the steamship touched her pier. In the first place, the public should not blame anybody because more wireless messages about the disaster to the Titanic did not reach shore from the Carpathia. I positively refused to send press dispatches because the bulk of personal messages with touching words of grief was so large. The wireless operators aboard the Chester got all they asked for, and they were wretched operators. They knew American Morse, but not Continental Morse sufficiently to be worthwhile. They taxed our endurance to the limit. I had to cut them out at last. They were so insufferably slow, and go ahead with our messages of grief to relatives. We sent 119 personal messages today and 50 yesterday. When I was dragged aboard the Carpathia, I went to the hospital at first. I stayed there for 10 hours. Then somebody brought word that the Carpathia's wireless operator was getting queer from the work. They asked me if I could go up and help. I could not walk. Both my feet were broken or something. I don't know what. I went up on crutches with somebody helping me. I took the key, and I never left the wireless cabin after that. Our meals were brought to us. We kept the wireless working all the time. The Navy operators were a great nuisance. I advised them all to learn the Continental Morse and learn to speed it up if they ever expect to be worth their salt. The Chester's man thought he knew it, but he was as slow as Christmas coming. We worked all the time. Nothing went wrong. Sometimes the Carpathia man sent, and sometimes I sent. There was a bed in the wireless cabin. I could sit on it and rest my feet while sending sometimes. To begin at the beginning, I joined the Titanic at Belfast. I was born at Nunhead, England, 22 years ago, and joined the Marconi forces last July. I first worked on the Hoverford, and then on a Lusitania. I joined the Titanic at Belfast. Asleep when crash came. I didn't have much to do aboard the Titanic except to relieve Phillips from midnight until sometime in the morning, 
when he should be through sleeping. On the night of the accident, I was not sending, but was asleep. I was due to be up and relieve Phillips earlier than usual, and that reminds me, if it hadn't been for a lucky thing, we never could have sent any call for help. The lucky thing was that the wireless broke down early enough for us to fix it before the accident. We noticed something wrong on Sunday, and Phillips and I worked seven hours to find it. We found a secretary burned out at last and repaired it just a few hours before the iceberg was struck. Phillips said to me as he took the night shift, You turn in, boy, and get some sleep, and go up as soon as you can and give me a chance. I'm all done for with this work of making repairs. There were three rooms in the wireless cabin. One was a sleeping room, one a dynamo room, and one an operating room. I took off my clothes and went to sleep in bed. Then I was conscious of waking up and hearing Phillips sending to Cape Race. I read what he was sending. It was traffic matter. I remembered how tired he was, and I got out of bed without my clothes on to relieve him. I didn't even feel the shock. I hardly knew what had happened after the captain had come to us. There was no jolt, whatever. I was standing by Phillips, telling him to go to bed, when the captain put his head in the cabin. We've struck an iceberg, the captain said, and I'm having an inspection made to tell what it has done for us. You'd better get ready to send out a call for assistance, but don't send it until I tell you. The captain went away, and in ten minutes, I should estimate the time, he came back. We could hear a terrible confusion outside, but there was not the least thing to indicate that there was any trouble. The wireless was working perfectly. "'Send the call for assistance,' ordered the captain, barely putting his head in the door. "'What call should I send?' Phillips asked. "'The regulation international call for help. Just that.' Then the captain was gone. Phillips began to send CQD. He flashed away at it, and we joked while he did so. All of us made light of the disaster. Joked at the stress call. We joked that way while he flashed signals for about five minutes. Then the captain came back. What are you sending, he asked. CQD, Phillips replied. The humor of the situation appealed to me. I cut in with a little remark that made us all laugh, including the captain. Send SOS, I said. It's the new call, and it may be your last chance to send it. Phillips, with a laugh, changed the signal to SOS. The captain told us we had been struck amidships, or just back of amidships. It was ten minutes, Phillips told me, after he had noticed the iceberg, that the slight jolt that was the collision's only signal to us occurred. We thought we were a good distance away. We said lots of funny things to each other in the next few minutes. We picked up first the steamship Frankfurt. We gave her our position and said we had struck an iceberg and needed assistance. The Frankfurt operator went away to tell his captain. He came back and we told him we were sinking by the head. By that time, we could observe a distinct list forward. The Carpathia answered our signal. We told her our position and said we were sinking by the head. The operator went to tell the captain, and in five minutes returned and told us that the captain of the Carpathia was putting about and heading for us. Great Scramble on Deck Our captain had left us at this time, and Phillips told me to run and tell him what the Carpathia had answered. I did so, and I went through an awful mass of people to his cabin. The decks were full of scrambling men and women. I saw no fighting, but I heard tell of it. I came back and heard Phillips giving the Carpathia fuller directions. Phillips told me to put on my clothes. Until that moment, I forgot that I was not dressed. I went to my cabin and dressed. I brought an overcoat to Phillips. It was very cold. I slipped the overcoat upon him while he worked. Every few minutes, Phillips would send me to the captain with little messages. They were merely telling how the Carpathia was coming our way and gave her speed. I noticed as I came back from one trip that they were putting off women and children in lifeboats. I noticed that the list forward was increasing. Phillips told me that the wireless was growing weaker. The captain came and told us that our engine rooms were taking water and that the dynamos might not last much longer. We sent that word to the Carpathia. I went out on deck and looked around. The water was pretty close up to the boat deck. There was a great scramble aft and how poor Phillips worked through it, I don't know. He was a brave man. I learned to love him that night, and I suddenly felt for him a great reverence to see him standing there, sticking to his work, while everybody else was raging about. 
I will never live to forget the work of Phillips for the last awful fifteen minutes. I thought it was about time to look about and see if there was anything detached that would float. I remembered that every member of the crew had a special life belt and ought to know where it was. I remembered mine was under my bunk. I went and got it. Then I thought how cold the water was. I remembered I had some boots and I put those on and an extra jacket and I put that on. I saw Philip standing out there, still sending away, giving the Carpathia details of just how we were doing. We picked up the Olympic and told her we were sinking by the head and were about all down. As Phillips was sending the message, I strapped his life belt to his back. I had already put on his overcoat. I wondered if I could get him into his boots. He suggested with a sort of laugh that I look about and see if all the people were off in the boats, or if any boats were left, or how things were. The last boat left. I saw a collapsible boat near a funnel and went over to it. Twelve men were trying to boost it down to the boat deck. They were having an awful time. It was the last boat left. I looked at it longingly a few minutes. Then I gave them a hand, and over she went. They all started to scramble in on the boat deck, and I walked back to Phillips. I said the last raft had gone. Then came the captain's voice. Men, you have done your full duty. You can do no more. Abandon your cabin. Now it's every man for himself. You look out for yourselves. I release you. That's the way of it at this kind of a time. Every man for himself. I looked out. The boat deck was awash. Phillips clung on, sending and sending. He clung on for about ten minutes, or maybe fifteen minutes, after the captain had released him. The water was then coming into our cabin. While he worked, something happened I hate to tell about. I was back in my room getting Phillips's money for him, and as I looked out the door I saw a stoker or somebody from below decks leaning over Phillips from behind. He was too busy to notice what the man was doing. The man was slipping the life belt off Phillips's back. He was a big man, too. As you can see, I am very small. I don't know what it was I got hold of. I remembered in a flash the way Phillips had clung on, how I had to fix that life belt in place because he was too busy to do it. I know that man from below decks had his own life belt and should have known where to get it. I suddenly felt a passion not to let that man die a decent sailor's death. I wished he might have stretched rope or walked a plank. I did my duty. I hope I finished him. I don't know. We left him on the cabin floor of the wireless room, and he was not moving. Band Plays in Ragtime From aft came the tunes of the band. It was a ragtime tune. I don't know what. Then there was Autumn. Phillips ran aft, and that was the last I ever saw of him alive. I went to the place I had seen the collapsible boat on the boat deck, and to my surprise I saw the boat and the men still trying to push it off. I guess there wasn't a sailor in the crowd. They couldn't do it. I went up to them and I was just lending a hand when a large wave came awash of the deck. The big wave carried the boat off. I had hold of an oar lock and I went off with it. The next I knew I was in the boat. But that was not all. I was in the boat and the boat was upside down and I was under it. And I remember realizing I was wet through and that whatever happened I must not breathe for I was under water. I knew I had to fight for it, and I did. How I got out from under the boat I do not know, but I felt a breath of air at last. There were men all around me, hundreds of them. The sea was dotted with them, all depending on their life belts. I felt I simply had to get away from the ship. She was a beautiful sight then. Smoke and sparks were rushing out of her funnel. There must have been an explosion, but we had heard none. We only saw the big stream of sparks. The ship was gradually turning on her nose, just like the duck does that goes down for a dive. I had only one thing on my mind, to get away from the suction. The band was still playing. I guess all of the band went down. They were playing Autumn, then. I swam with all my might. I suppose I was a hundred and fifty feet away when the Titanic, on her nose, with her after quarter sticking straight up in the air, began to settle, slowly. Pulled into a boat. When at last the waves washed over her rudder, there wasn't the least bit of suction I could feel. She must have kept going just so slowly as she had been. I forgot to mention that 
Besides the Olympic and Carpathia, we spoke some German boat, I don't know which, and told them how we were. We also spoke the Baltic. I remembered those things as I began to figure what ships would be coming toward us. I felt, after a little while, like sinking. I was very cold. I saw a boat of some kind near me and put all my strength into an effort to swim to it. It was hard work. I was all done when a hand reached out from the boat and pulled me aboard. It was our same collapsible. The same crowd was on it. There was just room for me to roll on the edge. I lay there, not caring what happened. Somebody sat on my legs. They were wedged in between slats and were being wrenched. I had not the heart to ask the man to move. It was a terrible sight all around, men swimming and sinking. I lay where I was, letting the man wrench my feet out of shape. Others came near. Nobody gave them a hand. The bottom-up boat already had more men than it would hold, and it was sinking. At first the larger waves splashed over my clothing. Then they began to splash over my head, and I had to breathe when I could. As we floated around on our capsized boat, and I kept straining my eyes for a ship's lights, somebody said, Don't the rest of you think we ought to pray? The man who made the suggestion asked what the religion of the others was. Each man called out his religion. One was a Catholic, one a Methodist, one a Presbyterian. It was decided the most appropriate prayer for all was the Lord's Prayer. We spoke it over in chorus with the man who first suggested that we pray as the leader. Some splendid people saved us. They had a right-side-up boat, and it was full to its capacity. Yet they came to us and loaded us all into it. I saw some lights off in the distance, and knew a steamship was coming to our aid. I didn't care what happened. I just lay and gasped when I could and felt the pain in my feet. At last the Carpathia was alongside, and the people were being taken up a rope ladder. Our boat drew near, and one by one the men were taken off of it. One dead on the raft. One man was dead. I passed him and went to the ladder, though my feet pained terribly. The dead man was Phillips. He had died on the raft from exposure and cold, I guess. He had been all in from work before the wreck came. He stood his ground until the crisis had passed, and then he had collapsed, I guess. But I hardly thought that then. I didn't think much of anything. I tried the rope ladder. My feet pained terribly, but I got to the top and felt hands reaching out to me. The next thing I knew, a woman was leaning over me in a cabin, and I felt her hand waving back my hair and rubbing my face. I felt somebody at my feet and felt the warmth of a jolt of liquor. Somebody got me under the arms. Then I was hustled down below to the hospital. That was early in the day, I guess. I lay in the hospital until near night, and they told me the Carpathia's wireless man was getting queer, and would I help? After that I was never out of the wireless room, so I don't know what happened among the passengers. I saw nothing of Mrs. Astor or any of them. I just worked wireless. The splutter never died down. I knew it soothed the hurt and felt like a tie to the world of friends and home. How could I then take news queries? Sometimes I let a newspaper ask a question and get a long string of stuff asking for full particulars about everything. Whenever I started to take such a message, I thought of the poor people waiting for their messages to go, hoping for answers to them. I shut off the inquirers and sent my personal messages, and I feel I did the white thing. If the Chester had had a decent operator, I could have worked with him longer, but he got terribly on my nerves with his insufferable incompetence. I was still sending my personal messages when Mr. Marconi and the Times reporter arrived to ask that I prepare this statement. There were maybe a hundred left. I would like to send them all, because I know I could rest easier if I knew all those messages had gone to the friends waiting for them. But an ambulance man is waiting with a stretcher, and I guess I have got to go with him. I hope my legs get better soon. The way the band kept playing was a noble thing. I heard it first when still we were working wireless, when there was a ragtime tune for us, and the last I saw of the band, when I was floating out in the sea with my life belt on, it was still on deck playing Autumn. How they ever did it, I cannot imagine. That, and the way Phillips kept sending after the captain told him his life was his own, and to look out for himself. 
are two things that stand out in my mind over all the rest. End of Thrilling Story by Titanic's Surviving Wireless Man by Harold Bride Read by Winston Tharp Thomas Jefferson to Dr. Thomas Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Thomas Jefferson to Dr. Thomas Cooper. Monticello, November 2, 1822. Dear Sir, Your favor of October the 18th came to hand yesterday. The atmosphere of our country is unquestionably charged with a threatening cloud of fanaticism, lighter in some parts, denser in others, but too heavy in all. I had no idea, however, that in Pennsylvania, the cradle of toleration and freedom of religion, it could have arisen to the height you describe. This must be owing to the growth of Presbyterianism. The blasphemy and absurdity of the five points of Calvin, and the impossibility of defending them, render their advocates impatient of reasoning, irritable, and prone to denunciation. In Boston, however, and its neighborhood, Unitarianism has advanced to so great strength as now to humble this haughtiest of all religious sects, insomuch that they condescend to interchange with them and the other sects, the civilities of preaching freely and frequently in each other's meeting houses. In Rhode Island, on the other hand, no sectarian preacher will permit a Unitarian to pollute his desk. In our Richmond there is much fanaticism, but chiefly among the women. They have their night meetings and praying parties, where, attended by their priests, and sometimes by a henpecked husband, they pour forth the effusions of their love to Jesus, in terms as amatory and carnal, as their modesty would permit them to use, to a mere earthly lover. In our village of Charlottesville, there is a good degree of religion, with a small spice only of fanaticism. We have four sects, but without either church or meeting house. The courthouse is the common temple, one Sunday in the month to each. Here, Episcopalian and Presbyterian, Methodist and Baptist, meet together, join in hymning their maker, listen with attention and devotion to each other's preachers, and all mix in society with perfect harmony. It is not so in the districts where Presbyterianism prevails undividedly. Their ambition and tyranny would tolerate no rival if they had power. Systematical and grasping at an ascendancy over all other sects, they aim, like the Jesuits, at engrossing the education of the country, are hostile to every institution which they do not direct, and jealous at seeing others begin to attend at all to that object. The diffusion of instruction, to which there is now so growing an attention, will be the remote remedy to this fever of fanaticism, while the more proximate one will be the progress of Unitarianism. That this will, ere long, be the religion of the majority from north to south, I have no doubt. In our university, you know, there is no professorship of divinity. A handle has been made of this, to disseminate an idea that this is an institution, not merely of no religion, but against all religion. Occasion was taken at the last meeting of the visitors, to bring forward an idea that might silence this calumny, which waited on the minds of some honest friends in the institution. In our annual report to the legislature, after stating the constitutional reasons against a public establishment of any religious instruction, we suggest the expediency of encouraging the different religious sects to establish, each for itself, a professorship of their own tenets, on the confines of the university, so near as that their students may attend the lectures there, and have the free use of our library, and every other accommodation we can give them, preserving, however, their independence of us and of each other. This fills the chasm objected to ours, as a defect in an institution professing to give instruction in all useful sciences. I think the invitation will be accepted, by some sects from candid intentions, and by others from jealousy and rivalship. And by bringing the sects together, and mixing them with the mass of other students, we shall soften their asperities, liberalize and neutralize their prejudices, and make the general religion a religion of peace, reason, and morality. The time of opening our university is still as uncertain as ever. All the pavilions, boarding houses, and dormitories are done. Nothing is now wanting but the central building for a library and other general purposes. 
for this we have no funds, and the last legislature refused all aid. We have better hopes of the next, but all is uncertain. I have heard with regret of disturbances on the part of the students in your seminary. The article of discipline is the most difficult in American education. Premature ideas of independence, too little repressed by parents, beget a spirit of insubordination, which is the great obstacle to science with us, and a principal cause of its decay, since the revolution. I look to it with dismay in our institution, as a breaker ahead, which I am far from being confident we shall be able to weather. The advance of age, and tardy pace of the public patronage, may probably spare me the pain of witnessing consequences. I salute you with constant friendship and respect. End of Thomas Jefferson to Dr. Thomas Cooper From Travels in Alaska by John Muir This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I set off early the morning of August 30th, before any one else in camp had stirred, not waiting for breakfast, but only eating a piece of bread. I had intended getting a cup of coffee, but a wild storm was blowing and calling, and I could not wait. Running out against the rain-laden gale, and turning to catch my breath, I saw that the minister's little dog had left his bed in the tent, and was coming boring through the storm, evidently determined to follow me. I told him to go back, that such a day as this had nothing for him. "'Go back!' I shouted, "'and get your breakfast!' But he simply stood with his head down, and when I began to urge my way again, looking around, I saw he was still following me. So I at last told him to come on if he must, and gave him a piece of the bread I had in my pocket. Instead of falling, the rain, mixed with misty shreds of clouds, was flying in level sheets, and the wind was roaring as I had never heard wind roar before. Over the icy levels and over the woods, on the mountains, over the jagged rocks and spires and chasms of the glacier, it boomed and moaned and roared, filling the fjord in even grey structureless gloom, inspiring and awful. I first struggled up in the face of the blast to the east end of the ice wall, where a patch of forest had been carried away by the glacier when it was advancing. I noticed a few stumps well out on the moraine flat, showing that its present bare, raw condition was not the condition of fifty or a hundred years ago. In front of this part of the glacier there is a small moraine lake, about half a mile in length, around the margin of which are a considerable number of trees, standing knee-deep, and of course dead. This also is a result of the recent advance of the ice. Pushing up through the ragged edge of the woods on the left margin of the glacier, the storm seemed to increase in violence, so that it was difficult to draw breath in facing it. Therefore I took shelter back of a tree, to enjoy it, and wait, hoping that it would at last somewhat abate. Here the glacier, descending over an abrupt rock, falls forward in grand cascades, while a stream swollen by the rain was now a torrent. Wind, rain, ice torrent, and water torrent, in one grand symphony. At length the storm seemed to abate somewhat, and I took off my heavy rubber boots, with which I had waded the glacial streams on the flat, and laid them with my overcoat on a log, where I might find them on my way back, knowing I would be drenched anyhow, and firmly tied my mountain shoes, tightened my belt, shouldered my ice-axe, and, thus free and ready for rough work, pushed on, regardless as possible of mere rain. Making my way up a steep granite slope, its projecting polished bosses encumbered here and there by boulders, and the ground and bruised ruins of the ragged edge of the forest that had been uprooted by the glacier during its recent advance, I traced the side of the glacier for two or three miles, finding everywhere evidence of its having encroached on the woods, which here run back along its edge for fifteen or twenty miles. Under the projecting edge of this vast ice river, I could see down beneath it to a depth of fifty feet or so in some places, where logs and branches were being crushed to pulp some of it almost fine enough for paper, though most of it stringy and coarse. After thus tracing the margin of the glacier for three or four miles, I chopped steps and climbed to the top, and as far as the eye could reach the nearly level glacier stretched indefinitely away in the grey cloudy sky, a prairie of ice. The wind was now almost moderate, though rain continued to fall, which I did not mind, but a tendency to mist in the drooping draggled clouds made me hesitate about attempting to cross to the opposite shore. Although the distance was only six or seven miles, 
no traces at this time could be seen of the mountains on the other side, and in case the sky should grow darker, as it seemed inclined to do, I feared that when I got out of sight of land, and perhaps into a maze of crevasses, I might find difficulty in winning a way back. Lingering a while, and sauntering about in sight of the shore, I found this eastern side of the glacier remarkably free from large crevasses. Nearly all I met were so narrow I could step across them almost anywhere, while the few wide ones were easily avoided by going up or down along their sides to where they narrowed. The dismal cloud ceiling showed rifts here and there, and, thus encouraged, I struck out for the west shore, aiming to strike it five or six miles above the front wall, cautiously taking compass bearings at short intervals to enable me to find my way back should the weather darken again, with mist, or rain, or snow. The structure lines of the glacier itself were, however, my main guide. All went well. I came to a deeply furrowed section about two miles in width, where I had to zigzag in long tedious tacks and make narrow doublings, tracing the edges of wide longitudinal furrows and chasms, until I could find a bridge connecting their sides, oftentimes making the direct distance ten times over. The walking was good of its kind, however, and by dint of patient doubling and axe work on dangerous places, I gained the opposite shore in about three hours, the width of the glacier at this point being about seven miles. Occasionally, while making my way, the clouds lifted a little, revealing a few bald, rough mountains sunk to the throat in the broad icy sea, which encompassed them on all sides, sweeping on for ever and for ever, as we count time, wearing them away, giving them the shape they are destined to take when in the fullness of time they shall be parts of new landscapes. Ere I lost sight of the east side mountains, those on the west came in sight, so that holding my course was easy, and though making haste, I halted for a moment to gaze down into the beautiful pure blue crevasses, and to drink at the lovely blue wells, the most beautiful of all nature's water basins, or at the rills and streams outspread over the Iceland prairie, never ceasing to admire their lovely colour and music, as they glided and swirled in their blue crystal channels and potholes, and the rumbling of the moulins or mills, where streams poured into blue-walled pits of unknown depth, some of them as regularly circular as if bored with augers. Interesting, too, were the cascades over blue cliffs, where streams fell into crevasses, or slid almost noiselessly down slopes so smooth and frictionless their motion was concealed. The round or oval wells, however, from one to ten feet wide, and from one to twenty or thirty feet deep, were perhaps the most beautiful of all, the water so pure as to be almost invisible. My widest views did not probably exceed fifteen miles, the rain and mist making distances seem greater. On reaching the farther shore, and tracing it a few miles to northward, I found a large portion of the glacier current sweeping out westward in a bold and beautiful curve around the shoulder of a mountain, as if going direct to the open sea. Leaving the main trunk, it breaks into a magnificent uproar of pinnacles and spires, and upheaving, splashing, wave-shaped masses, a crystal cataract incomparably greater and wilder than a score of Niagara's. Tracing its channel three or four miles, I found that it fell into a lake, which it fills with bergs. The front of this branch of the glacier is about three miles wide. I first took the lake to be the head of an arm of the sea, but going down to its shore and tasting it, I found it fresh, and by my aneroid perhaps less than a hundred feet above sea level. It is probably separated from the sea only by a moraine dam. I had not time to go around its shores, as it was now near five o'clock, and I was about fifteen miles from camp, and I had to make haste to recross the glacier before dark, which would come on about eight o'clock. I therefore made haste up to the main glacier, and, shaping my course by compass and the structure lines of the ice, set off from the land out onto the grand crystal prairie again. All was so silent, and so consented, owing to the low dragging mist, the beauty close about me was all the more keenly felt, though tinged with a dim sense of danger, as if coming events were casting shadows. I was soon out of sight of land, and the evening dusk that on cloudy days precedes the real night gloom came stealing on, and only ice was in sight, and the only sounds, save the low rumbling of the mills and the rattling of falling stones at long intervals, were the low, terrible, earnest moanings of the wind, or distant waterfalls coming through the thickening gloom. After two hours of hard work, I came to a maze of crevasses, of appalling depth and width, which could not be passed apparently either up or down, I traced them with firm nerve developed by the danger, making wide jumps, poising cautiously on dizzy edges after cutting footholds, 
taking wide crevasses at a grand leap, at once frightful and inspiring. Many a mile was thus travelled, mostly up and down the glacier, making but little real headway, running much of the time, as the danger of having to pass the night on the ice became more and more imminent. This I could do, though with the weather and my rain-soaked condition it would be trying at best. In treading the mazes of this crevassed section I had frequently to cross bridges that were only knife-edges for twenty or thirty feet, cutting off the sharp tops and leaving them flat so that little Stikine could follow me. These I had to straddle, cutting off the top as I progressed, and hitching gradually ahead like a boy riding a rail fence. All this time the little dog followed me bravely, never hesitating on the brink of any crevasse that I had jumped. But now that it was becoming dark, and the crevasses became more troublesome, he followed close at my heels, instead of scampering far and wide where the ice was at all smooth, as he had in the forenoon. No land was now in sight. The mist fell lower and darker, and snow began to fly. I could not see far enough up and down the glacier to judge how best to work out of the bewildering labyrinth, and how hard I tried while there was yet hope of reaching camp that night, a hope which was fast growing dim, like the sky. After dark, on such ground, to keep from freezing, I could only jump up and down until morning, on a piece of flat ice between the crevasses, dance to the boding music of the winds and waters, and as I was already tired and hungry, I would be in bad condition for such ice work. Many times I was put to my mettle, but with a firm braced nerve, all the more unflinching as the dangers thickened, I worked out of that terrible ice web, and with blood fairly up, Stikine and I ran over common danger without fatigue. Our very hardest trial was in getting across the very last of the sliver bridges. After examining the first of the two widest crevasses, I followed its edge half a mile or so up and down, and discovered that its narrowest spot was about eight feet wide which was the limit of what I was able to jump. Moreover, the side I was on, that is the west side, was about a foot higher than the other, and I feared that in case I should be stopped by a still wider impassable crevasse ahead, that I would hardly be able to take back that jump from its lower side. The ice beyond, however, as far as I could see it, looked temptingly smooth. Therefore, after carefully making a socket for my foot on the rounded brink, I jumped, but found that I had nothing to spare, and more than ever dreaded having to retrace my way. Little Stikine jumped this, however, without apparently taking a second look at it, and we ran ahead joyfully over smooth level ice, hoping we were now leaving all danger behind us. But hardly had we gone a hundred or two yards, when, to our dismay, we found ourselves on the very widest of all the longitudinal crevasses we had yet encountered. It was about forty feet wide. I ran anxiously up the side of it to northward, eagerly hoping that I could get around its head, but my worst fears were realised when, at a distance of about a mile or less, it ran into the crevasse that I had just jumped. I then ran down the edge for a mile or more below the point where I had first met it, and found that its lower end also united with the crevasse I had jumped, showing dismally that we were on an island, two or three hundred yards wide, and about two miles long, and the only way of escape from this island was by turning back and jumping again that crevasse which I dreaded, or venturing ahead across the giant crevasse, by the very worst of the sliver bridges I had ever seen. It was so badly weathered and melted down that it formed a knife edge, and extended from side to side in a low, drooping curve, like that made by a loose rope attached at each end at the same height. But the worst difficulty was that the ends of the down-curving sliver were attached to the sides at a depth of about eight or ten feet below the surface of the glacier. Getting down to the end of the bridge, and then after crossing it getting up the other side, seemed hardly possible. However, I decided to dare the dangers of this fearful sliver, rather than attempt to retrace my steps. Accordingly, I dug a low groove in the rounded edge, for my knees to rest in, and leaning over, began to cut a narrow foothold on the steep, smooth side. When I was doing this, Stikine came up behind me, pushed his head over my shoulder, looked into the crevasses and along the narrow knife edge, then turned and looked in my face, muttering and whining as if trying to say, "'Surely you are not going down there?' I said, yes, Stikine, this is the only way. He then began to cry, and ran wildly along the rim of the crevasse, searching for a better way. Then, returning baffled, of course, he came behind me, and lay down, and cried louder and louder. After getting down one step, I cautiously stooped, and cut another, and another, in succession, until I reached the point where the sliver was attached to the wall. There, cautiously balancing, 
I chipped down the upcurved end of the bridge until I had formed a small level platform about a foot wide, then, bending forward, got astride of the end of the sliver, steadied myself with my knees, then cut off the top of the sliver, hitching myself forward an inch or two at a time, leaving it about four inches wide for Stikine. Arrived at the farther end of the sliver, which was about seventy-five feet long, I chipped another little platform on its upcurved end, cautiously rose to my feet, and with infinite pains cut narrow notch steps and finger holes in the wall, and finally got safely across. All this dreadful time poor little Stikeen was crying as if his heart was broken, and when I called to him in as reassuring a voice as I could muster, he only cried the louder, as if trying to say that he never, never could get down there. The only time that the brave little fellow appeared to know what danger was. After going away as if I was leaving him, he still howled and cried without venturing to try to follow me. Returning to the edge of the crevasse, I told him that I must go, that he could come if he only tried, and finally in despair he hushed his cries, slid his little feet slowly down into my footsteps, out on the big sliver, walked slowly and cautiously along the sliver as if holding his breath, while the snow was falling and the wind was moaning and threatening to blow him off. When he arrived at the foot of the slope below me, I was kneeling on the brink, ready to assist him in case he should be unable to reach the top. He looked up along the row of notched steps I had made, as if fixing them in his mind. Then, with a nervous spring, he whizzed up, and passed me out onto the level ice, and ran and cried and barked and rolled about, fairly hysterical, in the sudden revulsion from the depth of despair to triumphant joy. I tried to catch him, and pet him, and tell him how good and brave he was, but he would not be caught. He ran round and round, swirling like autumn leaves in an eddy, lay down and rolled head over heels. I told him we still had far to go, and that we must now stop all nonsense and get off the ice before dark. I knew by the ice lines that every step was now taking me nearer the shore, and soon it came in sight. The headland, four or five miles back from the front, covered with spruce trees, loomed faintly but surely through the mist and light fall of snow, not more than two miles away. The ice now proved good all the way across, and we reached the lateral moraine just at dusk. Then, with trembling limbs, now that the danger was over, we staggered and stumbled down the bouldery edge of the glacier, and got over the dangerous rocks by the cascades, while yet a faint light lingered. We were safe. And then, too, came limp weariness, such as no ordinary work ever produces, however hard it may be. Wearily we stumbled down through the woods, over logs and brush and roots, devil's clubs pricking as every faint blundering tumble. At last we got out on the smooth mud-slope, with only a mile of slow but sure dragging of weary limbs to camp. The Indians had been firing guns to guide me, and had a fine supper and fire ready, though fearing they would be compelled to seek us in the morning, a care not often applied to me. Stikine and I were too tired to eat much, and, strange to say, too tired to sleep. Both of us, springing up in the night again and again, fancied we were still on that dreadful ice bridge in the shadow of death. Nevertheless, we arose next morning in newness of life. Never before had rocks and ice and trees seemed so beautiful and wonderful. Even the cold, biting rainstorm that was blowing seemed full of loving kindness, wonderful compensation for all that we had endured, and we sailed down the bay through the grey driving rain, rejoicing. End of From Travels in Alaska by John Muir Read by Jason Mills Two Theorems on Conics by S. Lefschetz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Two Theorems on Conics by S. Lefschetz. 1. This paper contains two unrelated theorems on conics, of which the first is virtually contained in a proposition given by Poncelet, while the second is the equivalent for conics of a well-known theorem on rational cortics, and so far as we know is new under this form. To both propositions we apply considerations of number of projective conditions satisfied by a given configuration. 2. The first theorem is the following. When two complete quadrilaterals circumscribed to a conic 
have a common diagonal, their vertices, not situated on the latter, are on another conic. Let O, capital A, capital B, be the triangle of reference, and S equal to X squared minus YZ equal to zero, the equation of a conic S tangent to O capital A and O capital B in capital A and capital B. The two tangents drawn from the point lowercase a, situated at 0, 1, and lambda, are simultaneously represented by 4 lambda times the quantity x squared minus yz, plus the quantity lambda y plus z squared, equal to 0, which can be written 4 lambda x squared minus the quantity lambda y minus z squared, equal to 0. By changing lambda into mu, we obtain the tangents drawn from the point lowercase b situated at 0, 1, mu, so that 4 lambda x squared minus the quantity lambda y minus z squared plus the expression 4 mu x squared minus the quantity mu y minus z quantity squared, the expression times a constant kappa equal to zero, called equation one, represents a conic going through the intersections of the two pairs of tangents. Similarly, a conic going through the points of intersection of the tangent from the point A prime situated at zero, one, and lambda prime with the tangents from the point B prime at zero, one, mu prime will be represented by 4 lambda prime x squared minus the quantity lambda prime y minus z, the quantity squared, plus the expression 4 mu prime x squared minus the quantity mu prime y minus z, that squared. That expression times a constant kappa prime equal to zero, called equation two. And we must show that for proper values of kappa and kappa prime, the equations 1 and 2 will represent the same curve. Such values will satisfy the system. The fraction lambda plus kappa mu over lambda prime plus kappa prime mu prime equals the fraction lambda squared plus kappa mu squared over lambda prime squared plus kappa prime mu prime squared equals the fraction 1 plus kappa over 1 plus kappa prime, which effectively can be solved for kappa and kappa prime. Thus we get kappa equals negative the fraction, the quantities lambda minus lambda prime times lambda minus mu prime over the quantities mu minus lambda prime times mu minus mu prime. And substituting in equation 1, we obtain 2 times the quantity lambda mu minus lambda prime mu prime times the quantity 2 times x squared minus yz plus the expression lambda mu times the quantity lambda prime plus mu prime minus lambda prime mu prime times the quantity lambda plus mu. That expression times y squared plus the expression with the quantity lambda plus mu minus the quantity lambda prime plus mu prime, that expression times z squared equals zero, as the equation of the conic capital sigma circumscribed to the two quadrilaterals circumscribed to s. Now the pairs of points lowercase a lowercase b and a prime b prime determine on capital A capital B an involution the parameters of which are defined by alpha lambda mu plus beta times the quantity lambda plus mu plus gamma equal to zero, and also alpha lambda prime mu prime plus beta times the quantity lambda prime plus mu prime plus gamma equal to zero, which gives for the equation of capital sigma capital sigma equals 2 times beta times the quantity 2x squared minus yz minus gamma times y squared minus alpha times z squared equals 0, which shows that 
capital sigma depends solely on the involution on capital A capital B. 3. Let C and D be the double points of the involution just considered on AB. They clearly determine entirely the position of capital sigma with respect to S, and if E is one of the points of intersection of OC and the conic S, then the whole system is projectively determined by the four points O, A, B, E, and the cross ratio A, B, C, D. Hence, projectively, there are infinity to the power of one systems, such as that formed by S and capital sigma. Since there are projectively infinity to the power of two systems of two conics, there must be one relation between the invariance of the system S capital sigma. Effectively, if D is the discriminant of S plus rho capital sigma equal to zero, we have d equals rho cubed delta sub 1 plus theta sub 1 rho squared plus theta sub 2 rho plus delta sub 2, which equals negative the expression 1 fourth rho cubed plus 2 beta rho squared plus the quantity 5 beta squared minus alpha gamma times rho plus 4 beta times the quantity beta squared minus alpha gamma with delta sub 1 and delta sub 2 being the discriminants of S and capital sigma, and theta sub 1, theta sub 2, their relative invariance. Identifying, we get delta sub 1 equals negative 1 fourth, theta sub 1 equals negative 2 beta, delta sub 2 equals negative 4 beta times the quantity beta squared minus alpha gamma, and theta sub 2 equals negative the quantity 5 beta squared minus alpha gamma. As these four form a complete invariant system of two conics, and only three of them contain beta and alpha gamma, by eliminating these two parameters, we can obtain one and only one relation. We have 4 theta sub 2 delta sub 1 equals 5 beta squared minus alpha gamma, which equals 5 fourths theta sub 1 squared minus alpha gamma, and also the fraction 8 delta sub 2 delta sub 1 squared over theta sub 1 equals beta squared minus alpha gamma, which equals theta sub 1 squared minus alpha gamma. Hence, the relation desired is theta sub 1 cubed minus 4 times delta sub 1, theta sub 1, theta sub 2, plus 8 delta sub 2, delta sub 1 squared equals 0, expressing the condition that there exists a quadrilateral circumscribed to S and inscribed to gamma. If we put the cross ratio capital ABCD equals lowercase sigma, then lowercase sigma equals m1 over m2, m1 and m2 being the roots of negative alpha m squared plus 2 beta m plus gamma equals 0. Hence, lowercase sigma is given by the equation alpha gamma over 4 beta squared times the quantity sigma plus 1 squared minus sigma equals 0. And if j equal to the fraction delta sub 1 delta sub 2 over theta sub 1 theta sub 2 is the absolute invariant of the system, then lowercase sigma squared plus 2 times the fraction 14j minus 3 over 10j minus 1 times lowercase sigma plus 1 equal to 0. 4. The second proposition can be stated thus. If the tangents at three of the common points of a conic and a triangle go through the opposite vertices, then the triangle is self-polar with respect to the conic. Footnote. Transforming quadratically with respect to the triangle, we obtain this. 
If a rational quartic has more than three fleck nodes, it has necessarily three bifleck nodes. For proofs, see Bassett, Treatise on Cubic and Quartic Curves, page 111, and J. E. Rowe, A Complete System of Invariants of the Rational Quartic, Transactions of the American Mathematical Society, volume 12, page 309. End footnote. There are two possible cases according as the three points are or are not on different sides. In the first case, let ABC be a triangle. A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, its intersections with the conic S. The tangents at A1, B1, C1 going respectively through the vertices A, B, C. Let D be the intersection of B, B1, and C, C1, and E and F, the points where B1, C1 meets B, C, and A, D, respectively. We have the cross ratio E, F, C1, B1 equal to negative 1, and hence A, D is polar of E with respect to S. Hence, the polar of A goes through E, and as it goes also through A1, it must be E A1 or B C. Similarly for B and C, which proves the proposition in this case. In the second case, suppose that S is tangent to B B1, B B2, C C1. Then B is pole of A C, and therefore the polar of lowercase c going through B and C1 must be B, C1, or A, B. Since C and B are poles of the opposite sides, the proposition is true in this case, too. 5. Another proof will be given here. The system formed by a triangle and an arbitrary conic depends upon three absolute invariants for it is a degenerate quintic with nine double points, and since the most general curve of the fifth order depends upon twelve absolute invariants, between which each new double point establishes a relation, the truth of our statement follows. Otherwise, also, it is easily shown that the system is projectively completely defined by the three cross ratios a, B, C1, C2, B, C, A1, A2, and C, A, B1, B2. That there is no relation between them is seen thus. To any four points, A1, A2, B1, B2, taken arbitrarily on the proper sides, there corresponds a pencil of conics which determines on A, B an involution a pair of which will be defined in one of two ways by the cross ratio a b c one c two which is thus shown to be arbitrary when the other two cross ratios are given now if we impose upon the system the conditions that one or two of the tangents to the conic from the vertices meet it on the sides they alone will do so and the conditions are independent for there is a conic tangent to A A1 in A1 going through B, and a tangent to an arbitrary line at its intersection with AB. And for this conic, A A1 is the only tangent from the vertices meeting it on the sides. Next, among the conics tangent to A A1 in A1, and to B B1 in B1, there is one tangent to AB at a certain point K, with respect to which B1K and A1K will be the polars of A and B, and therefore again AA1 and BB1 are the only tangents from the vertices which will meet this conic on the sides. The same is evident for conics tangent to AA1 and AA2 in A1 and A2, since for them AB and AC are arbitrary. If now we impose upon a conic the conditions that three of the tangents at the intersections with the sides of the triangle go through the opposite vertices, 
these conditions being projective and independent will determine the cross ratios on the sides. Hence, any two systems satisfying these conditions for which the cross ratios are definite will be projectively equivalent. But such a system is presented by a conic and any one of its self-polar triangles, into which the system considered can therefore be projected, and this proves the proposition. Lincoln, Nebraska, November 28th, 1911. End of Two Theorems on Conics by S. Lefschetz Recording by Prachi Pense, Wilmington, Delaware Why I Believe in Poverty by Edward Bach This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Boyette. A foreword. The article in this little book was published in the Ladies' Home Journal for April 1915. Much to the surprise of the author, the call for copies was so insistent as to exhaust the edition of the magazine containing it. As the demand did not appear to be supplied, the article is now reprinted in this form. It is sent out with the hope of the author that it may still further fulfill its mission of giving the stimulant of encouragement wherever it is needed. E.B. October 1915 Why I Believe in Poverty as the Richest Experience That Can Come to a Boy I make my living trying to edit the Ladies' Home Journal, and because the public has been most generous in its acceptance of that periodical, a share of that success has logically come to me. Hence a number of my very good readers cherish an opinion that often I have been tempted to correct, a temptation to which I now yield. My correspondents express the conviction variously, but this extract from a letter is a fair sample. It is all very easy for you to preach economy to us when you do not know the necessity for it, to tell us how, as for example in my own case, we must live within my husband's income of $800 a year when you have never known what it is to live on less than thousands. Has it ever occurred to you, born with the proverbial silver spoon in your mouth, that theoretical writing is pretty cold and futile compared to the actual hand-to-mouth struggle that so many of us live day by day and year in and year out? An experience that you know not of? An experience that you know not of. Now, how far do the facts square with this statement? Whether or not I was born with the proverbial silver spoon in my mouth, I cannot say. It is true that I was born of well-to-do parents, but when I was six years old, my father lost all his means and faced life at forty-five in a strange country without even necessaries. There are men and their wives who know what that means, for a man to try to come back at forty-five and in a strange country. I had the handicap of not knowing one word of the English language. I went to a public school and learned what I could, and sparse morsels they were. The boys were cruel as boys are. The teachers were impatient as tired teachers are. My father could not find his place in the world. My mother, who had always had servants at her beck and call, faced the problems of housekeeping that she had never learned nor been taught and there was no money. So after school hours, my brother and I went home, but not to play. After school hours meant for us to help a mother who daily grew more frail under the burdens that she could not carry. Not for days, but for years, we two boys got up in the gray, cold winter dawn when the bed feels so snug and warm to growing boys, and we sifted the cold ashes of the day before's fire for a stray lump or two of unburned coal, and with what we had or could find we made the fire and warmed up the room. Then we set the table for the scant breakfast, went to school, and directly after school we washed the dishes, swept and scrubbed the floors. 
Living in a three-family tenement each third week meant that we scrubbed the entire three flights of stairs from the third story to the first as well as the doorsteps and the sidewalk outside. The latter work was the hardest for we did it on Saturdays with the boys of the neighborhood looking on none too kindly or we did it to the echo of the crack of the ball and bat on the adjoining lot. In the evening, when other boys could sit by the lamp or study their lessons, we two boys went out with a basket and picked up wood and coal in the neighboring lots, or went after the dozen or so pieces of coal left from the ton of coal put in that afternoon by one of our neighbors, with the spot hungrily fixed in mind by one of us during the day, hoping that the man who carried in the coal might not be too careful in picking up the stray lumps. An experience that you know not of don't I? At ten years of age I got my first job, washing the windows of a baker's shop at fifty cents a week. In a week or two I was allowed to sell bread and cakes behind the counter after school hours for a dollar a week. Handing out freshly baked cakes and warm delicious smelling bread when scarcely a crumb had passed my mouth that day. Then on Saturday mornings I served a route for a weekly paper and sold my remaining stock on the street. It meant from 60 to 70 cents for that day's work. I lived in Brooklyn, New York, and the chief means of transportation to Coney Island at that time was the horse car. Near where we lived, the cars would stop to water the horses. The men would jump out and get a drink of water, but the women had no means of quenching their thirst. Seeing this lack, I got a pail, filled it with water and a bit of ice, and, with a glass, jumped on each car on Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday, and sold my wares at a cent a glass. And when competition came, as it did very quickly, when other boys saw that a Sunday's work meant two or three dollars, I squeezed a lemon or two in my pail, my liquid became lemonade, and my price two cents a glass, and Sundays meant five dollars to me. Then in turn I became a reporter during the evenings, an office boy daytimes, and I learned stenography at midnight. My correspondent says she supports her family of husband and child on eight hundred dollars a year, and says I have never known what that means. I supported a family of three on six dollars and twenty-five cents a week, less than one half of her yearly income. When my brother and I combined brought in eight hundred dollars a year, we felt rich. I have for the first time gone into these details in print so that my readers may know at first hand that the editor of the Ladies Home Journal is not a theorist when he writes or prints articles that seek to preach economy or that reflect a hand-to-hand -hand struggle on a small or an invisible income. There is not a single step, not an inch on the road of direst poverty that I do not know or have not experienced. and. Having experienced every thought, every feeling, every hardship that come to those who travel that road, I say today that I rejoice with every boy who is going through the same experiences. Nor am I discounting or forgetting one single pang of the keen hardships that such a struggle means. I would not today exchange my years of the keenest hardship that a boy can know or pass through for any single experience that could have come to me. I know what it means not to earn a dollar, but to earn two cents. I know the value of money as I could have learned it or known it in no other way. I could have been trained for my life work in no surer way. I could not have arrived at a truer understanding of what it means to face a day without a penny in hand, not a loaf of bread in the cupboard, not a piece of kindling wood for the fire, with nothing to eat, and then be a boy with the hunger of nine and ten, with a mother frail and discouraged. An experience that you know not of, don't I? And yet I rejoice in the experience, and I repeat, I envy every boy who is in that condition and going through it. But 
And here is the pivot of my strong belief in poverty as an undisguised blessing to a boy. I believe in poverty as a condition to experience, to go through, and then to get out of, not as a condition to stay in. That's all very well, some will say. Easy enough to say, but how can you get out of it? No one can definitely tell another that. No one told me. No two persons can find the same way out. Each must find his way for himself. That depends on the boy. I was determined to get out of poverty because my mother was not born in it, could not stand it, and did not belong in it. This gave me the first essential, a purpose. Then I backed up the purpose with effort and a willingness to work and to work at anything that came my way, no matter what it was, so long as it meant the way out. I did not pick and choose, I took what came, and did it in the best way I knew how, and when I didn't like what I was doing, I still did it well while I was doing it, but saw to it that I didn't do it any longer than I had to do it. I used every rung in the ladder as a rung to the one above. It meant effort, of course, untiring, ceaseless, and unsparing, and it meant work hard as nails. But out of the effort and the work came the experience, the upbuilding, the development, the capacity to understand and sympathize, the greatest heritage that can come to a boy. And nothing in the world can give that to a boy so that it will burn into him, as will poverty. That is why I believe so strongly in poverty, the greatest blessing in the way of the deepest and fullest experience that can come to a boy. But as I repeat, always as a condition to work out of, not to stay in. End of Why I Believe in Poverty by Edward Bach from the Riverside Uplift Series, 1915